The following previews are of graphic audio productions rated for mature audiences due to scenes of intense violence and sexual situations. Available now from Graphic Audio. There were several names in the West that caused brave men to sit down and shut up. Smoke Jensen, Falcon McAllister, Louis Longmont, and Frank Morgan. Enough talk, old man! Grab iron! If you want a shooting boy, you're gonna have to start it. You think I won't? I hope you don't, kid. You're gonna die, Morgan! We all die, kid. Some long before their time. Ah! I, I thought all them stories about you was just talk. I wish it was. Once, Frank Morgan had a wife and a future on the land. Now Morgan's taken up the one skill that always came easy, gunfighting. And with nothing left to lose, he's the last man who will ever back down. Who the hell are you? Frank Morgan. Oh, hell. From the creators that brought you the critically acclaimed Eagle series and the first Mountain Man, there's a new sheriff in town, and he's tougher than rawhide and as quick as a striking rattler. Frank Morgan is the last gunfighter. William W. Johnstone's epic new western, now in graphic audio. Coming soon from Graphic Audio. Higby, Colorado, population 147, is about to become a boom town. The visionary General Wade Garrison is building a railroad to connect Higby to the Santa Fe Rail. But a rancher named Ike Clinton has his own selfish reasons for making sure these bands of steel go nowhere. And he'll go to any lengths to derail Garrison's plans. some kind of fool falling a tree across the road like that? Don't you know that could kill someone? Now how are we supposed to get through here? You ain't. Hey, I know you. You're one of the Clintons, ain't you? They call me Cletus. Ah! Mr. True! Ah! The third driver jumped off his wagon and took off running. The third driver is getting away, Cletus. No, he ain't. This burning wagon is getting the hell out of here. Falcon McAllister owes a wartime debt to the general and answers the call to aid the man in his fight with the Clinton brood. The proud little town of Higby is about to be torn to pieces. Neighbors, families, and lovers will be bitterly divided and bodies will litter the streets. And before the last gun smoke clears, Falcon will come face to face with the Clinton's hired gunman, an outlaw known as the fastest gun in the West, Jefferson Tyree. Yes. That's him, Travis. Standing next to Cletus. Tyree is the fellow with the gray shirt. Thanks. Step back out of the way. Jefferson Tyree, turn around. Ah! Travis! Denham ran to the collapsed form of his friend. Tyree stood for a long moment, holding the still smoking pistol. Is he dead? Yes, he's dead. You murdered him! You might have noticed. He already had the gun in his hand when he braced me. He didn't brace you, Tyree. He was attempting to arrest you. Arrest me, huh? Well, maybe he should have said something. I thought he was just somebody trying to build a reputation by killing Jefferson Tyree. One doesn't build a reputation by killing polecats or rattlesnakes. And compared to you, the polecat and the rattlesnake are some of God's noblest creatures. You have a big mouth, don't you, friend? This fella always have a way with words like that, Cletus. Oh, yeah. This is Harold Denham, the publisher of our local newspaper. The local newspaper, huh? So are you going to write about this Mr. Newspaper Man? Oh, I am indeed. 
If you think you can frighten away the press, you have another thing coming. Oh, I don't want to frighten you away. I want you to print the story. Just as it happened. And I want you to say that when this fella braced me, he was already holding a pistol in his hand. But that I was so quick that I turned, drew, and shot him before he could shoot me. I will not make anything heroic out of this. I ain't asking you to make me a hero, newspaper boy. I'm just asking you to tell the truth. Falcon knows that the fastest way to the end of a tragedy is straight through the blood and tears behind the flash of a blazing gun. You boys ready? Bring them on. Don't miss the new adventures of Falcon McAllister in Eagles 13, Thunder of Eagles. And now, our feature presentation. Audio. A movie in your mind. DEA Section Chief Bobby Kane stood in the shadows of Hong Kong Harbor and glanced at his watch. It was 8.18 p.m. Elverman was almost 20 minutes late. <sighs> Acid bubbled in the section chief's stomach, and he scowled at the night. He was 29 years old, and too damn young to be worrying about ulcers. He took a bottle of antacid from the pocket of his trench coat. It didn't help immediately. It never did anymore. Go! City Mouse, this is Country Mouse. Hold on. Kane figured if Elverman survived another three years in the trenches of Hong Kong and mainland China, a lot of the cockiness the younger man exhibited would be worn away. That had been his own experience. He'd come to Kowloon with a hard-on for danger, bad guys, and exotic women. By the time he reached the beat in Victoria, he'd known all three and had lost his appetite for most of them. Go country, Mouse, over. The convoy's five minutes from your twenty. Over. Kane raised an arm over his head and made a circle with his fist closed. We're on top of it. But you're 18 minutes late. Over. Nothing to worry about, boss. So Wang had some trouble picking up the delivery. The way you boys have been busting the pipeline from the mainland recently, old Shiti figured the raw product might be worth a little more. Hell, ever since he started getting CNN at his hut through the satellite dish, he's been developing the killer instincts of a Mako shark when it comes to business. <laughs> Over. Men moved in the shadows at Kane's silent command. He saw only some of them, and those solely because he knew their positions and what to watch for from each one. The section chief unbuttoned his trench coat and freed the safety strap over his 451 Detonics Magnum Scoremaster. Understood, Country Mouse. You got the back door, so you make sure my hindsight is 2020. Over. Roger that, City Mouse. Country Mouse out. Leaving his earbud in place, Kane pocketed the walkie-talkie again. He stepped up to an easy jog and threaded through the parked forklifts and crates awaiting the morning shipping crews. <laughs> The target area was a two-story warehouse owned by the House of Chang Trading Company. The company had a 200-year history of import and export work, with no hint of the opium trade ever being involved. As far as anyone knew, the company and its owners had always flourished from legitimate business. But that had been before Elverman's report two weeks earlier. Kane paused by a stack of crated television sets and scanned the outside of the warehouse. Under the tin skin was a teakwood skeleton that dated almost from the days of the inception of the business, additions made as the holdings of the House of Chang grew. He reviewed the blueprint of the structure in his mind. A small office was in the northwest corner, and the rest was open space where goods could be stacked. A skylight gleamed on the near side of the pointed roof, looking like an angled rectangular pool of water. Above it, black clouds skated across the face of a full moon. Satisfied, he checked the nearby buildings on either side of the warehouse. 
Even though he couldn't see them, he knew Wills and Murray would be up there in position, their sniper rifles ready to provide covering fire. The scoremaster was in his hand before he knew it. Then he realized he'd heard a sound behind him. He whirled and sought cover at the same time, holding his fire when he recognized Makibi Lee, his Hong Kong PD contact. Christ! You know how close you came to getting popped? What the hell do you think you're doing sneaking up on me like that? I didn't sneak up on you. I was here before you were. You just didn't see me. The man stepped away from the stack of textiles and joined Kane by the televisions. A wicked scorpion machine pistol was slung across his shoulders. He scanned the terrain with a small set of infrared binoculars. What about Su Wang? Coming. My source says they may be ready for us, so we've got to be ready for them. Lee nodded, never taking his attention from the warehouse. The sign over the double doors of the warehouse wobbled, exposing Chinese characters and their English translations from the shadows. Lee finally lowered the binoculars. You will never mention who your contact is. No. Elverman was Kane's secret. The agency had dropped the man onto the scene in deep cover more than eight months earlier, and from the very beginning, Elverman had shown a flair for undercover work in the outland bush area where the poppies were grown and harvested by feudal Chinese bandits like Shi Ti. He'd penetrated Su Wang's organization in short order and started turning in useful intel almost immediately. Do you trust him? His information's been on the money so far. And his successes have come more closely together of late. So? I am a cautious man. I do not trust luck. It is how I have remained alive in this business for so long. Lee focused on Kane with the deadliest pair of eyes the section chief could ever remember seeing. Your choice. In or out. But you better damn well hurry. My men and I are gonna hit that ship at the instant it enters that warehouse. I don't want to be tripping over your guys when that goes down. You won't be. Lee removed a hand unit from his pocket. Kane was nervous, wondering if Lee's communications would be overheard by Tsu Wang's people. But Lee had probably been worried about the DEA communications, too. The walkie-talkie buzzed in his pocket. He reached in for the transmit button and moved the channel down to the frequency his team was using for the operation. Go. Contact. Axe handle one. Over. Roger that, Axe handle six. How many? Over. Four trucks. Make that four trucks. Axe handle one. Over. Body count? Over. No can do. Count two in the cabs, but the rear decks are covered with tarp. Over. Acknowledge. Let them come. Over. Lee was out of earshot, but clearly giving orders of his own. Okay, team. This is for pay dirt. These people don't know we're coming, and I want this to go down by the numbers so nobody on our side gets hurt. We're not looking for prisoners here. Just taking product off the street. If they go ballistic, take them down. Hard. X handle one, out. His hand trailed across the extra magazines for the scoremaster snugged on his belt. The vehicles entered the docking area in single file at less than 20 miles an hour, took a right, and headed west across Kane's field of fire. He kept the 451 Detonix Magnum propped on the television boxes. Perspiration trickled down his cheeks, and his stomach tried to tie itself into knots. A man got out of the lead truck, ran to the double doors of the House of Chang warehouse, and unlocked them. Before he had completely pushed them open, the first truck was rolling inside. The three others followed closely behind. Kane tore the earphone loose and shoved it into his pocket. Ready? Ready. Move in. Zigzagging through the stacked goods, the DEA man raced across the open street, Lee running abreast of him. Ground units swept into the area with their lights out. Three marine cruisers under Lee's command sped into the harbor and shut off any attempts to escape by water. Kane flattened against the galvanized tin of the wall. He knew he was outlined by the lighter metal, but was secure that his sniping team had given them the field. Holding the scoremaster in two hands, he nodded at the agent standing beside the door who swung the door open. They'd broken the locks on an earlier recon. The section chief trotted through the door with the scoremaster pointing the way. He sprinted down the row of crates to his right and paused to peer around the corner. The four trucks were parked two by two. The lights created a dim glow that revealed the men as two-dimensional shadows. More men clambered out of the back of the vehicles and swept the tarp aside to bear the metal ribcage beneath. All of them carried automatic weapons. Glancing back over his shoulder, Kane saw Lee shake his head slightly, as if doubting the reality of the scene before them. It had been hard convincing the Hong Kong policeman to come along, since he'd been sure the House of Chang was being falsely accused. The DEA man chose his spot, took a fresh grip on the scoremaster, and aimed it at the ceiling. Positioned. Ready. Immediately, the spotlights the recon team had installed less than an hour earlier flared into life. White light poured onto the trucks from six different locations. Freeze! This is Agent K, DEA! The narcotics trafficker scurried out of the lights, muzzle flashes flaming. 
A burst chewed through Kane's cover and showered splinters over him. He put two rounds through the guy hammering his position and watched the body go flying back. Two men tried to flee, but Lee stepped from cover long enough to burn them with a blistering figure eight. DEA snipers lining the upper reaches of the warehouse made short work of the Chinese traffickers. Kane was aware of the ruby dots of laser sights sweeping among the men. Bodies sprawled to the ground whenever the dots moved on. By the time he finished his second clip, still unsure if he'd hit anyone else, the battle was over. Nine surviving men threw out their weapons and stepped into the open with their hands on their heads. Kane walked out to confront them. On your faces! They got down. DEA agents and Hong Kong policemen flooded the scene, handcuffing the nine men. Kane thumbed the earphone into place. Anybody on our side hurt? We've got two down, but neither one is in any kind of real trouble. Kane looked into the nearest truck bed at the stacks of metal cases. Anyone get away? Nobody penetrated the outer perimeter. There are two bodies outside. The section chief glanced at Lee. No serious injuries. They climbed into the back of the truck together. Boxes are locked. So? Cut them open. Here. Take these boat cutters. Well? Raw opium. The box is full of it. Multiply this by all the boxes in here. Another good bust. So it would appear. Bobby! Kane turned to Carson. He looked at the agent and saw him standing on the ground at the rear of the truck with a white block of C4 in his hand. The trucks are wild! Everybody out! <laughs> In a world at war with terrorists, America needs a covert last line of defense. A special operations group, unbound by standard rules and procedures, and answerable only to the Oval Office. A team of battlefield commandos and cyber warriors takes the most direct approach, stemming the tide of global terrorism and high crime. As the court of last resort, they handle the dirty work no other government agency can touch. Graphic Audio presents Don Pendleton's Stony Man. Narrated by Terence Aselford. With performances by Michael Glenn, Thomas Penny, Christopher Walker, Christopher Graybill, Nanette Savard, David Coyne, Jeff Baker, Richard Rowan, Ken Jackson, James Lewis, James Konacek, Eric Messner, Dylan Lynch, Kate Torrey, and Mort Shelby. Stony Man 5. Ross Melton was in his early 50s, a silver-haired man, a shade over six feet tall, and less than five pounds overweight. He prided himself on keeping in shape and used it as part of his public image in his stand against drugs. He also used the ordinary guy appearance to keep himself in the good graces of the press, which was why he was dressed in conservative sweatpants and a red designer t-shirt. Melton returned the ball with a vicious forehand designed to pull his opponent to the left of the court, then dropped back to the forgiving center himself. <laughs> House member Jeff Jameson, a representative of California and on the board of the chief appropriations committee Melton had to deal with for funding the drug war, was 20-something years younger. He had a weak backhand. <laughs> Jameson also had a flair for sports clothing and wore a neon green tennis outfit that drew the attention of people walking past the plexiglass wall. He fielded the ball and placed it high on the wall. The ball bounced once, just past midcourt. Melton closed in and set himself. As he'd figured, Jameson failed to come back to center court, leaving himself wide open for a return down the right side wall. The score is nine to two, right? Yeah. Melton kept the smile off his face. The cocky young representative had already learned that racquetball wasn't entirely about being younger and faster. There was a good deal of strategy involved as well. Your favor? Yeah. How about if I win this game, you push the appropriations committee for my budget? No questions asked. <laughs> Fine. Game in six. <laughs> Melton took the rebound, caught it low before it had the chance to make the first bounce, and smashed it hard enough to pull it straight back and low three quarters of the court back. <laughs> Jameson had no chance at a save. <laughs> 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 Game in 12. And Melton set to work, chopping methodically at the congressman's offense and defense. 
Jameson still wasn't easy prey, and having something on the line brought out the best in him. 32 minutes later, Melton took the game 15 to 9. Jameson took it better than he'd expected, and even offered to spring for breakfast. When they left the court, Norris was waiting on him with the briefcase phone. Mr. Melton, call for you. Thank you, Norris. Excuse me. Jameson nodded and headed back to the health club's receptionist. From this morning's verbal fencing between the two, Melton had already figured the congressman was going to be 0 for 2 before he left. Norris was 6'4 and drew attention in his full suit. The haircut was military, and the black wraparound sunglasses were pure Hollywood. Still, Melton knew he'd have had to look hard and long before he found a more competent aide and bodyguard. He took the briefcase to the nearest table, sat down, and opened it. The news had to be bad, or Norris would never have taken the chance that some media person would see him taking the call. He picked up the receiver and activated the scramble. Melton! Time to come home, Chief. The shit's hit the fan. At last count, we've got 19 teams that have been hit on domestic and foreign soil. A cold fist seemed to close around Melton's heart, taking away the brief moment of victory he'd had with Jameson. How bad is it? Stats are still coming in. At present, we have 47 dead, another 58 injured, and 23 missing. And those are just the ones we know about. I'm on my way. Uh, ready to go? I, I'm sorry, Mr. Jameson. Something's come up. I won't be able to make it. Rain check? Sure. Great. Norris, let's go. Yes, sir. Outside, his mind wouldn't leave the situation alone. He wondered who was dead, who still lived. He knew most of those men. He was friends with a lot of them. His four-door sedan waited in the parking lot. It looked like an undercover vehicle, like one of those he used to ride in before taking the appointment. They'd coined the term drug war during his predecessor's term. And in spots around the globe, deadly battle zones had been drawn. Now it looked as if somebody was trying to make it official. Milton's peripheral vision picked up movement as he coasted to a stop to pull out onto the street, and he turned to face it as the short hairs rose on his nape. Norris was reaching for the gun in his shoulder holster. Son of a bitch! The man stood across the street beside a van, a tube across his shoulder. A four-year hitch in the Marines and time spent in the reserves had made Milton aware of what a law was. Tense silence filled Stonyman Farm's computer room as Aaron Bear Kurtzman's people worked. Barbara Price watched with a mixture of pride and trepidation. As mission controller of America's premier anti-terrorist groups, she knew Stonyman Farm went into direct action only when the stakes were at their highest and the chances for coming through a situation unscathed were at their slimmest. It looked as if one of those times had arrived again. Less than six minutes earlier, the news about Ross Melton had hit the radio stations. The television crews had it now, responding more quickly than the Washington, D.C. Fire Department. Kurtzman had parked his wheelchair at his station, which was in the center of an immense horseshoe-shaped desk covered with electronic hardware. Built more along the lines of a village blacksmith than the cybernetic specialist he was, Kurtzman's attention seemed to be everywhere at once as his fingers tapped the keyboard in front of him. Over Kurtzman's broad shoulder, Price watched in fascination as window after window of information scrolled open on the oversized monitor in front of the big man. At the other end of the long room, three wall screens displayed different information. The center wall was filled with a split screen, depicting two different views of Ross Melton's burning car. Paramedics were held back by the orange flames and roiling black smoke. Police units struggled to keep back the crowd while a foot patrol moved among them, seeking witnesses. The screen split into thirds, with the new video camera view being provided from a helicopter. A massive yellow fire truck trundled down the blocked street between police cars and yellow striped sawhorses, then deployed yellow slickered firemen trailing thick white hoses. When the water hit the flames, it beat the fire down, turned the smoke white, and changed to steam. The wall on the left side was using taped versions of the current transmissions to piece together different views of the crime scene. Price knew from Kurtzman's previous orders that Carmen Delahunt was even now prepping a visual roll call for every face that had been captured by the video cameras. Not everybody would be identified, but it was conceivable that they could spot the person or persons responsible for the attack. At the very least, it would give them a pool to search through as information continued to narrow their focus. Delahunt was old line FBI, culled from the expert ranks at Quantico. Price knew the perky redhead wouldn't miss a trick in putting the file together for optimum speed and coverage. 
To the right, Huntington Weathers, the black ex-professor of cybernetics at Berkeley, chewed on the stem of his dead pipe and sorted through the list of strikes against the DEA. Kurtzman had acquired them through a means of his own less than an hour ago. Price knew that being an effective mission controller sometimes meant knowing when not to ask how or where the troops got their information or materials. From what she had gleaned from the DEA files, Price had been astounded at the damage the agency had suffered in the past five hours. Glancing at the lighted extension number in front of her, Price knew it wasn't the call she was waiting for. Price. I'm returning your call. Like to get away from the farm for a while, cowboy? What farm boy doesn't? I need you to take a team and pick up Hal. He's vacationing with his wife at Calvert Cliffs, Maryland. I haven't been able to contact him, so I'm assuming they aren't at the cabin. He won't know you're coming. I'll find him. Make it quick. I don't like the way this is shaping up. With Melton gone, a lot of people might be looking at Hal as the number two man temporarily. Could be the teams lashing out at the drug squads are looking at him, too. I'll let you know something as soon as I know something. Cradling the phone, Price checked the right wall screen. The list was growing, layered in more details as Weathers pursued intel along the different channels covertly opened the Stony Man hard site. A line of satellites in space gave them access to the world in an electronic heartbeat. She read down the list of strikes. A fighter jet, possibly an F.A. 18 Hornet, had been taken down off Florida. There were no known survivors. A mined drug shipment had taken out a police team near Moscow. Snipers had cut down a Berlin police unit as they closed in on a drug factory. A confiscated shipment of heroin blew up in the faces of a narcotic squad in Marseille and had taken out the traffickers, too. The list just kept going. It was either a monstrous and carefully orchestrated strike launched across the globe, or it was an astounding series of coincidences. Some new events were still coming in. It was hard to guess how many others were still out there. This time, it was the call she'd been expecting. Price. Ross Melton has just been killed. Price looked at her watch. Actually, Melton had been killed 12 minutes ago. Yes, sir. We're already working on it. Have you found anything out? Nothing specific that we can go to work on. Hell, the whole DEA network has been ripped from one end of the globe to the other. There have been 27 attacks on our people in the past two hours. I'll have the DEA release the particulars to your groups within the hour. There have been 41 attacks, and we already have the DEA's files. At this point, I'd say we know considerably more than they do. But that's not the whole picture. There have also been attacks launched against the international agencies targeting the drug trade. Interpol has even taken hits in its information gathering circles. Domestic agencies within Britain, Switzerland, France, Germany, Italy, Japan, and Australia have also been hit in ways similar to the ones the DEA has experienced. You make it sound like a conspiracy. I couldn't think of a better word to call it, Mr. President. What are the possibilities that all the drug syndicates are working together on this? Astronomical. Exactly. Those people are motivated by greed. They'd never agree to do anything together. That cuts the profit potential. True. But when you rule out the possible, only the impossible remains. There's no way all of this could have happened without some kind of guiding hand. Investigate it discreetly, Miss Price. The Europeans operate under the notion that America is responsible for the drugs now turning up in their backyards. Price knew that. Switzerland and Russia were two of the foremost dissenters about the drug shipments that had been penetrating their borders. Those countries felt that if the United States could deal more effectively with the home problems, they wouldn't have been affected. Price figured it was easier for them to place blame than deal with their own problems. Confronting the drug issue on home territory was no easy matter, and admitting it existed was the hardest step. Ross Melton was a friend of mine. He was a good man, a family man. I've met his wife and daughters. They're going to be devastated by his death. I don't want his killers to escape retribution, nor do I want the other people who've fallen to go unavenged. I want you to put your teams on this as soon as you can, Miss Price. And I'd like you to ask our special friend if he'd look into this with us. Kurtzman looked up, letting Price know he'd been monitoring the exchange. Yes, sir. I want to exact our pound of flesh from these bastards, and the sooner the better. Understood, sir. Price turned to Kurtzman. Get me Able Team and Phoenix Force. We can fax them the files we've already generated and let them work on those. I want them up and moving in ten minutes. Kurtzman nodded and turned to his computer. What about Stryker? Stryker was the code name for Mac Bolan, the executioner, and the special friend the president had referred to. Price picked up her clipboard of hastily jotted notes to add others that were rapidly coming to mind. He called earlier. He's going to be in Hong Kong within half an hour. He has his own agenda. Both of them knew that meant the body count was about to increase in that area of the world. 
But this time, the scales would be shifting back the other way. The noonday sun burned bright and hard across the jungle, sparkling off the winding river that bisected the foliage. Crouched in the fork of a tree, David McCarter peered through the telescopic sights of the Heckler & Koch PSG-1 sniper rifle. The crosshairs fell across the first of his targets. Through the scope magnification, Tommaso Alonso's features seemed even broader than the faxed sheets from Stony Man Farm had shown them to be. Alonso was Gaspar Cota's second in command. Cota had been one of the first in the struggle to fill the void left by the death of Luis Costanza the previous year. McCarter stifled a flame of anger that tried to disrupt his cool when he saw the ragged peasants huddled around the raw coca packages Alonso and his men had forced them to carry through the jungle to the river. The battle against Costanza and the Medellin cartel had been a holding action, and the Stony Man teams had known that going in. The cartel was a monster with many heads. Cut one off and another grew in its place. Costanza had been a threat because he'd been on the verge of turning it into a single organism with one mind. Dressed in stained shirts and torn cotton pants, the peasants shifted uneasily in the shade provided by the trees on the riverbank. Seven wooden carts sat with their wheels sunk into the muddy water. The long poles sticking out in front of them were worn smooth by the countless hands that had pulled the carts through the vines, creepers, and long grasses for many years. Human labor was still the cheapest form of energy in the country. McCarter shifted, trying to relieve the bite of the rough bark chewing into his side. <laughs> It was futile movement, and he accepted it. Before signing on with Phoenix Force, he'd been a member of the British SAS, so he was no stranger to discomfort. He blocked the low hum of pain from his mind and waited. Phoenix 2, this is Phoenix 1, over. McCarter hit the transmit button on his ear-throat headset. Go, Phoenix 1, over. Yakov Katzenellenbogen was an ex-Mossad agent and was schooled in tense situations that tended to go awry. Phoenix 5 has confirmed the approach. We are go after your first shot, over. Roger, Phoenix 1. Phoenix 2, out. McCarter wiped his palm on the leg of his jungle camouflage fatigues. It didn't help much. With the humidity being what it was, his clothing was already drenched. He settled into line behind the gun butt. He marked off his field of fire one last time. At last count, there had been 27 armed men with Alonso. The peasants numbered about 40, but they expected no resistance from them. The crosshairs bisected Alonso's face. Between the Phoenix warrior and his target were nearly 400 yards of jungle. The distance was outside the comfortable edge of a sure headshot for the average sharpshooter with the particular weapon that McCarter held. But the position was necessary for the pincer movement Katz planned to employ. Tactically spread out in a half moon around the river rendezvous, Phoenix Force planned to make a clean sweep of Cota's group before moving on to its next objective. McCarter's peripheral vision picked up the plane coming in from the east. An experienced pilot himself, he identified the plane as a piper. The pontoons hung ponderously under the wide body, making it look like a fat silver-gray seagull against the blue sky. The piper shed altitude gracefully, came almost to a stop over the turgid water, then settled onto its surface. White waves cut through the dirty brown water and trailed behind the pontoons in twin Vs. The pilot cut the engines, brought the craft around sideways, almost 50 feet past his designated landing area, and then kicked the door open and slowly floated back down the river toward Alonso and his people. Just before he drew abreast of the waiting transport group, the pilot heaved out an anchor. It caught in the silt-covered river bottom at once, bringing the plane to a bobbing halt within feet of the loading area. Moving to the back of his craft, the pilot kicked open the cargo door, which fell into the water. The peasants grabbed packages of coca, placed them on their heads, and walked into the water toward the anchored plane. The level never rose above their chests. Staggered along the river's edge, Alonso's troops didn't seem inclined to get wet. They stood smoking in small groups, nonchalantly holding their weapons. They didn't have to fear the government troops or roving bandits for months. McCarter drew in a breath, locked onto Alonzo's mustache, and focused on making the shot. The distance and windage had already been calibrated. His finger took up the trigger slack. He let out half his breath, held it, then squeezed the trigger. The big sniper rifle slammed into his shoulder. He didn't bother to track his success. From the moment he'd fired until the instant the Colombian drug force heard the first shot, he still had time to kill again with anonymity. The crosshairs found the pilot and came to rest over the guy's chest as he stood on the starboard pontoon. 
McCarter squeezed the trigger again, and the man went spinning from the plane. By the time he fired the third round from the 20-round box, the Colombians had begun to scatter. The bullet caught the latest target high in the shoulder and shoved him face down into the shallow water. Another bullet caught a man in the calf as he ran, whirling him around. McCarter punched the fifth round into the man's upper body. He moved on, hunting targets, but found most of the survivors dug into the thick foliage. A belch of flame and thunder struck the starboard pontoon of the Piper, shearing it from the craft. Destabilized, the plane tipped over and dipped a wing into the water. As the Piper turned over on its side, the wing stabbed into the river bottom and lodged. Before it had the chance to come to a full rest, another explosion ripped into the plane and broke it in two. McCarter knew the handiwork belonged to Gary Manning. The big Canadian was Phoenix Force's demolitions expert. Manning possessed an affinity for anything explosive. Phoenix 2, over. Go Phoenix 1, over. The Briton put three carefully placed rounds into coca packages left by the fleeing peasants as a way of warning. The wrappings tore, scattering grey-white globs of paste over the black earth. Get clear, out. Roger, mate. Out. <clears throat> McCarter slung the sniper rifle, then lowered himself through the tree branches with acrobatic ease until he was on the ground. <clears throat> he stashed the big rifle in a pre-selected clump of brush, grabbed a fistful of his combat harness and shrugged into it on the run. He carried his Browning high power in a shoulder rig. Bandoliers of 12-gauge double-aught rounds for the Mossberg 590 military nine-shot he carried crisscrossed his Kevlar vest. Other pouches carried grenades, extra pistol magazines, and more ordnance than he might need. A Gerber combat knife rode in a boot sheath. An impact-resistant helmet was secured to ride high on his back. He moved at a military jog, alert to the sights and sounds around him. Taking the amber-tinted aviator glasses from his pocket, he slid them on, then tapped the transmit button on his headset. Phoenix 5, this is Phoenix 2, over. Go Phoenix 2, you have 5, over. Calvin James had been seasoned on the streets of Chicago, then received a deadly education as a U.S. Navy SEAL, before being further schooled by the professionals in Phoenix Force and at Stonyman Farm. Alonzo, over. Down and out. It's a pretty shot, over. We aim to please. Over and out. With Alonzo out of the picture, the Colombian troops would be slow to regroup and would be more apt to retreat. It didn't make the assignment easy, but it did keep them in one place and confused longer. A yellow flash caught the Briton's attention. He glanced up and saw a golden monkey scamper fearfully toward the higher tree branches that formed an emerald canopy over the area. A multicolored parrot burst from hiding and went across the open space. The Mossberg pump gun came up automatically as he broke left and took cover behind a tree. Two armed men burst from the bush, less than 20 feet from a Carter's position. The Phoenix warrior whirled around the tree. The 12-gauge load caught the second man squarely in the face and sprawled him on the ground. McCarter thumbed replacement cartridges into the shotgun's breech and went on. A peasant stumbled out of the foliage in front of him, suddenly saw him and realized there was no place to run. The old man dropped to his knees and held up his empty hands beseechingly. McCarter waved the shotgun. Vaya! Soy de no aquí dolele! Not wasting any time, the old man pushed himself to his feet and continued on his way. As the jungle thinned, McCarter found he could make out details around the river. The remaining half of the piper was on fire in the water. Thick black smoke sailed in a widening column, pushed by the southeasterly breeze. The tail section had either sunk or floated from view. Bodies stretched out across the coca packages and the dark earth, bloodstains turning the ground black in places. Most of Alonso's troops had taken refuge among the trees fronting the river. Scanning the tree branches above eye level as he neared, McCarter spotted the warning flags Manning had posted earlier. He slowed, picking his spot to keep out of the circumference. A burst of 9mm fire raked up dirt clods at his feet and sheared through small branches in front of him. Throwing himself forward, the Briton tucked and rolled. Cursing silently when he landed wrong and crushed the breath from his lungs. Before McCarter could get to his feet, one of the Colombians stepped around the tree he'd chosen as a defensive position. The man appeared to be as surprised as McCarter and tried to fall back to use the AK-47 he carried. The British commando surged up from the ground, unable to bring the Mossberg pump gun around. Instead, he crashed the barrel of his weapon into the man's lower face. Teeth broke. He hit his opponent again, gained some room, and yanked the shotgun free as the Colombian raised his assault rifle. McCarter hunkered down in expectation. He pulled the helmet on his head, then took a double-fisted grip on the shotgun. 
Dug in, mate. Over. At first it seemed to McCarter that everything had taken place in silence. Huge clumps of earth along the riverbank flew into the air, then rained to the earth in smaller chunks. Some of the underground charges had been placed in the water as well, which created even more spectacular visual effects. They'd been planted in time to create a massive shrug of power that spilled the emplaced Colombians into the open. <laughs> McCarter was in motion at once, racing for the downed Colombians. Perspiration covered his face, and he could feel the crust being created by the flying clods of dust. Debris continued to rain down on him. Two cross trees lay in front of him with broken branches woven together. A head popped up, eyes wild with fear, followed instantly by a rifle barrel. Before McCarter could take evasive action, a round black hole appeared between the Colombian's eyes. Then the head snapped back from view. Ah, <laughs> oh, Raphael. Remind me to buy you a pint after this bloody bit of business is finished. Rafael Enciso was the remaining member of the team. Cuban-born, the man had been witness to a number of turbulent times in his home country while struggling against the communists and Castro. His cunning and training had come from the heart and the battlefield rather than a professional military background. Katz had assigned him to run back up on the play from high in a tree behind the open sights of a Beretta M21 sniper rifle. Evidently, he'd wasted no time climbing into position. McCarter stretched out his left hand and vaulted the fallen tree, going to ground at once. He rolled, carried by his momentum, and kept the shotgun close to his chest. Movement blurred in front of him. Identifying one of his opponents, he dropped the barrel of the Mossberg. The initial charge staggered the cartel man. The Briton levered himself to his feet, then saw Katz come scrambling through a torn haze of branches to his right. You all right? Right as rain, mate. The 9mm parabellum from Katz's Uzi jerked a man from hiding and spilled him over another corpse. The ground was shredded from the explosives. The amount of carnage seemed unbelievable to McCarter, even though he'd seen Manning's handiwork up close and personal many times before. The Canadian was absolutely lethal in his chosen field. McCarter went forward, flanked by Katz. He'd tried counting bodies, but had to give it up. The explosions had made that impossible to do with any kind of accuracy. He could see the brown water through the trees now. The surviving bit of the piper had floated down river, still ablaze. Auto fire drove him to cover behind one of the overturned carts. Katz lay flat behind a corpse, pinned down by the steady stream of bullets. Raphael, yeah. do you have the position of the men firing on David and myself? Yes, but I'm unable to pick them off from here. McCarter scanned the riverbank and caught the floating white smoke of gunfire trailing from a shrub-covered hill at the water's edge. Looks like the last pocket of resistance, mates. He set the Mossberg down beside him, slipped the Browning high power from shoulder leather and steadied himself. He placed his shots carefully, breaking the pattern of auto fire enough to allow Katz to get out of the line of fire. But he was unable to put any of the men down. We're running out of time here. McCarter silently agreed. Coda wouldn't take the assault lying down, and the narco baron had access to a small cadre of attack helicopters that could be rapidly deployed. Calvin? On my way. Knowing what to expect, McCarter shifted and thumbed a fresh magazine from his combat harness. The shots were close enough to keep the cartel people worried, but not enough to scare them out of position. All they had to do at this point was to wait, but they knew it. Katz sat and watched with hawk-like intensity. Gary? Yes? A diversion, if you please, on my mark. Just say when. Raphael? No. Whomever Calvin isn't able to take out is your responsibility. McCarter watched in helpless anticipation. Calvin James was an incredible swimmer. The SEAL training had made him that, but it certainly hadn't made him bulletproof. James would be a sitting duck if anything went wrong. Then he saw a hand break the river surface less than 20 feet from the bank. You have your mark, Gary. Instinctively, McCarter tracked the egg-shaped object out of his peripheral vision. It fell yards short of the hill, despite the Canadian's best efforts. McCarter didn't think he could have made a throw even that far. The grenade hissed a bilious red smoke into the air. A cloud quickly gathered and drifted back over the Colombians. They fired blindly into the smoke, obviously expecting a charge. Like some kind of creature from a horror movie, Calvin James surfaced in the river, Uzi in hand. The surviving Colombians scrambled for the top of the hill. The Phoenix Force members opened fire, grimly aware that Calvin James's life hung on their skills. McCarter slipped a fresh magazine into the Browning while James waded to shore. Manning helped them confirm the kills while Enciso kept watch. They turned over everything from the dead men's pockets that seemed of interest to Katz, then switched their attention to the coca packages scattered across the battle zone. They're still a bit here, so let's deal with them. Right. right. Uh, there's a bunch of loose bags, too. They tossed bags in the river for eight minutes before they were certain they destroyed them all. 
Saddle up. There's still a lot to be done today. Raphael, you have point. McCarter brought up the rear. He paused in the middle of the gentle incline that led toward the river. As he looked over the dead men and counted the blood price Phoenix had exacted from Kota's army, he knew it was only the beginning. For the team to be unleashed like this, too many good people fighting the drug wars had already died. There was no way to get them back. They'd been told to exact a pound of flesh from the jackals thought to be responsible for those deaths. And David McCarter was willing to make sure every ounce weighed in. The damn windshield busted, guys! Jimmy Lee Santee stood with a microphone cupped under his chin. Standing against the crowd of Hong Kong natives behind him and behind the police lines, the man looked like a misplaced cowboy. He wore a white cowboy shirt, a gray Stetson, jeans and boots. A red handkerchief and cowhide gloves stuck out of a back pocket. Near the back of the crowd, Mac Bolan watched Santee. He'd had the man's name in his records for some time as a possible resource. There were other names, but Santee happened to be one of the most accessible at the moment. The big cowboy was crowding 60. The night might have been kind to him and smoothed out some of the wrinkles and age lines, but the executioner's intel in his war book had the man pegged. Santee was ex-cowboy, ex-television star, and ex-Texas. Now he managed props for low-budget and Vietnam-era movies shot in Hong Kong, Thailand, the Philippines, and Taiwan. Santee was also known to dabble in black market goods. Santee knuckled up a fist and strode toward the director's chair. A blind man could see that windshield. There ain't no way you can cover that up in the edits. I told you driving them through them damn fool trash cans wouldn't work. You have to either reshoot this scene or scratch your interior shot from the driver's seat. Bolin drifted along in the man's wake on the other side of the waiting crowd. His combat senses were alert and picked up the undercover police working the movie. He carefully avoided them. The DEA murders were only hours old, and there had been some concern that whoever had killed the agents might try for the movie people as a bonus. It hadn't taken the warrior long to discover that the rumor was being circulated by the movie people themselves to increase interest in the drug war film they were producing. The executioner halted under a darkened neon sign and waited in the shadows. He couldn't hear the conversation between Santee and the young director, but he could tell it obviously wasn't going well for the older man. Two men stepped around the director and started forcing Santee back. The gesture Santee used for the director was universally recognized. When the prop man cleared the crowd, Bolin fell into step beside him. Do something for you? I'm in the market for a gun. I don't know you, mister, and I don't do business with folks I don't know. That's what I was told. But the guy who told me that said I should mention November 29th, 1950, Chosin Reservoir. Bloody bit of fighting that was. This feller tell you to mention anything else? Red Emma. Fair enough. You got any dinero? Yeah. My goods come expensive. I'll pay what's fair, and I'll know fair when I hear it. <laughs> Santee led the way to a travel trailer hooked up to a big Chevy pickup. The trailer was small and compact. It was neater and homier than the weathered exterior led an onlooker to believe. A tiny kitchen filled the front third, and a sofa and chair took up some of the living space that wasn't occupied by padlocked closets. What are you looking for, son? A long gun. You hunting? Dressed as he was in a black turtleneck and black jeans under a dark trench coat, Bola knew there wasn't much about him to let the man guess his business. Soon. Santee pulled a rifle from the closet, unzipped the protective cover, and handed over the weapon for inspection. Bolin stroked the barrel with a fingertip and inspected the film of oil on his skin. That there is a Parker Hale model M87 target rifle. She's calibered in 308 Winchester. Got a mounted bipod and roll-off scope mounts. Damn fine gun. Bolin handed the rifle back. It is. Trouble is, I'm looking for something domestic. Don't want to stand out in a herd? Something like that. Santee put away the Parker Hale and moved down to another closet door. On the wall above this one was a picture of him in full western regalia on the set of the Six-Gun Marshal. Most of these movie stars nowadays like them stylized pieces. Me, I was cut out for lever action and Kentucky windage. Had to learn this new shit just to stay in the business. They have their place. I suppose. Santee took out another rifle and stripped it. This here's as local as you get. 
The SVD Dragunov is a Russian sniper rifle first introduced in 1963. I'll take it. Poland chose a Makarov 9mm for his sidearm. Santi had a paddle holster to fit and threw it in free. The Type 56 Chinese-made AK-47 wasn't a surprise. The warrior had seen the movie heavies waving them around earlier. The price for all three weapons was a little high, but Bolin paid it anyway. Santee put the money away in a fireproof box tucked behind a piece of false siding near the ceiling. Them serial numbers is faked. You get caught with them guns, local law's gonna light a fire under your ass wanting to know where you got them. If you send them my way, I'll just be sending them on again. Chances are, I won't be in town more than another hour. Got me a little vacation lined up. Me and the director have got a creative difference going on. Uh, I figure I'll either go fishing for a few days, or I'm liable to kick his ass up between his ears. Boland slung the rifles over his shoulders, concealing them with a the trench coat. His rental car wasn't far, and the opening numbers for this operation were falling fast. Offer you a cup of coffee, son? Help take the bite out of that wind. Sure. Santee took a pack of foam cups from a drawer. When Bolin accepted the coffee, he noticed the glass jar of what looked like plastic coins. He reached inside, took one out, and found they were plastic replicas of Texas Rangers badges. Santee hunkered down behind the bar. Mementos, mostly. I used to give them away to the kids who came to watch me on the set during my TV show. Their movie career cost me two marriages and some of my best years. Still can't chuck them things away like I ought to. You mind if I take a few? No, son, go ahead, help yourself. Kids don't ask for them no more, anyhow. Bolin dropped a handful inside his trench coat pocket. It might be an idea to put them away for a while after tonight. I like the cut of your style, son. You're here about them DEA boys, ain't you? Yeah. Yeah, I knew it as soon as I saw you. Your eyes got the look of somebody about to do something needs doing. Shame I ain't twenty years younger. I ride alone. I understand just how you feel. I have a couple of other questions. Ask him. Who's the guy on the set who supplies the nose candy to today's stars? That'd be Ryan Jeremy. He's connected with the local distribution people? Yes, sir. As connected as they come, hustles a little triad action in the States for Karen Tot when he needs to. Pictures himself as a real wheeler dealer. And where will I find him? Hell, past midnight, sets due to wrap soon as they finish the scene. Old Ryan will have himself a party going at the Blue Lotus. Sounds like a yuppies kind of place, don't it? Security's pretty tight there, son. Keep your head down and your powder dry. You too. Bolin left the trailer, made sure he wasn't followed, then headed for his car. After stashing the rifles in the trunk, he slid behind the wheel, keyed the ignition, and headed for the Queensway nightlife. Where can I find Ryan Jeremy? There. Bolin tipped the waitress, then moved across the crowded dance floor to the bar. He put his back to the wall as he took a seat. He had a clear view of Ryan Jeremy and the crowd of people the man held in thrall. The bartender drifted over. The warrior ordered a bottle of beer and drank it slowly as he watched the movement around Jeremy. The man obviously enjoyed being the center of attention. He was slim and slightly horse-faced, with sandy blonde hair fashionably styled and flashing green eyes. Confidence oozed from every pore, and jewelry gleamed on his fingers and wrists. Despite being unbuttoned, his suit coat hung just right. Occasionally a camera flash would go off, and most of the 15 people gathered around the long table would automatically go on point. It didn't take much to figure out that most of the crowd was used to being on the business end of a camera lens. Thirty minutes passed. During that time, more people arrived, a few departed, and Bolin got a table. He ordered a ham and cheese on rye from the waitress and had ten minutes to digest it before a Chinese man in a dark blue suit came to collect Jeremy. Making his excuses, obviously intending to return in only a few minutes, Jeremy left the table and followed the other man to a bank of elevators. Bolin figured his check, added a tip, then moved to intercept Jeremy and his companion. The Blue Lotus was on the third floor, above two stories of shops and family businesses offering personal services. The eight floors above contained apartments for foreigners on extended business stays. A tired-looking maid looked up as Jeremy and the man stepped into the cage. What floor? 
Bolin stopped the closing of the double doors with one hand. The eighth. Oh, sorry. I'm going down. I didn't notice the arrow. Bolin released the door after checking the button display in the chrome interior's reflection. Buttons for two other floors before the eighth were lit. As soon as he moved back, another elevator arrived. He entered, then punched eight. Since Jeremy's car had to make stops, the executioner arrived first. He stepped off at the eighth floor and loosened his jacket. The Makarov filled his hand. He kept it hidden in the folds of his trench coat and knocked at the door nearest him. When no one responded, he let himself in with a credit card, then pulled the door almost shut behind him. The room was dark and filled with the smells of soaps and disinfectants. The executioner checked the hallway, found it empty, and saw the Chinese man disappearing into a room on the left, four doors down. He bolted, lifted the mucker off, and snapped off the safety. What's going on? As he rounded the doorway, Bolin had a brief impression of the Chinese man reaching for a hidden weapon while trying to shut the door. There was another Chinese inside the room, sitting on the bed next to a briefcase. Oh, shit! Jeremy went for the floor. Ah! The executioner's foot collided with the closing door and kicked it open again. The man inside the room had his pistol in both hands and took deliberate aim. Bolin fired instinctively. Knowing there was no way the shooting had gone unnoticed, Bolin reached down for Jeremy and roughly brought the man to his feet. He flattened his prisoner against the wall and gave him a quick frisk that turned up nothing. Move! Man, there's a quarter million dollars lying on that bed! You care enough about it to stay here and die with it? I mean... But Jeremy's eyes didn't leave the briefcase. Walk, and keep walking. Try to escape and I'll drop you and walk over your body. Bolin reached into his pocket, dropped one of the plastic Texas Ranger badges on the dead man's chest, then followed Jeremy into the hallway. A few curious heads had popped from the doorways of nearby rooms, vanishing as Bolin and Jeremy made their way down the hall. Four people were inside the elevator, dressed as if they'd just come from the dance floor downstairs. Bolin grabbed Jeremy by the collar and slammed him into position to hold the doors open. <laughs> Out! <laughs> The new arrivals didn't hesitate after seeing the gun in the executioner's fist. Once inside the cage, Bolin pressed all the buttons. He pocketed the Makarov, making sure Jeremy saw him do it. Try anything, and I'll put you down. And if I do what you say? You get to live. Is that simple enough? Yeah, yes. Put your hands down. Jeremy did. The cage stopped on the seventh floor, and Bolin pushed his prisoner out ahead of him. What the hell's going on up there? A handful of people had gathered in the hall and stood in small groups. Bolin hustled his prisoner toward the fire escape. Don't know, but hotel security seems to have everything under control now. Bolin had Jeremy get the door, and they started down the stairs. What do you know about the DEA hits down in the harbor? Jeremy clung to the railing fearfully, stumbled, and barely managed to catch himself. Using his greater weight and leverage, Bolin kept the man moving. The ruse with the elevator wouldn't last for long. Nothing. Bolin spun the men around the landing, then headed down another flight of stairs, gathering speed. Somebody knows. Not me. Keron Tot? It's not his way. Then he can find out who. Tet doesn't run the action in the harbor. Nobody does. It costs too much to hold control over it. The triads cut one another to pieces over it for years. Now they leave one another alone. Tot can find out. He won't. You tell him it's going to cost him more and more the longer we have to wait. W uh, we? Keep moving. He operates the Bayun Textile Warehouse in Guangzhou. We'll contact him there. If he's not there when we call, he can mark off another piece of his organization. Jeremy stumbled as they reached the next landing. Bolin slammed the man against the wall to help him keep his balance. Ugh. You also tell him that when we call, all we want is the answers we're looking for. Anything else and we'll assume he's just trying to stall for time. We're gonna keep on hitting him until he delivers. W what if he doesn't know? Then he's gonna have to find out. He won't let you get away with this. He doesn't have a choice at this point. Do you know who you're fucking with here? Bolin halted the man at the second floor landing. He put himself nose to nose with his captive. Yeah, I know. But he doesn't know me. He took one of the plastic badges out of his pocket and pressed it into Jeremy's hand. Give that to him. Tell him he'll be seeing more of them real soon. Jeremy's hand made a fist over the badge. And you tell Karan Tat that if he doesn't have the answer soon enough, we'll take him out too and move on down the line till we find somebody who does know the answers. Understand? Yeah, I sure do. Bolin pushed Jeremy backward, <clears throat> controlling his fall as he tripped over the stone steps and eased the guy into a sitting position. <laughs> if you don't deliver the message, I'll come back for you. Wrapping his arms around his knees, Jeremy shivered and nodded. <clears throat> 
Boland turned and sprinted down the final flights of stairs. In minutes, he made it to street level without being seen, then let the night take him away. The intel Boland had in his war book on Karan Tat's organization was sketchy at best. The Chinese opium lord had risen to power slowly, inheriting the position from stronger men who had gone before him. But once he'd reached his present status, Karen Tat had worked hard to maintain his hold on the business. People who had gone up against him had died quickly and loudly. The executioner left his rental car five blocks from the waterfront hotel, hid the Dragunov sniper rifle under his trench coat, and walked. He paid for a room on the third floor in small bills to give the sleepy hotel clerk even less reason to remember him, and went up. Once in his room, he raised the window, stepped out, and took a skeletal metal fire escape to the rooftop. Usually, when he moved on an operation, Boland did a series of soft probes and recon work. A section of his war book was filled with neatly written rows of rumor and half-truths about Karan Tat's business holdings. His preliminary testing of Tat's organization would have separated the facts from fiction. He wasn't entirely flying blind, but the guesswork made things uncomfortable. On the rooftop, he kept low and crept to the edge of the building. The moon was full and was reflected from the dozens of miniature ponds formed by collected rainwater in the tar and pebble surface. Everything else was masked by shadows, which absorbed the executioner as he took up his position. He wasn't sure what stance the DEA and the United States would take on the murder of the agents in Hong Kong, nor was he sure exactly how widespread the violence was. Confused reports from Colombia, Paris, and Switzerland, among others, continued to pour in through the news sources. He'd listened to them during the flight over, mentally cataloged them, and filed them away. From his brief talk with Barbara Price, he'd gathered the Stony Man mission controller was only waiting for the call that would allow her to unleash Able Team and Phoenix Force. The president wasn't the kind of man who would let something like this pass unchallenged. For himself, there was no confusion. The executioner had come to Hong Kong to do what he could, to make certain people who had fallen would be avenged. The warrior took a pair of night glasses from a pocket of the trench coat and scanned the harbor. Sampans and flatboats littered the water. He moved through them swiftly once he found his bearings. A previous recon had allowed him to locate the vessel he searched for and assured him that his prey was still aboard. The Yellow Lion was a 52-foot American motor sailor berthed in private docking. She looked sleek and expensive, her name written in English and Chinese across her bow. A group of men stood guard amidships, dressed in dark clothing. Bolin adjusted the magnification of the field glasses. None was the man he wanted. He waited patiently, moving on to scan the lighted windows of the boat. In less than ten minutes, Fai Shan stepped onto the deck, flanked by a bodyguard. Bolin recognized the man from the pictures he'd studied. Shan was Tat's number one man in the Hong Kong Kowloon area. Now in his 40s, Shan had been picked from the gutter at an early age and groomed to be Tat's personal aide. The word Bolin got was that Shan was so close to the old man that it seemed as if they were blood kin. When in Hong Kong, Shan traveled aboard the Yellow Lion. The boat was off limits to the local police, and it was generally accepted as truth that Shan never transported contraband aboard the vessel. Women were another matter. From the reports Bolin had, Shan possessed a brand of lust that exacted an expensive price. At least nine women in the past two years had taken a cruise on the motor sailor and were never seen again. Bolin put the field glasses away and reached for the Dragunov. On board the vessel, one of the bodyguards walked to the starboard side to reel in the line attached to the dinghy. Shan stood on the deck and put a cigarette in his thin-lipped mouth. Bolin hunkered behind the butt of the sniper rifle and gazed through the PSO-1 telescopic sight, which featured a graduated range-finding scale. Although not fashioned for night work, there was enough moonlight to see fairly well. The warrior put the range at 270 yards, then locked in his shot. The dinghy bumped into the bigger boat, and the man began to tie it alongside. Stroking a lighter in his cupped palms, Fai Shan bent to light his cigarette. As the illumination touched his target's face, the executioner took up slack on the trigger. Both eyes open, tracking in case the men moved more quickly than he'd anticipated, Boland zoomed in on his second target. The big rifle bucked against his shoulder again, kicking the projectile out at 2,733 feet per second. Locking in on his third target as the man lunged for the safety of the cabin entrance, the executioner squeezed the trigger. The bullet caught the man in a hip and spun him away. Sporadic muzzle flashes gave away the fourth man's position. 
when the gunner tried to race to the cabin, Bolin picked him off with two quick shots that caught him in the chest. The body tumbled into the dark water. Spotting the remaining man diving into the harbor, the executioner waited. A silvery spiral of air bubbles surfaced before the man. When his face came into view almost 20 feet from the vessel, Bolin put a round between the man's eyes. The body sank out of sight. Bolin unhurriedly put the scope back on Fai Shan's ruined face. He bracketed the man's head with the four shots remaining in the clip. The bullets dug splinters from the polished deck. Satisfied, he recharged the weapon with one of the extra magazines, dropped one of the plastic badges onto the rooftop, and started for the fire escape. The police teams would be able to triangulate the source of the shots from the bullets he'd placed into the Yellow Lion's deck, and they'd find the badge. He was certain, once they knew of it, that Karen Tat would soon learn of Sean's death and the badge as well. The Blitz was underway. Mac Bolin stood in the shadows of the public phone. Hong Kong was still vibrant around him, painted with neon colors. A few blocks away, sirens could be heard screaming their way down to the harbor. Karen Tat? One moment. Bolin glanced at his watch, logging the time. The fact that Karen Tat might try to trace the call didn't bother him. He'd be gone before anyone could arrive. But he didn't want the drug lord to guess that he was being menaced by only one man. Hello? Karan Tat? Speaking. I called to let you know Fai Shan and four of his men are dead. So I have been told. What do you want? The people behind the DEA hit. I do not know these people. Then find out. Time to reload. Stony Man has continued on the next CD. I see two guys on the outside. Carl Lyons rested easily against the safety belt encircling the power line pole, his spiked boots thrust deep into the wood. Outside perimeter at 10 and 3, with your position being 12. I read you. Get it? Two guys at the front door, standing guard between the garage and the south wing. Lyons lifted the night vision binoculars that hung around his neck and scanned the outside of the house again. A pool, placidly blue, occupied the center courtyard in the middle of four buildings roofed in red tile. The garage set off by itself, while the other three buildings formed an L behind it. With the way the land fell in Pacific Palisades, construction of the home had been expensive. To level that much ground was costly. But the money hadn't meant much to the people living inside the dwelling. Lyons picked up the two men standing in front of the gate of the wrought iron fence that secured the ground. Both were dressed in street clothes and wore dreadlocks. Neither appeared to be armed, but the able team leader knew they were packing. The house belonged to Meripen, a Rastafarian drug dealer scarcely removed from the Jamaican jungles. The file Kurtzman and Price had forwarded read like a horror novel. As a general rule, the Jamaican posses were run by a guy strong in the magic of the island's particular brand of voodoo. The members weren't only loyal, but they feared for their lives as well. Meripen was ruthless. An unofficial estimate, cross-referenced through the LAPD, the Los Angeles Sheriff's Department, and the FBI, held the man's kills at 32, and he was only 28 years old. Lyons had a healthy respect for the Rastafarian and his organization going in. He knew from experience how deadly they could be. Got them. Makes the head count somewhere around 18. Rosario Blancanales and Herman Schwartz were jungle fighters, hailing back to Vietnam and Mac Boland's Pen Team Abel, They'd seen death up close, grinned in its face, and spit in its eye. Blancanales, called the politician by his friends because of his talent for using words with as much skill and precision as a sniper used bullets, sat in the back of the white Ford van, which had local power company markings on its sides. He was running logistics and backup while Lyons and Schwartz pulled recon. 18. Don't worry, Paul. I'll see if I can talk Iron Man into saving you one or two. Nicknamed Gadgets, Herman Schwartz was a deadly, crafty individual. There wasn't anything electronic that he couldn't use to create some kind of communications device or a booby trap. Lyons unslung the binoculars and stashed them inside his jacket. Okay, the prelim count stands at 18. If we wait around, they could up that, or we could end up chasing Maripin through the streets, and that definitely isn't on my list of things to do. The leader of Able Team was an ex-LAPD detective, drawn from the ranks when Stony Man Farm had been formed to battle the increasing threat of terrorists. Like the other two men, he had shared a previous history with Mac Bolan. 
only his role had been as an adversary. During the early days of the executioner's war against the Mafia, Lyons had been one of the cops assigned to the Hard Case Corps, given the responsibility of bringing the soldier in, dead or alive. Then and now, he'd earned his nickname of Iron Man by being one of the wildest players on the field. Let's do it. Pussyfooting has never been our style, and I'm getting damn tired of pretending to read these gas meters. Lyons looked south and saw Schwartz's jumpsuited figure less than a block from his position. We're on it. Give me some time to get into place. You got it. Navigating carefully, Lyons shimmied his way down the pole. He kicked off the spiked boots and dropped the belt on top of them. Then he pulled a pair of tennis shoes from the heavy toolbox he'd carried from the van and put them on. Beneath the loose-fitting jacket, he wore a Kevlar vest and a combat harness. His Colt Government Model 45 rode in shoulder leather. He took the holstered Colt Python 357 from the toolbox, then belted it around his hips. Incendiaries were attached to the webbing and were in his pockets, as were speed loaders and extra magazines for the pistols. The last thing he removed from the toolbox before abandoning it was a 45 ACP Ingram Mac 10. Then he strode toward Merripin's house. The houses were close together, separated by cultivated bushes and trees designed to enhance a feeling of privacy that didn't exist above the second floor of most residences. He crossed one of the winding two-lane streets cutting through the neighborhood, then fell back into the bushes to mask his approach. Once inside the perimeter of the verdant growth, he shed the power company jacket and the ball cap. Less than five minutes later, he was at the back of the house, overlooking the patio and the kidney-shaped pool. The hallway connecting the master bedroom to the living room ran as a separate corridor. Through the hallway windows, he could see the two men beyond the wrought iron gates. The other rooms were closed off from view. He tapped the transmit button on his headset. Ready. Showtime. Keep a close eye out there, Iron Man. I learned this one from Fall Guy reruns. Terrific. The two Rastafarians posted at the gate looked up in idle curiosity. Lyons balanced the Mac-10 in both hands as he caught sight of Schwartz's pickup racing down the street. Then he lost the truck when the road dipped in front of the house. Abruptly, the vehicle was back again, this time on the other side of the two sets of windows. The pickup slewed off the street, fishtailing sideways for a moment as the transmission shifted downward and the tires sought traction. One of the Rastafarians had time to level a pistol before the pickup was on top of them. Lyons sprinted for the house. The two gate guards ran for their lives, then the pickup shot through the wrought iron gates. Unable to find traction on the concrete surface surrounding the pool, the truck went right into the pool. A second later, gadgets broke the surface with a CAR-15 clenched in one fist. The triburst hammered a Rastafarian, drawing down on him, tearing him loose from the stone column that had helped frame the gate. Lyons fired the Mac-10 from the hip. Paul! Go! Gadgets is inside! I heard. Don't worry, I'll be there. Lyons charged through the shattered floor-to-ceiling window in front of him. He slid through the glass fragments and didn't bother trying to stop until he slammed into the opposite wall inside the hallway with his shoulder. He lost his breath for a moment, and swirling black dots crowded into his vision. Dropping to one knee, he raised the machine pistol as a figure staggered in from the living room area at the other end of the hallway. The man was a Rastafarian, and he held an AK-47 in his arms. Amon! The burst caught the man in the chest and punched him back inside the room. Shoot, don't talk. Lyons scrambled back to the master bedroom and yanked a grenade from his combat harness. When he looked, two men with automatic weapons were headed into the bathroom. Lyons knew from the blueprints that another door in that room led to the courtyard and pool. The rear man saw him. <coughs> Debris flew out into the hallway, settling over Lyons. <coughs> He waved a hand in front of his face. Paul? Three seconds, Iron Man. Just remember who the good guys are. Lyons ripped a smoke grenade from his vest, pulled the pin, and flung the bomb toward the living room. An inky black cloud spewed out and filled the room. Standing beside the three windows overlooking the courtyard, Lyons peered through. The pickup had tilted forward and sunk straight down so that the rear third of it jutted skyward. Two more Rastafarians were stretched across the tiles. Schwartz was pinned down behind a stone bench he'd obviously overturned for protection. A glance at the peak roof of the garage showed Lyons that Blancanales had gained his position with his M21 Beretta sniping rifle. Anytime you run in on this Iron Man, you just step right on in. Just catching my breath. Lyons took a pair of grenades from his harness, then slammed the machine pistol into the bullet fractured window. Lyons pulled two grenade pins, then lobbed the orbs over the swimming pool into the hedges lining the wall of the family room. A gunner attempted to bolt through one of the windows. 
The concussive force generated by the grenades folded the side of the wall in and brought the roof tilting down at an angle. On the move and out of magazines for the machine pistol, Lyons dropped the MAC-10 and drew the Colt government model. He raced toward the smoke-filled living room, going over the blueprints in his mind to get his bearings. Once inside, he was blinded by the acrid smoke. The dining room was at 12 o'clock, the kitchen was at 3. He couldn't hear anything from either direction. Finding the wall to his right, he put the pistol in his other hand, then trailed his fingers along the textured surface to find the door leading to the hallway and the utility room. Someone touched him in the smoky darkness. When he didn't get an immediate electronic feedback from his headset, he knew it wasn't Schwartz or Blancanales. He swung the pistol at what he considered to be head level, but missed. He grabbed the guy's shirt with his other hand. Lyons felt the solid impact of a bullet kick into his stomach. The Kevlar kept it from penetrating, but the expended force took his breath away and made his head whirl. Ignoring the pain, Lyons stepped in closer to his opponent and kneed the guy in the crotch. The man could bob and weave and swing his head around, but his midsection wasn't going anywhere. Lyons went down with the man and quickly put him in an arm lock. A quick frisk turned up another pistol and a long, thin-bladed knife. After disarming him, he picked the man up from behind and put him in a chokehold, screwing the barrel of the 45 into his ear. He felt the man's arms go up in surrender. Iron Man! Go! Lyons stumbled into the hallway. It was clearer there, and he could see two-dimensional shapes. Farther on, the collapsed roof blocked the hallway. Hey, you'll be putting the gun down now. Lyons swung toward the utility room, barely making out a hard man through his tearing eyes. Iron Man! <laughs> Busy! The Rastafarian seemed hesitant to shoot. Lyons wasn't. <laughs> the man bounced off the wall behind him, then slumped to the floor. What did you want? Lyons looked for a way out. In the end, he followed the twisting trail of smoke winding through the shattered windows that lined the hallway. The locals are on their way. Are we clear here? Yeah. Get the van and let's move out. What about Meripin? In the courtyard, his vision only fuzzy now instead of blinded, Lyons looked at the man he had. Meripin had scarred cheeks and smoldering hazel eyes. He looked at Lyons through red-rimmed, hooded lids. You'll be a dead man walking. Not today, asshole. Lyons keyed the transmitter. We got lucky with Meripin. That's the call we know and love. When detailed planning and strategy go out the window, there's always luck. Still recovering from the smoke and the painful bruise under the Kevlar vest, Lyons didn't reply. Instead, he leathered the colt, used the handcuffs at the back of his belt to secure his prisoner, then shoved Meripin at the ruined gate as Schwartz took up point. Yakov Katzenellenbogen passed out the colored computer printout. Her name is Maria Alfaro. Gary Manning studied it and committed the face to memory, then pushed it at Calvin James. Katz stood with his back to the wall of the small room Colombian F-2 intelligence let them use as a base of operations while in the country. The walls were barren of information and surrounded a desk, a rectangular table, and seven wooden chairs. A coffee maker was set up near the door a leaning tower of cups standing beside it. The Phoenix Force leader looked over his team and knew every man there was bone-tired. Despite the success of the earlier mission, the trip back had been excruciating. Kota's forces, according to their F-2 liaison, were in disarray. James handed the contact sheet to David McCarter. She's a good-looking woman. <sighs> She's DEA, undercover. I assume she must be operating within Kota's organization. Yes, the agency had managed to slip two people into Coda's operation almost a year ago. McCarter handed the sheet to Raphael and Ciso. A year is a long time to be in deep. Hell, mate. Three months can be a bloody lifetime when you're in with the wrong crowd. What about a partner? He was found out and killed by Coda's forces two months ago. The agency was reluctant to admit this, but Kurtzman accessed some files they had hidden. Once Price confronted them with our knowledge of the situation, they had to own up to the truth. But Alfaro is still operational? The DEA believes so. They recovered the body of the other agent, but they've had no contact with Alfaro since her partner was murdered. Her partner didn't give her up? Katz regarded the stocky Cuban. After being involved in the bloody politics in Cuba's efforts to overthrow Fidel Castro, and Cesar was used to the abrupt changes of wind from companions who were supposed to be friends. The other agent wasn't tortured. He was killed by a single bullet from behind. How does Alfaro fit into Coda's little group? McCarter reached back into the ice chest they'd been given as a welcoming present from the F-2 people working the trenches and took out a can of Coca-Cola Classic. She's his lover. Oh, a tidy little arrangement. 
Could be she's working this to get the best of both worlds. With Coda, she gets to live the life of Riley, and maintaining her connection with the DEA, she's more or less granted immunity if the guy gets busted. Unless she ends up dead. James took the picture from Enciso and looked at it again. Our primary mission is to take Coda down, gather information, if we can, about the recent drug enforcement agency's hits, and get out of here in one piece. If we're able, we're going to bring Alfaro out with us. If not... Then she finds her own way home. We do the favor as long as it doesn't slow us down. James passed the contact sheet back to Katz. Any questions? When do we go? Now. The men of Phoenix Force stood, gathered their duffels, and started for the door. Katz lagged behind them for a moment, long enough to place the picture of Maria Alfaro on top of the other fact sheets they'd received from Stonyman Farm. Then he gathered the documents and dropped them into the waste paper basket beside the desk. Using a lighter, he fired up a paper napkin left over from the quick lunch they'd had brought in, then dropped the flaming paper into the bin. The picture of the female DEA agent blackened around the edges and curled in on itself as it burned. She is very pretty. Alfaro was in her mid-thirties, with a chiseled face cut in smooth lines and a nose that stopped just short of being too long. Her cropped ebony hair offset her olive complexion very well. The only jewelry she wore were diamond chip earrings. A gentle woman, an onlooker would have thought, but Katz knew differently from reading her files. Maria Alfaro had learned how to go for the jugular. If she had turned, she would make a formidable foe. The fire erased her image, but not the possible threat. When it was out, Katz poured a bottle of seltzer water over the glowing embers, then stirred them around with a telescoping pointer he'd found in the desk. Satisfied, he grabbed his duffel and followed his men. Barbara Price stared at the piles of hard copy spread over her desk. Even as advanced as the Stony Man computer equipment was, doubled with the deep space satellite links they had access to, and with Kurtzman's deft hand guiding the intelligence acquisitions, she felt as if they were missing something in their search. A pounding headache had taken root between her temples. After taking care of her headache, she went back to work. Kurtzman had his team working like a well-oiled machine, gleaning information from news services and tapping domestic and foreign intelligence circles. Numerous leads had been cultivated. At present, none was leading anywhere definite. The reports had tripled. The death toll had almost doubled and was rising. She turned to look at the television monitor at the back of her office, which was tuned to CNN. She'd switched the voice off, but the picture broadcast footage from different hotspots. Keeping up with the location tags as the reporter gave a summary of events was almost a full-time job. The murders ran the gamut of violent death, shootings, bombings, one-on-one -on -one assassinations, and group carnage. Their invisible enemy was skilled in every one. Then she realized she'd been thinking of the opponents as someone other than the visible heads of the drug empires around the world. Subconsciously, she'd already rejected that theory. But if it was someone else, she was puzzled as to whom it might be. Brignola had been right. They needed to broaden their scope because they were getting lost in the microcosm they'd chosen to blame. They needed to know the why in order to figure out the who. Once they knew that, they could work on eradicating the threat. She reached for the remote control and clicked the television off, then left the office and walked into Kurtzman's theater of operations. The big man was at his post, hands playing across the keyboard like a virtuoso playing the concert performance of his life. Screen after screen of information flashed onto the monitor in front of him, then divided into individual windows and kept moving. Price came to a halt behind Kurtzman and waited patiently. Hey, Barb. Frustrated yet? Passed my eyeballs a long time ago. Good. I was beginning to think I was the only one. Coffee? No, thank you. Fair enough. More for me. Have you heard from Leo? Leo Turin had been a Bolin ally since his Mafia days. Yeah, five minutes ago. He got a lead through one of his Mafia connections. <sighs> Kurtzman rolled back up the ramp and hit the keyboard. The screen opened up and showed profile and full frontal shots of a grizzled old man with a fringe of hair around a bald head. The gunmetal gray eyes looked as if they'd been set back in dark hollows. He was neatly dressed in a bronze three-piece suit. Laborio Perella. Right. Used to go by Packy Perella back in the good old days. I thought he was retired or dead. Oh, real dinosaur. 
Perella was one of the guys who couldn't make the change to legitimacy the way so many of the Italian mafia did after the heat came down in the 70s. He ran drugs in Florida. Well, you know your history. Kurtzman tapped the keyboard again. The monitor screen flicked to page after page of what was evidently a long document. Reproduced black and white pictures from newspapers broke up the lines of copy. Perella had been decades younger. When his peers tried to sink into legal holdings, Packy struggled to keep an iron fist on Miami. He'd gotten a start in the pre-Castro days in Cuba in the late 50s and early 60s. A shooter, very dangerous guy. But Packy wasn't prepared for competitors like the Colombians and the Rastafarians. You mean people he couldn't scare away through intimidation? Right. Packy's boys would kill one guy, the Colombians would kill three or four of his right back. He's been walking with a cane since 1983, when an assassination attempt was almost successful. Unable to get any support from his cronies, he closed up shop, bought an isolated mansion in the Tarpon Springs area, and left Miami behind. So what's Leo on to? He said maybe nothing, but he didn't want to sit around the farm waiting to see what everybody else found out. Send Charlie Mott and a support team down there. Special Justice ID in case any inquiries come up. Is there any way we can get a message to Leo to let him know they're coming? Uh, he's flying chartered air. I can have someone try. Do it. I trust Leo's instincts. If he smells something fishy, it's probably there. Kurtzman made a note. Has Able Team checked in? They're at the L.A. Sheriff's Office interrogating their prisoner. We'll know something when they know something. What about Phoenix Force? They're in the field staking out Coda. And Stryker? No word, but I've been keeping an eye peeled for news reports coming out of Hong Kong. Been a busy night for the local police. <laughs> Seems gangster types are running a high mortality rate right now. Price looked at the wall screen at the opposite end of the room. Akira Takedo, lean and compact, his punk-cut ebony hair jutting forth defiantly, worked at his console, eyes focused on the monitor as he arranged intel being siphoned in from the various world police agencies. From what I've seen, the attacks against the drug enforcement agents have slacked off. Yeah, I've noticed that too. Yet police aggression has picked up, and they're having a high success rate. And instead of retaliating immediately, it seems the drug organizations are more confused than anything. Doesn't make sense, does it? No. That was the thing that bothered Price most of all. She knew the answers were out there. It was just a matter of finding out where to look and having the time to do it. She had the uncomfortable feeling that the whole scenario was locked securely on someone's timetable. Figuring out why would give them the goal that someone had in mind. And perhaps a means of shutting the operation down. There's paper on this son of a bitch from out of Kingston, Jamaica, besides our own outstanding warrants. Carl Lyons nodded. He'd taken an instant liking to Sheriff Oren Conniger. The big lawman was tough-minded and wouldn't cut any corners for anyone not respecting his turf. But he was also a guy Lyons felt he could deal with. They talked in the sheriff's office, with the blinds closed on the two windows overlooking the bullpen. Conniger rested easily in the old-fashioned swivel chair behind the organized chaos topping the large desk. He was a lean man, well into his graying years. Close-clipped hair made the bushy mustache under his hooked nose stand out even more. Broad shoulders stretched his white western shirt, and Lyons couldn't help thinking a five-pointed star should have been pinned on the guy's left breast to complete the image. Lyons leaned against the closed doorway. I'm not here to pony up a jurisdiction dispute. Now that really relieves me, Agent Lidecker. Really, it does. I just want a chance to go one-on-one -on -one with the guy before we sink him into the system and lose him. Seems like you had that chance before we caught up to you. Conniger put one booted foot on the desk, then crossed it with the other. He reached out and brushed imaginary dirt from the polished tops. No chance at all. After leaving the Pacific Palisades estate, a sheriff's department helicopter had picked them up at once. Within minutes, they'd been surrounded by three cruisers with flashing lights. Merripin had crowed exultantly when the deputies removed him from Able Team's custody. My investigators are still searching through the wreckage you people left to that home. They had to ship in additional body bags. Now, I don't know where you usually work, Agent Lidecker, but that kind of shit doesn't cut it in my town. When the Justice Department contacted my office, I'd assumed we'd be pursuing some kind of joint venture here. Instead, I find you and your boys out playing suburban vigilante. Would you have been willing to back our play? Hell no. You boys ever stop to realize how many people could have been hurt during that little fracas? Nobody got hurt. You're lucky. We're good. Hell, I bet you think you're tougher than hemorrhoids, too. On most days. And you bear a striking resemblance, son. No glory in that. I've been told that, too. 
Looks like I'm not covering any unexplored territory here. No? How much trouble can you cause if I refuse to let you see Maripan? Enough that you can pass it on to your grandchildren. I got paperwork lined up and waiting for my call. Then why haven't you called? You're not a man I want to push, Sheriff. I respect you, respect the job you're doing here, but I have my own agenda. The Sheriff dropped his feet to the floor and leaned forward to touch his intercom. Barnes. Yes, sir. Where's Maripan? Showers. They're delousing him now, Sheriff. I'm on my way. You tell them to keep him there. Yes, sir. Conniger stood and hitched his gun belt around his hips. A Smith & Wesson 44 Magnum rode in seasoned and worn Sam Brown leather. You're going to get your interview with this guy, but I'm going to be on hand for it. I don't have a problem with that. If I get anything out of Maripan, chances are it'll be something that takes me out of the county. You're working those drug enforcement desks, aren't you, son? Yeah. Conniger opened the door. I suspected it from the moment you and your team blew in through my front door. We're still working on our subtlety. Well, you damn sure aren't letting the effort get the better of you. Lyons smiled back and was first out the door. They walked side by side between the rows of desks toward the hallway and the waiting elevators. The county jail was a huge, multi-story affair made of steel, brick, and glass. Even the dim lighting in the hallways was oppressive. How much do your people know that they aren't telling? Conniger pressed a button for one of the lower levels. Nothing yet. That for show is that for real? The last I heard, that's for real. Conniger nodded and scratched his chin in open speculation. Scary thought. Yeah. I'm just an old country boy, and I guess I'm prone to such thinking. But the notion that some of these newspaper people got, that this is just a bunch of random strikes, is purely unadulterated bullshit. For what it's worth, and as corny as it sounds, I think there's some kind of conspiracy going on. The drug empires scattered around the world aren't generally known for their congeniality, especially to one another. These guys take each other out. Get enough stakes on the table, son, everybody will be inclined to take up a hand sooner or later. And you're talking about a hell of a lot of dinero out there. There's a lot of product out there, too. Contrary to what the users believe, there's not a drug shortage in the streets. That's just a myth the pushers use to drive up the prices. Could be. The elevator coasted to a stop. Conniger held the door shut with the button. But you keep something in mind. I lost five good men this morning who were working surveillance on Maripan and a couple of other people. You find out something workable in this neck of the woods, you give me a call. I'll do that. Conniger released the button. And they went out into the hall, toward the showers and general processing. Lyons grimaced when he remembered that Blunkinellis and Schwartz were waiting for him in the cafeteria. Even a cup of hot coffee sounded good now. They went through the doors at the end of the hall and into the lab. A man in a white coat was sprawled beside a desk, a bloody hole punched through his chest. Son of a bitch! Lyons raked the cold government model from shoulder leather and scanned the perimeters. Nothing moved. The 44 in his fist, Conniger sprinted to the desk, checked the man, then reached for the phone. He punched a two-digit number. Lyons moved into place along the wall. Seal the building! I want every man jack identified and in place in five minutes! No one in or out! Conniger hung up and crossed the room to back Lyons. Mouth dry with anticipation, the able team warrior peered around the corner of the shower. The muzzle of the 45 followed his eyes automatically, tracking across the room. Maripin was to his left, stripped naked, suspended from an electrical cord tied around the spewing shower head. The Rastafarian slumped midway to his knees. Someone had cut his throat with a broad-bladed knife, exposing the white bones in his neck. Lyons crossed the shower room floor to the opposite end of the room, which overlooked another section of the lab. No one was there. He turned back to Conniger and shook his head. He walked into the spray, bouncing off the corpse, then reached out and turned the knob to shut off the flow. Maripan's sightless eyes were filled with false tears from the showerhead. Whatever information the man had possessed, if any, had died with him. From under the cover of darkness, Mac Bolan reached for the first perimeter guard. The soldier clapped a big hand over the guy's lower face, then pulled him from sight. Bolan knelt beside the corpse and searched it. He ignored the Uzi and the 357 Magnum the guy was carrying. He didn't have room for the extra weight. When he found the light amplifying goggles in the guy's gear, he mentally readjusted his assault on the factory. He stripped the 9mm ammo from the body, recovered his knife, cleaned it and put it away, then picked up the body. The executioner was dressed for the night. He wore a skin-tight black suit with the Makarov riding his hip. The AK-47 was slung over his back, barrel pointed down so that it could be brought quickly into play. Supporting the corpse, he walked to the rear entrance of the factory and put the dead face next to the sliding spy hole. 
Bolin had observed the process earlier from across the street. Rain beat it up against the oily sheen staining the metal door. He drew the mucker off and held it at the dead man's back. What? Coffee. It's cold out here. The spy hole slid to one side. Bolin held the dead man close enough to the view that the man on the other side of the door couldn't see anything else. There was no guarantee it would work, but the security on the operation was lax. Come in and get it. But you're going to have to drag your ass right back outside, no matter how cold and wet it is. Sure. Bolin shoved the corpse into the doorway to block any attempt the other man might make to close the entrance. The guy peered past the dead man and saw Bolin for the first time. The bullets had shot through the dead man's abdomen at an angle. The two holes in the other guard's chest spilled crimson. Bolin let the bodies slide to the concrete floor. He cleared the action of the pistol, making sure no flesh or material had gotten caught inside that would make the weapon jam later. He took the time to put two fresh cartridges into the magazine and locked the door, then went on. While on recon, unable actually to penetrate the building or get hard intel, he'd sketched the possible interior a number of ways until he was satisfied he'd covered most of them. The factory produced ceramic knickknacks, things that flooded souvenir shops around the world, but its main export was China White. Despite the influx of cocaine in the United States, heroin was still the international drug of choice. He'd automatically logged his entry time on his watch. Less than two minutes later, he had the overview of the building's interior in his mind and had located the fuse boxes. Once he'd gone beyond the short hallway leading from the rear access room, the building opened up into a large area that contained dozens of wooden racks of ceramic statues, cups, and other items in various stages of finishing. Two guards, more interested in chatting with each other than in maintaining effective security, circulated between the racks. Another hallway jogged more deeply into the guts of the building. Bolin let the Makarov guide him. The cutting room for the heroin was to the right. Almost 20 feet by 30, the room was used for storage, but kept few supplies on hand. The warrior figured the supervisors ordered new supplies daily and used most of them by the end of the business day. He peered through the rectangular window set into the door. On the other side, a dozen men and women worked diligently, diluting the opiate powder at three tables. They were a mixed bag of Orientals, Caucasians, and Blacks. Nine women and three men. Most of them showed considerable skill. All of them were stripped and worked naked to prevent theft. Four Asian men with machine pistols stood guard. Making sure he couldn't be seen, Bolin finished his inspection of the room. Two windows at the back had steel bars over them. The door from the hallway was the only entrance that allowed free movement. The warrior fell back, his mind already clicking with the new variables, turning a fresh stream of numbers on the blitz. Following the hallway in the opposite direction, he found the fuse boxes set against the wall in a room where boxed goods were stacked and ready to be shipped. Bills of lading were already in place. Besides the fuse boxes, an old-fashioned gasoline generator occupied a corner, set apart by a wire mesh cage. He smashed the lock on the cage with the butt of the AK-47. The inner mechanism shattered and the lock snapped open. A five-gallon jerry can rested against the wall. When he shook it, he found the container was half full. He uncapped it, took a ceramic mug from one of the boxes, and filled it with gasoline. He unsheathed his combat knife and cut slits in the protective pipes enclosing the electrical wiring that led to the fuse boxes. Using care, he poured the contents of the mug into the slits, then poured another mug full on the exterior of the pipes and the wall. He found a hand towel on one of the crates. He rolled it into a ball, then soaked one side of it with gasoline. Fisting the jerry can, he retreated to the doorway. He lit the towel, waited until he was certain of the flames, then flung it at the fuse boxes. Flames raced up the wall and consumed the wiring. On the move, Bolin raced back down the hallway to the cutting room. Less than ten feet from the cutting room door, the executioner tucked the jerry can against the wall, then donned the light amplifying goggles. The light died, and sparks spewed from the fuse boxes, creating a flurry of images against the metal door. Bolin drew the Makarov. Controlled shots beat the bursts the AK-47 would put out. Unseen for now, his enemies could use the muzzle flashes to track him down. The goggles turned the world into monochrome landscape, totally colorless, filled only with a series of gray tones that threatened in places to overlap. A man ran out of the cutting room with his machine pistol raised against his shoulder, obviously heading for the bigger room where the emergency lights were working. He paused in the doorway, pointing to the fire raging in the storage room. He never saw the executioner when he passed him. The two shots kicked the man sideways. 
the gunner stumbled against the doorframe, then slowly sank to the floor. Three armed men remained in the cutting room. Olin raced to the door, the 9mm pistol up and ready. One of the gunners rounded the corner, holding his machine pistol in front of him. He obviously didn't see Bolin, as Bolin had to step out of the way. He went on to the cutting room. One man must have caught sight of the warrior backlit by the fire in the storage room. The guy brought up his Uzi. The last man swung his weapon around in a blistering arc that swept three quarters of the room. The rounds had hit the man's heart less than an inch apart. Everybody, get out! He reached down and tipped over a table to let the people huddled underneath it know he was aware of them. Get out now! They rushed from the room, clawing at one another in their frenzy to escape. Working quickly, Volan kicked over the other two tables. Heroin spilled to the floor, creating a white powder mosaic of waiting death. Bola knew the drug could overcome him if he breathed the powder. He held his breath until he cleared the room. Whirling in the hallway, he grabbed the jerry can, opened the cap, then threw the container into the cutting room. It skidded across the floor on its side, coming to a stop against one of the overturned tables. The contents sloshed out and filled the air with the pungent aroma of gasoline. Sparks from Bolin's short burst ignited the vapor trapped inside the container. Gasoline sprayed over the walls and quickly caught fire, creating flaming waterfalls. The warrior went out the back way. He paused only long enough to scatter some of the Texas Ranger stars across the two corpses he'd left in the back room. No one tried to stop him. From where he stood in the phone booth, Bolin could see the glow from the fire that was starting to consume the factory. He'd counted two fire trucks before he'd quit the scene, and more had arrived since then. Between the electrical fire and the gasoline fire, he was certain nothing of the building or its contents would be saved. He drank from his first cup of coffee. A second sat steaming up the window near his elbow. The night's pace was wearing him down, but he knew it was having its effect on Tot as well. Yes. You just lost the heroin factory. So I've been told. Sounds like you've got a pretty good ear out on the street. I have people who look after my assets. Well, that's good business. Yes. I'm in the market for good business. How much did you just lose? I've not yet been told. From where I was standing, it looked like a lot. I'm sure it was. It's going to be a lot more. You're an idiot. Every time you strike at me, you're on the risk of dying. You're pursuing a fool's errand. Instead of one enemy, you now have two. How much longer do you think your luck will hold out? Bolin set aside his empty and reached for the second cup of coffee. As long as I wanted to. I've been in risk management a long time. I wonder how you'll talk when you're brought before me. Will you beg for your life? Or will you plead for a merciful death? There's something you should consider. How long do you think it'll be before I get bored with punching holes in your organization and come after you? Get me a name. Bolin broke the connection and left. Ah, yeah. That's good. Gaspar Cota lay back on the king-size waterbed and trailed his hands across the woman's naked flesh as she moved above him, smothering him with her heat. She straddled him, working hard for her money, her palms flat against his chest as she rose and fell with increasing force and momentum. Lifting his head, Kota glanced at the mirrored tiles covering the wall on the opposite side of the spacious bedroom. He studied the smooth lines of the young woman's body as she worked, ignoring the gray-haired man's seamed and wrinkled face peering out just below her shoulder. It was this damn business, with all the pressures and complications of the past few months, that was turning him into an old man. He was 43, and his father had kept a head of black hair until his early 60s. Ah, come on, bring it home now. I don't have time for you to be taking a breather out there. You damn sure aren't being paid for it. The woman's mouth flattened into a thin, hard line for a moment. Then the sugar-coated smile dropped back into place, and she renewed her vigorous movements. Kota closed his eyes and inhaled the odor of their mixed colognes and wet sex. The climax pulled at him, teetered for a moment, almost lost to the constant state of worry that plagued him these days. Then the orgasm struck like summer lightning. 
He lunged against the woman, shuddered, and wrapped his arms around her. He felt incredibly small. The woman held him, kissed his face, and lay down with him against the silk sheets of the waterbed. He clasped her to him, trying to ignore the pounding of his heart as it tried to punch through his chest. It was the drugs, he knew. He could no longer use the cocaine as carelessly as he'd done in his youth, and now he could no longer live without it. The woman moved slowly away from him, crawling to the side of the bed for the serving cart parked there. He watched her from behind heavy lids, remembering a time when his lust would already be building again as he gazed at her lean haunches. She poured him a glass of champagne from the ice-filled bucket, then turned her attention to the small mound of white powder resting on the oval mirror next to it. She used the single-edged razor blade with precision, laying out the lines of coke in minutes. Cody gathered the pillows behind his head and watched. He sipped the champagne, no longer gulping it back as he had when he first came into his wealth. The days of sleeping in a hut in the jungle and being satisfied with plump peasant girls were over. Or were they? He had all but forgotten those long-ago days. But now, with what had been transpiring around the globe in the past 12 hours, those memories were coming back even sharper. Last night, he'd even dreamed he was walking through a cemetery in a thunderstorm, his feet dragging through the mud until he stumbled at last upon the tombstone that had drawn him. His fingers traced the carved name, and he knew before the jagged streak of lightning showed him that it was his own. He grabbed a corner of the blue silk sheet and mopped the sweat from his face. The woman noticed him. Is anything wrong? No. Coda finished the glass of champagne and tossed it onto the carpeted floor. The draperies, the mahogany bedroom suite, the chrome and glass desk tucked neatly into the corner by a glass-enclosed bookshelf showcasing a number of rare books that he'd never looked at, all spoke of the wealth he'd accumulated. No one would ever take that from him. He wouldn't allow it. You look as though you've seen a ghost. There are no ghosts here. But there were. The ghosts of those he'd stepped on. The ghosts of the men who'd gone before him in building drug empires of their own. All stained his existence. It wasn't something that clung to any one room, or even this mansion. It was something that permeated the product that he sold every day. Many people, including his own countrymen, called cocaine the White Death. He was beginning to think the nickname might possibly hold a kernel of truth. But he wouldn't give in to it easily. He moved to the edge of the bed, swaddled in the expensive sheets, not wanting the woman to see him in his reduced state of arousal. She handed him one of the hundred-dollar bills tucked in the wine glass near the cocaine-covered oval mirror. He rolled it expertly and tucked one end into a nostril. The drug flushed into his system at once, filling his synapses with a deluge of pleasure. It erased the jittery paranoia that had been plaguing him most of the day. Only when he was finished did he hand the rolled bill to the woman. She licked her lips in anticipation, held her hair back, then bent over the mirror. <clears throat> Studying the lines of the woman's back, the gentle sway of her heavy breasts, Kota felt the desire flow slowly back into his body. The fear left him. He was a strong man, strong enough to hold on to everything he now had, and strong enough to take still more from anyone he wished to. The woman's eyes looked glassy when she turned to him. How much man are you, Gaspar? <laughs> Too much man for any one woman. Prove it. A finger slid into her mouth. She purposefully flicked it with her tongue until it glistened. Then she dipped it into the cocaine. Moving slowly, she daubed it onto her nipples. Then she reached for him, bringing him down to suckle her. He took her breast into his mouth and felt the cocaine stutter through him, numbing his gums and tongue. He closed his teeth, nipping her hard. <sighs> but she refused to let him go. Already he was erect again. He pushed her back as he turned his attentions to her other breast. She fitted herself to him and started gentle rocking motions that helped him thrust home. A chill crept down Kota's back, despite the cocaine and the tender flesh of the woman. When he glanced at the phone, he saw that it was his private line. The woman continued to move beneath him. Kota untangled himself from her and pushed her roughly away. He picked up the phone cautiously, as if it might bite him. Yes? Chief, there's a man on a first extension who wants to speak with you. Hector, I've already told you I'm speaking to no one today. Tell me you would speak to him. His name? He 
didn't say. And you'd let this nameless man speak to me after I've told you I want to be left alone? This man says he has something you want to know, something he refuses to tell anyone else. About what? Alonso. Kota felt the desire leak out of him like the air from a punctured balloon. He threw his legs over the side of the bed and tried to unclench his fist from the phone. This man says he knows who killed Alonso and destroyed the cocaine shipment today. It was American federal agents. This I already know. Everyone who lives on the streets knows that. He says he knows more. He says you're in danger as well. Have you traced the call? It could be one of the federal agents. Yes, I did. He's coming from the Cayman Islands. Kota considered the information. He had friends in the Caymans, people whose own financial interests would be hurt if his were hurt. And he couldn't ignore the direct threats against his life. International police agencies were extracting their pound of flesh from drug empires around the world. He'd assumed Alonso's death to be a response from the American DEA based in Colombia relating to the deaths of three of their agents during the night. But in light of today's developments, that might not be true. Cota hadn't ordered the deaths of the agents. It hadn't been necessary. His information was such that he knew who they were and had neutralized their threat to him months ago. But whoever had killed them had done so in territory recognized as Cota's. The DEA had apparently waited only hours before claiming vengeance against Alonso. I'll speak with this man. Cota cut the line, then stabbed the extension button with his finger. Hello. Cota looked at the blonde whore. Her eyes gazed with vague disinterest at his crotch as her fingers played with the gold chain around her neck. Her jugular beat frantically, showing the results of the drug slamming through her system. Kota wrapped the sheet around his loins. Ah, my friend Kota. The drug lord recognized the voice at once, but couldn't put a name to it. Memories stirred in the darkness of his mind, made more inaccessible by the cocaine. What do you want? From you, I want nothing. I'm taking everything that you have that interests me. You've taken nothing from me, motherfucker. Haven't I? What about your freedom? Do you feel safe leaving your house these days, amigo? If you think you're so much, then come to me, and we'll see who has the biggest balls. I'll show you sights seen by few other men. The other end of your own cock. <laughs> Unable to restrain his anger, Kota pushed up from the bed and paced the floor. The sheet dropped away from him, but he ignored it, as well as the woman's incurious gaze. There's a price on your head, bastard. You won't escape my wrath. Threats. You were always good at threats, Gaspar. But Luis Costanza was the better businessman. He built an empire that threatened nations last year, and today he's in the grave. He gathered people, shaped them into an organization that was formidable. You break them down, prey on them like a shark, and with no sense of the greater picture... He was by far a better man than you are, and in the end, he couldn't stand against the agency players either. Ah, you speak in riddles. On the contrary, I called only to say goodbye. You and your kind, you're like dinosaurs, and you're on the way to becoming extinct. If the narco warriors don't crush you, I will. You think you know me? You think you can call me in my own house and threaten my life? I've just done it. Fuck you, man! The DEA, the DAS, F2, the Justice Minister, none of those can touch me! You think you can call me from the Cayman Islands and get me to shit myself with your threats? I'll have the eyes from your head! Sleep tight, Gaspar. <laughs> we'll see who has the last laugh, amigo. When I'm pissing on your grave, I'll remind you. I know all about Maria Alfaro and her ties to the DEA. Maybe I'll send you her lying tongue for a souvenir. Kota slammed the receiver into the cradle, then punched the button for the home switchboard. Yes, Chief. No more phone calls. And round up Mando and Oalo. We're going hunting. Kota put the phone on the nightstand and glared at the prostitute. Get up. Your work here is done today. He reached into his wallet and threw a fistful of money at her. The woman grabbed for the bills as they settled over her naked body. Opening his walk-in closet, Kota chose a fresh gray sharkskin suit from the racks and dressed. Maria Alfaro still burned brightly in his inner directed anger. Never before had a woman made so much of a fool of him, and he had loved her. He could never forgive himself for that. He chased after her as if he were a lovesick boy, never thinking that she might betray him. He shut off the whirling thoughts. Behind him, the woman was sucking up another line of coke, never once considering her nakedness. Kota had always believed all women to be whores. His own mother had been one, 
and she'd become pregnant with him by their village priest. But it had taken Maria to show him the final truth of his beliefs. Taking the shoulder holster from the shelf, he buckled it on, then slid a Smith & Wesson Model 4506, 45 ACP into the soft leather. He pulled on the jacket and checked himself in the mirror. After he dusted the white powder film from his thick mustache, he thought he looked impeccable. Okay, we're in motion now. From the foliage covering the hill to the west, Calvin James surveyed Cota's villa through a pair of high-power field glasses. The setting sun drew ragged streaks of color across the white buildings, turning the crimson roof tiles to blood-red pools. Dressed in a jungle camouflage jacket and dark brown slacks, he knew he'd be hard to spot by the sentries guarding the mansion and outbuildings, especially with the sun to his back. A long white limousine rolled to a stop in front of the main building. A moment later, four armed guards escorted Kota to the car. James increased the magnification and inspected the vehicle as it sped toward the main gate. The way it sat on its tires let the ex-seal know it was heavily armored. He didn't doubt for a moment that the windows were bulletproofed. Well, they had that Calvin. James tracked the car onto the highway. Three dark sedans trailed in its wake, drawing clouds of red dust after them. He hit the transmitter as the limousine turned. South, into the city, I see a white limo and three blocker cars. I've got them, mate. James flicked the field glasses to sweep through the eastern side of the rugged terrain that framed the twisting highway to Bogota, three miles distant. But even though he looked carefully, he couldn't see the Briton. On the highway, a motorcycle pulled onto the concrete ribbon and eased into the pace set by the limo and the three sedans. James capped the field glasses and quietly faded back up the hill to the Kawasaki motocross dirt bike that was his transportation for the operation. Puts a crimp in our plans to light up Kota's home life this evening, doesn't it? Or it might have given us an even better opportunity to take the man down. Well, cats, do we sit tight or do we pursue? We follow, but at a distance. If Kota's trying to leave the country, I don't want to miss him. Being in motion like this ourselves puts us in a vulnerable position as well. It's a risk we'll have to take. We're operating with a number of unknown factors at present. With Kota out of the picture, there will be a vacuum in the power hierarchy here. Observing how it's filled could teach us something about what's going on here and in other countries. I've got more versatile transportation than the rest of you. I'll be second man up after McCarter. We'll switch off when I get there until we can set up a surveillance pattern with you guys. Agreed. James took his jacket off, reversed it to the dark leather side, and put it back on. He carried a Beretta 92F and a paddle holster at his back. Taking the Uzi machine pistol from the saddlebag strapped across the motorcycle, he slung it around his neck, concealing it with a tug of the jacket zipper. Then he pulled on a pair of protective gloves and strapped on his helmet, careful to leave the ear throat headset in place. The Kawasaki jounced and bucked as it followed the rough terrain leading to the highway. James turned south. Is there any sign of the Alfaro woman? Negative. If we intend to get her, we might have to raid Coda's fortress, after all. We stick with our primary mission. There's more at stake here than one life. James tried to keep the images that trickled into his head at bay. He remembered the woman's picture, tried hard not to think how she'd look with her face twisted in pain while Kota and his men tortured her if her cover had been blown. But it was just as bad thinking about what he'd be forced to do if they found her and she was dirty. He tucked the bleak thoughts away and concentrated on catching up to McCarter and changing places with him before one of Coda's men realized they were being tailed. Who's this? Kurtzman tapped the computer keyboard and brought the digitized picture to the forefront of his monitor. George Russell. The man had soft features, and his face was made rounder by the rimless glasses he wore. Weak, watery blue eyes stared forward without expression. A just-shaved sheen covered his jowls. And who is George Russell? Kurtzman looked up at the mission controller, amazed at how run down she was beginning to look. Dark bruises seemed about to surface under her bloodshot eyes, and her complexion was definitely paler than it had been that morning. He started to say something to her about getting some rest, but quickly checked himself. Price was a trooper and would stick it out until the bitter end. It was one of the things that made her valuable. And his remark, as she would definitely point out, was sexist thinking. Mentally, he shrugged and gave up. George Russell was a lawyer retained by Maripin and the Rastafarians when they set up shop in the United States. 
The picture of Russell evaporated and was replaced immediately by a street scene where the law offices of Russell and Associates figured prominently. They were on the lower level of the building, flanked by a barber shop and a Vietnamese restaurant. It doesn't seem like Russell's basking in the glow of economic prosperity. Ah, uh, it's just the cover. On the surface, Russell appears to be your average ambulance chaser. Twenty years ago, he was a young assistant DA who got caught making deals. Charges were brought forth, but nothing stuck. Some of the deals were pretty political and would bring heat down on a lot of people who should have known what was going on. Russell went into business for himself and made a meager living doing public defender work. He lost more cases than he won, but he made a lot of connections. The image on the monitor rainbowed and became another view. This one showed Russell in a courtroom, obviously objecting to something in front of the judge. Recognize the man beside Russell? No. Well, maybe this will help. The courtroom scene vanished and was replaced at once by a split screen showing an older man with dark curly hair and a deep tan in frontal and profile shots. The shirt collar was obviously from some penal institution. Still don't know him. Leo would. So would Stryker and Hal. Name's Gus Giancola. Any relation to Pepsi Giancola? Kurtzman's mind locked onto the name from the past, still felt the hurt that came attached to it. Evidently, Price had covered all the past Stony Man involvement since coming on board the team. Pepsi Giancola had figured into the death of April Rose. Mm, they were cousins. You said were. Gus Giancola's dead. Has been for more than a decade. So he had nothing to do with that other business? No. Another picture took form, this one showing Gus Giancola with Liborio Parella in a small Italian restaurant seated across the table from each other. Gus Giancola was one of Perella's thugs? Yeah. Surprised me, too, when I was flipping through the file Hunt Weathers assembled on Russell. What put you on to Russell? Not Giancola or Perella. Russell's been mining some of the drug action in L.A. for years. Nothing that would completely dirty his hands, though. He siphons off the money. Right. A succession of business profit and loss statements filled the wall screens at the other end of the room. He's been a busy guy, and he's good at what he does. Most of these businesses are legitimate to a degree, but none of them actually make the money he reports to the IRS every year. So Russell's laundering drug profits through these businesses? Yeah. Rico has files on most of them, but they haven't proved anything that will stand up in court yet. I know. I glanced at their files earlier. They've done some in-depth studies. However, I have an added edge because my systems aren't under the same scrutiny their systems are. I trace the money back to the Cayman Islands and to Switzerland. And? Our boy Russell has been cutting himself a bigger piece of the pie lately. He's double-crossing the people he's been representing? And bleeding them dry. The monitor froze on several pages of documentation from a car import agency based in Glendale, California. This is one of the businesses set up as a front for the Rastafarians. Notice the profit potential for the past three years. The profit showed a healthy six figures, depicting a slight gain for each successive year. Now... Eight months into this year, here are the comparative figures. Kurtzman filled the screen with two financial statements laid side by side. Windows opened up on each document. Last year's profit margin showed a little over 80,000. According to the figures generated from this year's estimate, the car import business was already 110,000 in the red. Evidently, Maripin didn't check up on Russell often enough. Now, this is just one business. I haven't been able to find out all that Russell's handling, but I found about 20 other businesses that he's laundering drug profits through. The rough figure that I'm able to come up with is at least $5 million that he's managed to spirit away. And that's only counting the money that shows up on the company books. Right. Kurtzman shifted in the wheelchair, trying to relieve the ache sinking into its accustomed position between his shoulder blades. This is one for the bean counters at Rico. It'll be a long time before the dust settles on exactly what Russell has done and to whom he's done it. When did most of the action start taking place? Oh, six, seven months ago. Of course, you can bet he was planning on it a long time before that. So what precipitated Russell's change of heart? I haven't the vaguest clue. I can define actions that have taken place, catalog thousands of them, mix them any way you want in seconds. But motivation is something the programming doesn't know a damn thing about. I was thinking more along the lines of what Russell is doing with all this extra money. Well, from what I've seen, he still lives at the same address, and his bank accounts are hitting about the same marks as last year. 
Three months ago, he bought a new car, but reviewing his past years, it's the same time he buys a new one every year. He could be tucking it away in hidden accounts. Uh, he'd better be. Once the people he's been doing business with find out what he's done to him, he's going to need all the running room he can get. Something like this seems out of character for the guy you describe. Yeah. So if he's changed, I think it's safe to assume that the reason for him to change didn't come from within, but something from without. Meaning someone's got him by the short hairs. I'd think so. We need to find out who. Hal said it would come down to this. He's logged a lot of years working through stuff like this, long before they had anything like the computers we have access to. I guess we take him for granted, but Hal, he still remembers what a hunch feels like. What about Russell's connection to Perella? I haven't found anything incriminating yet, but the phone company records show that they maintain a relationship. Keep looking. I've got a gut feeling about that myself. In the meantime, notify Charlie Mott and his crew that Leo could be heading for rougher waters than we'd assumed. Okay. Another thing. Yeah. Did Maripin get his one phone call? Kurtzman saved the current file and reopened the one he had on the Rastafarians. He scanned the data quickly. Yeah. And who did he call? George Russell, his lawyer. Then he turned up dead a short time later. That's too damn convenient for me to believe. Put Able Team on Russell without letting the Sheriff's Department know. Maybe they can sweat some information out of him. The man sounds as if he might be ripe for it. I'm on it. Time to reload. Stony Man is continued on the next CD. David McCarter stopped at a darkened street corner. Night had dropped over Bogota like an ebony curtain. Traffic was sparse. Most of the citizens had bedded down early, afraid of being caught in the nocturnal activities of the cocaine cockroaches that scurried out at night to prey on the innocent. He took a folded map and pen flash from inside his bomber jacket, switched the light on and played it over the map, trying to fathom where Kota and his entourage might be headed. They definitely weren't making for the airport, which made for some relief and some increased anxiety at the same time. With the airport out of the picture, the team wouldn't have to be concerned about taking the drug lord down in the next few minutes. But it conjured up some wonderment about where Kota was going and what he was going to do once he got there. The guy was definitely acting like a man on a mission. Calvin? David? Yo. Yeah, mate. I think it's time the two of you peeled back and let Raphael and me take over the tailing. With the onset of night, those motorcycles are going to stand out. You two will take up wind formations. Calvin will be on the left, David on the right. We'll keep your positions keyed into the program. Calvin, I have the target now. I'm backing out, Raphael. He's all yours. The Briton could tell from following along with the map that the Israeli was attempting to anticipate Kota's moves. The Kawasaki's would allow the team rapid hit-and-get capacities to cover an attack or a tactical retreat if necessary, but only if they were in position. If Kota and his men saw them coming, it would turn the hit-and-get strikes into kamikaze rushes. The Spaz 15 was folded and tucked along the frame of the dirt bike, covered by black leather. It wouldn't fool anyone on close inspection, but the color blended the combat shotgun into the machinery. McCarter wore his Browning high power under his bomber jacket in a shoulder rig. Other munitions were strung out along his combat harness. He followed the tunnel of illumination his headlight carved into the shadowed street. Fourteen minutes passed as the caravan crept through the night. Cats switched off with Enciso, and they brought Manning farther into the net. Definitely headed downtown. Headlights flared to life in McCarter's rearview mirrors and closed rapidly. He leaned the bike to the outside, letting it wheel him to the outer limits of the road. A long black Lincoln Continental shot by him, followed by another. Both vehicles carried at least a half dozen men. I just picked up a couple of bogies. Two black Lincoln town cars, local plates, carrying wrecking crews or a group of gents late for the local bingo action. Brake lights glared in the distance, then the cars broke left without warning, disappearing around the corner behind a hardware store. The game's afoot, mates. Those blokes just broke back into our field of operations. I see them, and I got two more coming from the opposite side. Follow them, David, but discreetly. It appears that we aren't the only ones tonight who are interested in Kota's movements. Something to consider. Since we didn't get a whisper of these guys earlier while we were watching Kota, they must have known in advance where he was going. True. Provided these people aren't connected with the Colombian law enforcement agencies, it would be better to take them out of the action as soon as possible. On my way. McCarter twisted the accelerator, then reached forward and unplugged the headlight. The dark night closed over the rough street in front of him. 
He reached for the Spas 15, pulled it free, then slid it through the loose leather thong in the center of the handlebars, which would help stabilize the shotgun if he had to use it from the bike. At the next intersection, Manning cut the wheels of the ten-wheeler they'd liberated to use as a heavy vehicle for the operation against Coda. As soon as the truck fell into line, the big Canadian cut the lights. McCarter slipped a gloved hand more tightly around the folded stock of his combat shotgun. It was loaded with double-odd pellets and choked out to give him a full spread. Accuracy wouldn't be a problem. The distance dropped to 30 feet. Then two of the shadows at the rear window of the vehicle moved. Hairs rose on McCarter's neck and instant before the window sprouted gun muzzles. You're made. Clear the way. Bollocks. McCarter brought the Kawasaki around. His booted foot touched the concrete, slipped, then helped him reverse directions. McCarter shot for the curb, driving across the curving. He surprised himself by keeping it upright. <laughs> Shite! McCarter halted at the corner of the building and saw Manning bearing down on the town car. The ten-wheeler took up the center of the street, effectively blocking the sedan's passage. Cats! Cool. We're gonna be delayed, mate, so don't count on us for anything quick. Understood, David. Give me a 20 when you figure out where code is making for. McCarter cleared the channel. He needed to back Manning's play, and he had damn little time to figure out exactly how. Son of a bitch! Manning planned on pulling McCarter from the fire, not ending up as the sacrificial lamb himself. He reached for the squad automatic weapon lying on the opposite floorboard and made sure the 100-round box was flush with the rifle's feeding system. A Beretta 9mm pistol rode in shoulder leather under his left arm. The metal box containing his combustibles sat on the passenger seat. A fresh wave of hostile fire chewed into the front of the truck and eroded the top of the cab without coming in at him. The angle was all wrong for the shooters. The driver of the Lincoln was backing up the vehicle in a desperate attempt to get clear of Manning's path. Before the driver could reverse directions, Manning was on top of him. Manning came up from his defensive crouch, trying to manhandle the steering wheel as it bucked in his hands. His truck rolled over the stalled vehicle. The truck came down hard, weaving for just a moment while Manning fought with the wheel. He reached for the shift, geared down and built up speed again. A glance in the rearview mirrors revealed the smashed town car. Two figures were struggling out, pulling at a third. Muzzle flashes sparked in his wake, but Manning knew the bullets would never penetrate the load to reach the cab. The knowledge didn't keep his shoulder blades from tightening expectantly. The second town car slowed. The brake lights flared three times as the driver moved to block Manning's progress. Whomever they ultimately proved to be, the big Canadian realized they were playing for keeps. The driver matched his speed, remaining 30 yards in the lead. Gunfire erupted from the rear windows and the front passenger side of the car. Manning jerked up the saw and mashed his foot on the accelerator. The gunners ducked, and the driver accelerated away before the tires could be hit. Son of a bitch! A radiator hose blew under the hood. Hot steam swept back into the open cab and bathed him in perspiration. In moments, the engine would overheat and render him as helpless as a sitting duck. When he glanced in the rearview mirror to examine his options, he saw another Lincoln closing in on him, sweeping around the wreckage of the last one. Evidently, the mystery teams were using a radio network of their own. You seem to be in a bit of a pickle, mate. Yeah, I was just about to ask for suggestions. See the side street coming up on your left? Boot shop on the corner? Manning looked and saw the darkened mouth of the street sandwiched between two multi-story buildings. A sign held a large cowboy boot with a silver spur. Yeah? Take it. Ugh. Pulling hard, Manning steered the ten-wheeler onto the street. The heavy load kept the tires from slipping, but didn't prevent the inside tires from coming up from the pavement for one heart-stopping moment. Carter just made his destination. He's pulled into the underground parking garage of the Hotel Galeno. Manning remembered it from the mapping sessions. The hotel was only a few blocks away in the opposite direction. Copy. We'll be there as soon as we can shake the competition. Manning glanced in the rearview mirror. The town car that had circled around behind him was hot on his tail. Even as he saw it, he caught sight of the second car, the one he'd been following, swinging into position as well. The thick, burning vapor of the escaping radiator steam scalded his throat. <laughs> David, I got two. Count them, two bogeys on my tail. <laughs> and we're coming in hard. Whatever you've got in mind, it's gonna have to come damn quick. <laughs> the truck's engine seized, lost power for a moment, then struggled valiantly to regain it as Manning put his foot down hard on the pedal. Steam continued to pour from the whole radiator, thick enough now to obscure the Canadian's vision of the darkened street. Keep coming straight! Manning held to the center of the thoroughfare. An oncoming car went over the curb, ran over the awning supports in front of an outdoor restaurant, and brought the striped material down. You still got that little nasty rigged? Glancing down, Manning scooped the radio-controlled detonator from his combat vest. Yeah, <laughs> but we were planning to use this as a backup just to buy us some time if things got tight. 
We definitely hadn't considered using it from a moving vehicle. Necessity is a matter of invention, mate, and risk is a bastard child. You take out the first car and I'll help you with the second. Manning surveyed the rear action through the mirrors. The first car was almost at his bumper, jockeying for position as they raced down the street. The second vehicle was three car lengths back, waiting for a target of opportunity. He armed the detonator, then was occupied for an instant in blocking the first car's attempt to come up alongside. When it floated back behind him, less than six yards away, he pressed the detonator button. The first charge of C4 sheared the rear axle pins holding the dump bed to the truck. The others had gone off a heartbeat later and were heavier, designed to use the ground surface beneath to accumulate the necessary force. Propelled by the carefully positioned explosives, the dump bed came up off the ten-wheeler without being blown apart and came down hard on the lead pursuit car. The car was instantly buried under the debris. Hell yeah! Couldn't have worked any better! Nice piece of work, chum, but you had two of those rascals nipping at your heels. Before his teammates' words ended, Manning saw the second car. The rear section sagged suddenly, letting Manning know at least one of the tires had been holed. Keeping his head low, the Canadian weaved the truck from side to side in an effort to prevent the town car from coming up beside him. Come on, David. McCarter aimed the Kawasaki at the pile of sand and rock that had buried the pursuit vehicle. <laughs> Glancing ahead, McCarter saw the other Lincoln closing the gap on the ten-wheeler. Sparks flared from the cab and the rear axle and wheels. He moved the Spas 15 around on its sling until it pressed across his chest with the muzzle pointing to his right. Look alive, mate. I'm burning up your back trail. Wasn't exactly feeling lonely. Yeah, well, we got one shot at this, and all the element of surprise is out the window. Terrific. Feeling pessimistic? McCarter studied the back windshield of the Lincoln. The Kawasaki's headlight was still extinguished, and he doubted they could hear the double stroke of the snarling engine through the sound of gunfire trapped inside the vehicle. Getting shot at from any distance does that to me. Let's put the shoe on the other foot then, mate. McCarter closed the distance, readied the motorcycle for quick acceleration, and chose his spot. He could tell Manning's ten-wheeler was dying even as they spoke. A warehouse on the left loomed in the distance. It looked durable, made of stone and steel, exactly what McCarter had been searching for. Let him come up alongside and be ready to move. Roger. Manning allowed the truck to slide from center position on the street. The Lincoln driver didn't hesitate. He rushed up on the left side. Gearing up, McCarter leaned over the Kawasaki's handlebars, then fisted the pistol grip of the combat shotgun. The fire selector was already set on full auto. The magazine held ten rounds of double-aught buckshot. The Lincoln's acceleration was no match for the 125cc engine. Even as the driver was drawing abreast of the truck, McCarter slid up beside the town car like a wraith. His combat senses took over, allowing his professional self to scan the situation. He saw a black reflection of himself and the bike in the Lincoln's polished finish. Then one of the men in the back seat pointed at him. McCarter's spaz was already in position. He reserved the last two or three rounds for the left front tire. At least two men inside the Lincoln grabbed for the wheel above the driver's corpse. The vehicle lunged to the left, veering at McCarter. McCarter slammed on the brake and let the car sweep to where he used to be. He dropped back and watched the sedan struggle to remain moving. Manning! Go! Nail the bleeding bastard and let's finish it! Manning smashed his vehicle into the town car. As the Lincoln shuddered, the big Canadian drew back for another attempt. McCarter noticed they were quickly running out of factory wall. He smashed it again. The Lincoln's front end caught on the factory wall and held. The rear section swung around in an arc that carried the ten-wheeler before it. Truck and car came to a sudden stop only a few feet from the factory. McCarter dropped his foot and brought the Kawasaki up. He sped and came onto the scene just as Manning was leaping clear of the truck with the saw in his arms. That was your plan? It worked, didn't it? Manning ran up the steps to cover the Lincoln from a higher vantage point. Cradling the combat shotgun in his arms, McCarter approached the steaming wreckage of the attack car with caution. Two bodies had been thrown through the windshield and were spread-eagled across the hood. One of them was the driver. A man on the passenger side struggled weakly to claw the door open. It gave reluctantly and allowed the man to fall onto the sidewalk. Stay down! Keep your hands where I can see them! The man remained silent, just stretched his arms and rested his blood-streaked face on a bicep. One of the men in the back seat was dead, the other was unconscious. With Manning providing cover, McCarter reached in and dragged the man clear of the wreck. The unmistakable sweet odor of gasoline had started to pervade the area. Despite their attempt on his and Manning's lives, McCarter didn't like the thought of any man perishing in flames. McCarter placed the second man in the street. Can you walk? Yeah. Then get the bloody hell away from that car before it explodes. Slowly. <clears throat> 
The man got up with effort, keeping his hands extended above his shoulders. On your knees! Hands behind your head! The man slumped to his knees as if exhausted. McCarter skinned the pistol from the unconscious man's shoulder holster, then did the same for his other prisoner. He threw both weapons into the shadows that hugged the factory wall. Both men looked to be professionals in the field of violence and mayhem. Manning was rummaging inside the truck. Don't have time for a full 20 questions, so suppose we skip the animal, mineral, and vegetable part and cut directly to the chase. I don't have anything to tell you. As I said, we don't have time for the niceties. So far, you appear to have weathered your experiences in fair health. But if you refuse to answer me, or I get the least little feeling that you're having me on, I'm gonna kneecap you and leave you limping the rest of your life. We understand each other? Yeah. What were you lads about tonight? We were ordered to take out Coda. Manning came to a halt behind McCarter. The Phoenix Commandos exchanged a quick look, and the Briton couldn't help wondering if a DEA operation and their own had overlapped in the confusion of the past few hours. The hit teams had responded like machined parts, obviously used to working together. Who gave you those orders? The man hesitated. McCarter took one threatening step forward. We were hired by a guy named Webb August, and promised a cut of some bigger money if things worked out. If the men had been hired, they weren't American agents. What things? There's a guy who's planning on taking over the Medellin cartel action. He's uniting the members. Coda, Tiarina, Gutierrez, and a couple of others have been the only holdouts. August figured if we put Coda down and maybe the others, there wouldn't be any more problems. A sickening twinge twisted McCarter's stomach. Who killed the DEA agents? Guys August hired. Not Coda? No. Not Coda. McCarter put his anger away before it could interfere with his thinking. Coda was set up to be the fall guy for the hits? Yeah. Most federal agencies wanted to believe Coda was responsible anyway. But Coda was the target? If you people didn't get him, we were supposed to. We gotta move. The police will be here soon. Against the backdrop of the night, Manning could already see the signature light of a helicopter that would be carrying a police tactical unit toward the area. How did your teams know where Coda was going to be tonight? We had him staked out for hours before he left his estate, and we saw none of your people. August figured it would be easier to take Coda if he came to us. We had an agent inside Coda's organization. Oh, Maria Alfaro. For a while she was his lover and got to know a lot about his business before taking over the administration of a large chunk of it. Today, someone let Coda know she was double-crossing him. The man's mentality was a cinch he'd go after her. One last question. Where do I find Webb August? French Guiana. In Cayenne, somewhere. I don't have an address. McCarter nodded, trying not to think how the rest of Phoenix Force were already caught up in the vicious crossfire engineered by Maria Alfaro. Rafael Enciso parked across the street from the Hotel Galeno and killed the Chevy's engine as he readied his gear. The hotel was dimly lit, barely standing out in the dark neighborhood. The entrance to the underground parking garage was a yawning black pit. Two of Cota's hard men ran interference for anyone who might try to pull inside. They carried their Uzis blatantly. Calvin, I've already got the back door. Give me four minutes. Enciso glanced up at the rooftop eight stories away. James was going to be running on empty by the time he made the top. Raphael. On my way. The Cuban shrugged into a stylish topcoat that made his jeans seem more affected than casual. Using a handkerchief from the glove compartment, he forged an ascot that he was sure would pass cursory inspection. Soft probe only. If you can ascertain Alfaro's whereabouts, fine. Don't put yourself at unnecessary risk. Cota is our target here. See, si. I'll be 10 10 until something breaks. And Cizo doffed the headset, dropping it into one coat pocket with the walkie talkie handset. He screwed a silencer onto his 9mm Beretta pistol, shoved it into the opposite coat pocket, then snugged his backup piece into shoulder leather. The heavier hardware would have to be left in the car. He opened the door, got out, and pulled on a pair of skin-tight black leather gloves. As he approached the hotel, Calvin James's four minutes fell through his mind second by second. The foyer was filled with dusty glass and chrome, red leather booths and chairs. The elevator cages were to the right against the opposite wall. To the left, past an atrium filled with artificial flowers and sprawling ivy, was the registration desk. It was manned by a young night clerk in a brown uniform blouse who tried to ignore the two men stationed nearby. Enciso had his right hand inside his coat pocket. 
He cringed slightly as he approached the registry desk, almost as if he were intimidated by Coda's men. Both of the hard cases regarded him mutely, obviously feeling in control of the situation. Neither had weapons visible, but the Phoenix Force commando recognized the lumps of shoulder holsters the cut of their suits couldn't quite disguise. Good evening. Uh, can I help you? The glance the desk man gave to the nearer guard clearly indicated he was trying his best to do everything correctly. And Cizo felt sorry for the guy, and felt bad about having to play him in the middle of things. I need a room. He came to a halt in front of the counter. One of Coda's men was to his left, watching the street through the window, while the other stood in the center of the foyer beside the atrium. I'm sorry, sir. We don't have any vacancies tonight. I understand, but this was a reservation. The clerk glanced back at the man standing near the window, then started to walk to the computer only a few steps away. The guard shook his head. I'm sorry for the inconvenience, sir, but I see no reservations for tonight, and I let the last room out uh, an hour ago. Tourist season? I've never known this hotel to be filled up, and my reservations have always been honored. Let me speak to the manager. The guard stepped away from the window and invaded Enzizo's personal space in an obvious attempt to be intimidating. Hey, pal! He told you there weren't any more rooms. You don't want to make things difficult for yourself, understand? Sure. I don't want any problems here. Enzizo turned toward the man, reached out and seized the guy's jacket. With his other hand, Enzizo pulled out his silenced pistol. Ah! Pulling the dead man toward him, Enzizo let the man slack weight, help spin him around to face the remaining guard. He brought the silenced Beretta up in a sideways sweep and fired on the point. Where are the others? Sixth floor. God, please don't shoot me. What room number? I don't know. Alfaro. Is there a listing for Maria Alfaro in the computer? Come on, man, move! And Cizo pulled the walkie-talkie from the code and keyed it to life. He glanced at the elevators. Two were stationary. The one on the right climbed from the fifth floor and halted at the sixth. The clerk made two attempts to access the information from his computer terminal and botched both. And Cizo keyed the walkie-talkie. Galvin. Go. Sixth floor. And you've already got company. Roger. And Cizo watched the clerk bring the file up on screen, then start a search for the Alfaro name. Cats, do you copy? Affirmative, Raphael. There's no Alfaro registered. Cross-reference it! I am! Raphael. Go! We've got company. The players McCarter and Manning turned up. The very same. I've got it! Room 629. The reservation was made for a Carlisle Johnson by someone named Alfaro. Who is he? He doesn't say. Only that he is en route from Chicago, Illinois, to the United States. Did he check in? Yes. At three o'clock this afternoon. Raphael. I hear you, Cat. And Cizo waved the pistol at the clerk. Get the hell out of here. Use the back way. Call the police and keep your head down. The clerk nodded and sprinted away. Cat. I'm on the move. Calvin's already inside the building. I'm gonna try to link up with him on the upper floors and fade out the way we've discussed. Affirmative. There's definitely no way back out onto street level. And Cizo paused long enough to check the dead men. The corpse lying in the atrium yielded a Mac-10 in 45 ACP and three extra clips. A hard sprint put the warrior inside one of the elevator cages in record time. Someone heaved a smoke canister which spewed a noxious black cloud over the foyer. <coughs> Remembering the computer and the information logged onto the screen, and Cizo took careful aim at the monitor on the desk. I hope James is okay. <coughs> Calvin James cradled his CAR-15, raised a booted foot, and kicked the window out of a sixth-floor room. It was dark inside, had the musty smell of being closed up, and was silent. Satisfied that he'd chosen an unoccupied room, he used the barrel of the assault rifle to clear the broken glass from the window frame, then clambered inside. He paused at the door, twisted the handle, and eased it back. Bronze numbers gleamed on the door face. 623. Mental calculation figured him to be three doors down from the man Alfaro was meeting. The direction was still a mystery. Three men flanked Kota as the drug lord strode down the corridor from the elevators. James briefly debated going for broke and taking Kota out, but his chances for escape afterward were decidedly slim. Phoenix Force had already spread out before the arrival of the unknown shock troops. Every man counted when they all worked together. That was one thing that cats had drilled into their heads. They survived as a team, or they died as a team. Where's the woman? Room 629, boss. Any man? He's American? Johnson? There as well, and we're under attack. The police? No. Our people don't know us yet who they are. But they've managed to kill the men we had assigned to the parking garage. And they've infiltrated the lower levels of the hotel. Assassins. Purchased by the goddamn Americans. 
James had the CAR-15 raised and ready to fire if necessary. He kept the door marginally open and watched. Two doors down to the Phoenix Force Commando's right, Coda and his entourage came to a halt. One of the men stepped forward and kicked the door open. No one is here, boss. Check the bathroom and closet. Damn it, they can't have simply vanished. The three men hurried into the room. Moving silently, James closed the door and hustled back to the window. If Alfaro and Johnson weren't in the room, and no one had seen them leave by the elevator, that left only one place for them to go. He climbed out onto the fire escape again, but saw nothing except blackness on the side of the building and the dark alley six floors below. When he glanced up, he saw a man's leg disappearing over the rooftop. Hey, this window is open. Then get out there and find that woman, now! A man scrambled through the window, eyes flickering across the straggling length of the iron fire escape. He saw James and started to turn and raise his pistol. Damn it! James had ducked back into cover. He tugged a smoke canister from his combat vest, pulled the pin, counted down, and heaved it in front of the window. In the open, it would last only a few seconds, but he planned to make full use of those seconds. The rest of the team had Coda's escape route to the ground cut off. If Coda wanted the Alfaro woman badly enough, James figured to make use of that to draw the man out into the open. Katz's original plan had gone awry from the get-go. The landing leading to the seventh story was behind him. The ladder was completely vertical, narrow, the rungs made of thin metal spokes that seemed on the verge of bending as he put his weight on them. Gunfire tore into the black smoke cloud hovering in front of the window. Several more bullets struck the corpse, which finally fell over. At the eighth floor, James reached for the rooftop and began pulling himself up. Below him, the hotel's lights were suddenly extinguished. They've cut the power to the building. Calvin, Raphael, are you all right? Yeah. James pulled himself over the roof's parapet, then rolled into a prone position while he scouted the terrain. Yes, however, for the moment, I'm trapped in the elevator. Can you get free? A matter of moments. Where are you? The fourth, maybe the fifth floor? James pushed himself into a crouch. Dark clouds scudded over the pale yellow profile of the moon. Lion, bitch! Get me out of here to get my ass killed! No! You're making a mistake. The only mistake I'd made was in listening to you in the first place. You wasn't such a good-looking bitch, and the money hadn't sounded so right, you'd already be dead and your mom would be whining over your grave. It's no trick. The offer is there, and the money is everything I said it would be. Your words be falling on deaf ears, babe. You ain't nothing but DEA lunch meat to me now. You better hope your friend Coda be in a negotiating mood if he catches us. Calvin? Rooftop. James exchanged the CAR-15 for his pistol, then slung the assault rifle over his shoulder. He darted a quick glance over the side of the building and saw Coda and his two surviving bodyguards coming up the fire escape. Coda? On my ass. Don't lose him. Don't worry. James worked his way around the air conditioning and HVAC units as quickly as he dared, zeroing in on the voices. He kept the moon in front of him, using it to skyline the rooftop. Coda won't stop to negotiate with you. He'll kill us both as soon as he sees us. You gotta try harder than that, babe. I had you checked out. You've been Coda's main squeeze for months, and you've been pulling the wool over his eyes that whole time. You honestly think he's gonna kill me for checking out the action down here? And sacrifice all the personal time he could have with the bitch that's betrayed him? <laughs> I don't think so. Coda, he's gonna want you all to himself. You're crazy. Crazy like a fox, baby. Coda will never deal with you. You're not in his league. <laughs> we'll have to wait and see now, won't we? Pistol leading him, James rounded a final corner and found the woman struggling with her captor. Maria Alfaro was a head shorter than the black man holding her. She wore dark slacks and dress boots, and drops of blood from small scratches on her face dotted her white blouse. A necklace glinted at her throat, only inches below the hard gleam of the switchblade pressed against her jawline. Johnson was a skinny piece of work, dressed in a light-colored suit that made him stand out on the rooftop. Gold rings adorned most of his fingers, and a bracelet and watch encircled his wrists, diminishing the flash of his cufflinks. A pencil-thin mustache lined his upper lip, flowing into the short-cropped beard staining his chin and cheeks. James eased back the Beretta's hammer. The noise attracted Alfaro's and Johnson's attention. The man raised the knife to the woman's throat. Let her go. James stepped away from the air conditioning unit he'd crept up to. Let her go and you walk. Alfaro turned her head desperately away from the knife blade. Her flesh peeked over its edge, and fresh drops of blood ran down her throat. Man, you take me for a fool. James kept the threat of the Beretta's muzzle steady and silent. Not if you want to live. I release her, you shoot me. No dice. You don't release her, I shoot you anyway. Huh, that sounds like a bluff to me. Play it out if you want, but you're putting all of your chips in the pot to stick if that's what you decide to do. Man, you want this bitch. 
You know that. I know that. Who you think you fooling? You need me alive to keep her alive. James shifted the Beretta slightly. Wrong. Ah, oh, ah, ah. Johnson's elbow shattered and he spun around. He quickly caught himself and made a grab for the switchblade. Instead of running when she was able, Alfaro stepped in closer to the man, reaching for him protectively. For a moment, James was puzzled, but Johnson didn't hesitate once he had the knife in his uninjured hand. He lunged and drove the point toward Alfaro's midsection. James reacted immediately. Calvin! Go. Have a care up there, mate. Have you found Alfaro? Yeah, she's here with me now. Well, watch your bloody ass. She might not be DEA anymore. Chances are she's doubled herself in this operation and cut herself a piece of the pie. Alfaro turned and leveled her arm straight out before her. The stubby barrel of an Infratech Protect 25 poked out from her fist. Don't move. James froze. The woman had him cold. Coda and his bodyguards would be here soon. Hal Brignola stared out the Huey's window. He couldn't help thinking how lucky he was to be alive. After the hit on Ross Melton, the president had insisted that the Big Fed accept a small contingent of Secret Service agents as bodyguards until Stony Man could get a handle on what was going down. Brignola gave in gracelessly, but was grateful for the man's foresight. The assassination attempt came in the parking garage of the Justice Building with four men in combat black sniping at Brignola and his guards from behind a row of cars. At the end of the battle, the four attackers were dead, as were two federal agents. The Big Fed didn't know what was going on, but he was determined to find out. A second later, the helicopter touched down and Brignola disembarked. Hey, Hal! Brignola looked up and saw Jack Grimaldi's face suddenly appear out of the darkness when the pilot switched on a flashlight under his chin. Grimaldi sat behind the wheel of a canopy jeep. Taking a cigar from his pocket, Brignola swung into the passenger seat. The main house rose out of the shadowed landscape, followed by the two outbuildings and the tractor barn. Standing three stories tall, with a fourth story underground, the main house had a plain exterior that advertised none of the armor plating underneath. And the satellite dishes hooking up Kurtzman's computer room to the world were carefully hidden in the forests. Grimaldi hit the coded door opener mounted on the Jeep's dash, and the left garage door swung up easily in spite of the extra weight it carried. Brignola led the way out of the garage and into the kitchen, paused long enough to take a box of raisins from the pantry, then moved on through the dining room to Kurtzman's office. Grimaldi was behind him, opening a can of smoked almonds. The steel door was ajar, so both men could enter without keying in an access code. Kurtzman was at his desk, and Price was standing at his side. Both of them were studying scenes being relayed on the monitor between them. Brignola poured himself a cup of coffee and offered some to Grimaldi, who shook his head vehemently and took a canned soft drink from the ice tray. Anything? Maybe. We'll know in just a moment. Miss Dinner? Among other things. Well, don't get too involved with the raisins. Dinner's in ten minutes. I don't want you giving out on me for lack of nutrition when I need you most. Yes, ma'am. <laughs> now there's a commanding officer I can respect. What are you working on? We're profiling the guys who tried to whack you. And? And I don't think either of us is going to be too happy about the results. I got him. As each sheet came out, Kurtzman glanced at it, then passed it on to Price. Brignola got them next. He recognized the official seal at once and knew the documents had come from CIA headquarters in Langley, Virginia. There were two of them. The Big Fed couldn't remember any of the faces from the firefight. He held them up when he was finished scanning them. We got their fingerprints? One of Kissinger's people did. So, two guys out of the team were ex-CIA? Right. Price passed across more data sheets. We got these, too. Brignola took them and saw that one was from Interpol, and another had been requisitioned from an intelligence network that had once been affiliated with Germany's GSG-9 anti-terrorist groups. Brignola put the papers on the desk. Certainly is a mixed bag. I'm sure whoever put them on to you assembled them that way, so that if they were put down or somehow captured, it would be more confusing than anything. At this point, we don't know where the hell to look for the answers. And you can feel the time slipping away from us. For right now, we're still in the ball game. Where do you plan to look first? At home. Brignola glanced at the wall screens and saw television news stories and newspaper hard copy being rifled through at amazing speeds. Why at home? Basically a hunch. For the string of hits that took down so many of the drug enforcement agents around the world, someone would have to have access to a hell of a lot of information. I don't know of any country that processes more international facts, figures, and gossip concerning the drug trade than we do. 
The Russians have an enormous amount of intelligence, too. Not on drug agencies and suppliers. They've only recently started dealing with those kinds of crimes. So you're looking at the situation from the point of how these people would get the tools to pull off what they've been doing. Flip it over, and you may have the motive as well. Besides being the most capable disseminator of information regarding international drug trafficking, the United States is also the largest marketplace for them. Meaning we're looking for people who know their way around U.S. intelligence circles. As well as somebody who knows the inner working of the drug organizations. Yeah. Once a can of worms like this is opened, there's no telling what will turn up. Covert agencies in this country and operating abroad have a long history of using drug kingpins for their own purposes. Nobody says they've stopped doing that either. Exactly. Brignola looked down at the collection of faces spread before them, knowing that only a few of the questions they had had been answered. Unless something broke damn quick, it was going to be a matter of waiting for the other shoe to drop. And when it did, he was sure it would be heard internationally. Maria Alfaro remained professional as she held the pistol on Calvin James. The barrel of the Intratec Protect 25, chambered for 45 ACP, looked like a cavern to the Phoenix Force Commando. The woman's hand shook and her eyes were bloodshot. James could tell at once that her deep cover assignment had included using drugs. She'd become one of the casualties she'd signed on to stop. It made sense that Kota wouldn't have let her into his inner circle without knowing she was hooked as badly as any of his other people. Calvin. Calvin didn't dare reach for the transmitter. Look, lady, Coda has two men and they're on this rooftop with us. If you keep screwing around, you're going to get us both killed. Why did you have to shoot him? If I'd wanted him dead, I'd have shot him myself. Now you fucked up everything. He was out of control. I could have gotten him back, cooled him down, if you just stayed back. You pushed him over the edge. No, you couldn't have. That man had checked common sense at the door. He was wired directly to fear. Alfaro looked at the corpse. You dumb son of a bitch. Balanced on the tips of his toes, James waited for the proper moment to throw himself forward and try to take the gun from the woman. The Beretta was a heavy weight in his right hand, but he didn't want to have to shoot her if he didn't have to. Who are you? You don't know me. DEA? Yes. Give me a name. Eddie Cates. The password is Glass Slipper. Alfaro's smile was strained and sad. And little Cinderella is supposed to change right back into what she was before. James felt sorry for her and almost forgot about Kota and his approaching pet goon squad. It's come too far for that to happen. Much too far. Calvin! James started to reach for the headset. No, don't answer and put down the gun! Moving carefully, noticing the insane gleam behind the woman's eyes, James put the Beretta on the rooftop. Coda's gonna be here any second. Coda's the least of my worries. Now take off the radio and put it down too. James did as she ordered, waiting for his chance to move on her, but it didn't come. Move back! Alfaro kept the pocket pistol leveled at his chest. James stepped back. Without wasting movement, Alfaro stepped forward, lifted her foot, and smashed the radio transmitter. Now, my friend, it's you and me alone up here. And if you listen very closely to me, I might get you out of this alive. She bent, retrieved the Beretta, clicked the safety on, and tossed the weapon to James. He caught it, totally lost as to what to expect or what to do next. While he stood there trying to get a bearing on Kota and his bodyguards, Alfaro looted the dead man's body. She looked up at him. Help me! The Protect 25 had disappeared somewhere inside her clothing. She had both hands in the dead man's jacket and was tugging but getting nowhere. James reached down with his free hand and leaned back with the corpse's weight. Where are we going? The edge of the roof! Alfaro dragged the body after her, James keeping it mobile. Certain he was keeping company with a madwoman, but unwilling to desert her, James helped to get the body to the roof's edge. Now what? Throw him over! You're kidding! No! Push! Moving instinctively, James grabbed the woman and pulled her down behind the HVAC unit. The corpse dropped into a prone position. When James glanced around the cover, he saw one of Coda's men break from hiding, angling to get position on them. James scanned the rooftop again. At least four other men were scrambling over the rooftop from the fire escape. Reinforcements. The woman scanned the skies expectantly. Crouching with the assault rifle in semi-auto, James lined up his shot, aiming for an exposed knee of one of Coda's men. When the guy fell to the rooftop, writhing in agony, James placed three more 5.56mm tumblers into the man's head. James glanced up and saw a small Bell helicopter homing in on them. 
He brought up the muzzle of the CAR-15, targeting the pilot's window. Alfaro dropped her hand onto the assault rifle and pushed it down. No! He's on our side! James felt like pointing out that he wasn't exactly sure of what side she was on, but passed. Quickly! We have to get that body thrown over the side! Why? Because they can't know he's dead. The fall should keep the local police from identifying him. They don't have any records on him here. Suppose you tell me what's going on. There isn't time! You must trust me! Lady, stranded up on this rooftop, cut off from my team with a half dozen hostile guns at my back, and nowhere in hell to fall back to, believe me when I say, there's nothing I'd like to do more. This is bigger than Kota. While I was in deep, I turned up things I couldn't pass on to the agency. Why? Because I couldn't be sure how deeply the corruption goes. If I tried to pass on the information too early and it fell into the wrong hands, I would have been dead, and no one would know until it was too late. I've been monitoring the news, and I've seen the reports of the drug enforcement agents' deaths around the world. Believe me when I say that's only the tip of the iceberg of what's yet to come. Shouldering the CAR-15, James spaced a line of bullets across the hiding places Coda and his men had chosen. They think you're rogue. <laughs> They're wrong! I've been working Coda for over a year. My partner was killed. And as a female operative, I don't have to tell you everything I've had to give up to make this case. No. And I'm going to make it. Not just for my partner or myself, but for the people who are going to be hurt if this operation is allowed to succeed. You have no idea of the ramifications involved. Okay, let's do it. Wait. Alfaro clasped his wrist. She looked up at the hovering Bell helicopter and took a small flashlight from her pocket. She flashed it three times, then twice. Inside the darkened cockpit, a light flared twice, then three times. Then the helicopter shifted, coming around to bear on Coda's position. A pair of high-intensity spotlights flared to life on both sides of the chopper. Waves of black smoke mixed with the shadows to cut down visibility. Now! Alfara moved out like an uncoiling spring. James was on her heels. Together, they grabbed the clothing of the corpse, then levered it over the side. <laughs> Dropping back into a defensive posture with Alfaro, James watched the helicopter float down closer to the rooftop. A bay door opened, and a rope ladder tumbled free and unfolded. It wavered just over the edge of the rooftop, then crept closer. Alfaro pulled James to her. You've got two choices. You can stay up here and die, or you can get on that helicopter and do everything I tell you, or you'll just as surely die. Some choice. She pressed the dead man's ID into his hand. Once we board that craft, you're Carlisle Johnson, a syndicate drug liaison from Chicago. If you let them think you're anybody else, anybody else, they'll kill us both. James would have preferred staying on the rooftop and taking his chances. He knew Katz and the rest of the team were out there somewhere and that they wouldn't leave him willingly. But if the woman was onto something that might help the efforts of the Stony Man teams and save lives in the process, he couldn't back away. Maria Alfaro was in bad shape, looked as if she were running on empty, yet he knew she wouldn't back away willingly. All things considered, there were no good choices, but there still remained only the one he could make. Just say when. The rope ladder drifted over onto the rooftop. Alfaro pulled at James. Now, amigo, and don't look back. I need you alive. James ran, grabbed the rope ladder at almost the same time the woman did, and stepped up onto the lowest rung. Alfaro followed suit on the other side. They stood pressed together, and he could feel the heat of her against him. A head poked out the open bay above them. The features were American or European. Hang on, we're going for a ride! Abruptly, the helicopter swung away from the hotel, over the confusion parked in the street. James held on tightly. His stomach fluttered slightly as he looked down eight stories. Bullets sparked off the helicopter's body, but did no disabling damage. Within seconds, they were out of range of the hostile fire. Now climb! We only got a few minutes to make the landing strip before the better alleys on top of us. When we get up there, you talk to no one. You're above them. They're only the hired help. I don't give a goddamn if they don't like you. I'll brief you on Johnson's personal history during the flight. I know everything they know about the man. Understand? Yeah. Alfaro started climbing, obviously ill at ease about hanging from a rope ladder while the city whizzed by below her. James waited at the bottom of the ladder to help provide stability until she reached the top, then started up after her. Man, oh man, Brother Calvin, what have you let yourself in for now? Calvin, I repeat, come in! Katz waited for a reply, but none was forthcoming. His mind worked frantically, playing with all the new variables that had been introduced into the scenario. According to their initial plans, the teams should already have been underway, out of reach for the local law enforcement people. 
Instead, they were still looking to confirm the hit on Kota and were minus Calvin James. He used the powered window washer stand to climb the outside of the apartment building across from the Hotel Galeno. From his rising vantage point, tucked securely in the shadows of the apartment building on the alley side, he could see the grim flurry of battles taking place in the street in front of the hotel. Everything was in confusion down there. The police, Cota's men, and the people McCarter had identified as ex-American agents formed three sides of a very deadly triangle. Gats. Has there been any sign of Calvin? No, but I haven't given up on him. He has a way of turning up. The apartment building went up 12 stories. Katz halted the window scaffold at the ninth floor as the little Bell helicopter swung in toward the hotel's rooftop. At that distance, the men working their way across the pebble and tarred surface looked only slightly larger than ants. He lifted the Galil 308 ARM assault rifle to his shoulder and used the Startron scope to bring greater clarity to the scene. Sweeping the rifle from right to left, he deduced that the men scattered across the rooftop belonged to Kota. Then machine gun fire ripped into the area, followed swiftly by explosives and smoke grenades. Activity at the other end of the building drew Katz's attention, and he focused the scope on James and Alfaro in time to see them pitch a body from the roof. Moments later, the pair was running for the rope ladder trailing from the helicopter. It carried them away easily. Katz pushed away the questions hurtling pell-mell through his mind. They'd have to wait for a time when he had more information. He played the scope over the men remaining on the rooftop. Unconsciously, they came together in a group surrounding their leader. The Israeli had seen it happen a number of times before when dealing with people who weren't versed in military special forces techniques. All the pawns returned to the king during a disaster to find out their orders. A professional tactician made sure the pawns had their orders before going into combat, plans that covered every eventuality. A professional fighting man was trained not to give away any intelligence by his actions out on the battlefield. Katz followed the gathering men to Kota. The drug lord spent his last few breaths on earth, screaming obvious imprecations at his men. Then, Crosshair settled firmly on Kota's left temple, and Katz caressed the Galil's trigger. The impact drove Kota to the rooftop. Katz confirmed the kill through the scope and lowered the rifle. There was no need to take out anyone else. With the head of the monster cut off, the Colombian police and F-2 squads could deal with the body that remained. For the moment, Kota's organization would drift back into the bastardized groups it had once been. He tapped the transmitter as he engaged the scaffolding's motor to take him to the ground. Break off the attack. Our target's been eliminated. What about Calvin? Dropping down the side of the building, Katz gazed after the helicopter disappearing against the dark horizon. For the moment, he's lost to us. The private flight Leo Turin had chartered from Dulles Airport put him down at the Clearwater Executive Air Park on Hercules Avenue in Clearwater, Florida. He took a cab to the nearest car rental agency and paid for a year-old tricked-out luxury edition Mercury Cougar, painted a two-tone dark blue with a lot of chrome. He didn't figure anything less would have suited Parella's parking accommodations. Twenty minutes after that, he'd crossed the Tarpon Springs city limits. Liborio Parella's estate was north of the city, butted up against the coastline with a mass of orchards behind and around it. The old man might have been forced out of the business, but he hadn't been forced out of it penniless. All that had been gleaned from his contacts within mob circles warned Turin that if he had any smarts at all, he'd be better off just leaving Packy the hell alone. Once he'd scanned a map and had the directions figured out, Turin stopped at a convenience store and bought two big foam cups of coffee and a package of white powdered mini donuts because he'd missed dinner. He hadn't missed the news. Things were definitely heating up in South America and California, with the retaliations reported. Things hadn't slowed for the rest of the world, either. The undeclared war was still on. Turin had a gut feeling that they were just experiencing the calm before the storm. Before getting back into the Cougar, he took the time to unlimber his weapons from his suitcases. The 38 airweight bodyguard slid into the paddle holster at his back. The Colt Government 45 long slide went under the seat. Fully armed, he climbed back into the cougar and put the wheels to the road. Twenty minutes later, he topped the last rise leading to Perella's home. The main house looked like a starlet's dream home from old Hollywood, all paint and gingerbread trim from a time fifty years past. It faced the coastline some two hundred yards distant from atop a gently rolling hill. A widow's walk jutted from the second floor on the seaward side. It didn't take much imagination to picture a worried wife pacing the hardwood floor, waiting for her sailor husband to return. 
Behind the house, neat and trim orchards stretched into the near distance. A security fence, at least 10 feet high, enclosed the estate, with guardhouses at the front and rear entrances. The garage was a long, squat building that matched the house, fully capable of sheltering at least a dozen cars. The circle drive in front of the house linked it with the garage. The gardener's shed was a two-story affair that Turin figured was home to the extra muscle Perella kept around for protection. Turin put the transmission in drive and pulled back onto the road. A long sedan eased through the front gates of Perella's estate like a shark cutting through dark waters, and his sixth sense nudged the needle over into the danger zone. He wasn't surprised when the car cut sideways in front of him 50 yards from the house and blocked the road. A mercury vapor spotlight splashed across his windshield and blinded him. His gut tightened up into an ice-cold ball. No matter how many times he'd stepped into it, he wasn't used to the gleaming and serrated edge of the threat of sudden death. He put his foot on the brake and left his hands on the steering wheel, hoping to hell he was dealing with professionals instead of guys who shot first and asked questions never. Two men got out of the car and became walking black cutouts against the blinding light as they came toward him. Out of the car. Turin climbed out slowly, posing no threat. Without being asked, he turned, placed his palms on the rental's hood and leaned against the car with his feet out behind him and spread. Both of the men were young and cocksure of themselves. They carried Mossberg pump shotguns on slings and dressed in dark clothes. Smart guy. The one with the thick mustache kept his shotgun centered on Turin's chest. Are you a cop? No. The other man left his weapon beside his partner, then knelt quickly and began to frisk the Fed. I've got a 38 and a paddle holster by my right kidney. There's a 45 tucked under my driver's seat. They're both clean. When I get them back, I expect them to be in the same condition. Maybe you're not so smart. You're not exactly in a position to be handing out orders. And you don't exactly know who you're holding on the other end of that shotgun, do you? The second man removed the 38, the two speed loaders, and Turin's wallet, then got the 45. He flipped the wallet open and went through the ID. Name's Turin, Leo Turin, from out of D.C. You're Leo Turin? Yeah. I was expecting somebody taller, bigger. The second man nodded, then began another comparison with the wallet's ID, as if checking for a mistake. I mean, you've got a big rep. No offense, Mr. Turin. The old man spoke highly of you when he said you were coming. What's your name, soldier? Dion Salori. The second man passed Turin's personal effects back to him. Sorry, I'm, I'm gonna have to keep the guns for now. Boss's orders. Keep them clean, like I said. Right, right. You mind if I stop leaning on the car, Dion? Yeah, sure. Turin wanted to keep the guy anxious. As long as Salori was nervous, he wouldn't notice Turin's own anxiety if it showed. Who's the head rooster on your yard? Dan the man. Come on with me. We'll drive you in. Turin went along, knowing it would provide the security teams with a chance to go over the cougar for any unwelcome surprises. Does Dan have a last name? I might know him. Canary. Dan Canary. He ain't no paisano with a name like that. <laughs> no, he ain't. But the bastard knows his job like nobody's business. You'll get to meet him real soon. Anybody wants to see Mr. Perella, they gotta go through Dan the man first. Turin sat in the back seat of the car, mugged by the thick smell of men's bay-scented aftershave and stale cigarettes. He used his peripheral vision as they drove through the main gates and up to the big house. He noticed a number of men in the shadows, standing guard professionally, but with enough boredom in their postures to let him know they'd been doing it for a while. The numbers he came up with, figuring for a four-shift day for optimum performance, were staggering. Even with all the money Perella had socked away in the Caribbean banks, an operation this size would bleed him heavily if it lasted more than a few months. Nobody had been around Perella to instill this kind of paranoia for years. When the car halted in front of the house, Saluri got out and escorted Turin inside. They picked up another bodyguard at the door. Turin automatically logged the home's design, part of an undercover cop's natural survival skills if he was going to live deep. They paused for a moment in the entrance hall while Saluri took his coat. A flight of stairs ahead and on the right led to the second floor. Straight through the entrance hall was the family room, filled with elegant furniture that matched the house. To the right was a dining room, a long table and chairs spaced carefully under a gleaming chandelier. On Turin's left was a closed blank door with an electronic keycard reader. Saluri walked to the door and pressed a button. Gazing at the reinforced hinges, Turin figured the door to have an armor-plated core. 
A quick glance around let him know the other doors were the same. Any room in the house could be turned into a mini-fortress. The thing that bothered the stocky little fed most was that the work looked new. Come in. Salori went in first, followed by Turin, who was sandwiched by the second man. The justice man gazed around the room openly. They'd expect him to at this point. The room was large, spacious, easily fitting the large desk and chair at the opposite end. Bookshelves filled one wall, and most of the titles had to do with legal matters and weaponry. Another wall was lined with computer hardware. The wall behind the desk had a dozen security monitors mounted to it. Most of the views were from outside the main house and covered much of the surrounding grounds. The others focused on the interior of the house. At least one was keeping surveillance over the boat docks. I guess Mr. Perella has gone for the new technology in a big way. The man sitting in the swivel chair behind the desk looked like no body Turin had ever seen before. He was too young for the job to begin with, maybe late twenties or early thirties. Only made men, men with kills under their belts and years in service generally made the cut. His blonde hair was neatly trimmed, almost military, and added a certain boyish charm to his good looks. He wore a green turtleneck, black slacks, and a casual sport jacket that had been tailored to hide a shoulder rig. The rimless glasses made him look enthusiastic and honest. The blue eyes behind the lenses held no warmth at all. Turin knew he was looking into a killer's eyes. Dan the man, I'd like you to meet Leo Turin. Turin didn't move. I don't generally speak with the help when I've got an appointment. If the remark bothered Canary, it didn't show. The man gestured to a chair in front of the desk. His fingers stroked a remote control panel on the desktop, and some of the security cameras changed viewpoints. Then all but the center one winked out, leaving a gray film flowing across the screen. Times have changed. You're retired. Mr. Perel is retired. There's no need for formalities anymore. You're not family, Dan the Man, so I don't expect you to understand. There's some things you gotta be family to know. These things, they don't go away just because of a little thing like retirement. Things like respect and hospitality. A nerve twitched high on Canary's face, but the white-toothed smile never lost its wattage. He glanced back at the solitary screen lighted on the wall and pressed a button on the control panel. A frontal shot of Turin filled the screen, faded quickly into a profile shot, then into a montage of newspaper pictures and video stills that had come from another life. Turin's stomach tightened. Canary wasn't family. The man figured to be ex-military or ex-agency of some sort. The Org Crime Division file on Leo Turin as an undercover agent was supposed to be dead and gone. But sometimes paperwork got hung up in the system. Leopold Turin. Called Leo the Pussy. Worked for Sergio Frenchy in the good old days, running cat houses and escort services. Then came the bad old days when Executioner Mac Bolin dropped into Pittsfield and started shooting holes in the Mafia families. You were a lucky one, though. Lots of promotions after that. You have a wife, Angelina, and three children, all grown. Though none of them seem to have followed in your footsteps in the family business. You retired from an active role in family affairs a few years back and now maintain some sort of public relations angle for family members. That right? You forgot about the mole on the left cheek of my ass. The monitor screen winked out. I'm assuming your presence here has something to do with family concerns over Mr. Perella's current business. Truth to tell, college boy, the family wasn't sure if Mr. Perella even had any current business. He stood up abruptly and walked back to the entrance hall. When you get through tinkering with your gadgets there and impressing the hell out of yourself with how smart you are, tell Mr. Perella I'm here to see him. Canary's eyes looked like blue ice marbles behind his glasses. A slow flush colored his face. He reached for a house phone. Solori walked out of the room and closed the door behind him. Uh, you really shouldn't have done that, Mr. Turin. Dan the man's really not somebody you want gunning for your ass. The old man's taken a real shine to him. Eh, couldn't be helped. Man's not family. He doesn't know how to act, and I don't have time for his bullshit. And anyway, I'm here to see Mr. Perella. As long as I'm under his roof by his invitation, nothing's gonna happen to me. Turin hoped that held true. From the looks of things, Laborio Perella was involved up to his eyeballs in whatever was going on. The time to reload. Stony Man is continued on the next CD.
The business was a combination bookie joint and loan sharking operation in a third floor office suite just out of the Queensway district in Hong Kong. The public that didn't have business dealings with it thought the office housed a factory labor temp service, and most of the people who did place bets or make loans didn't know the main offices were located there. Shoebox business fronts all channeled their funds back to the main office, and the money scooted back into Karen Tot's financial holdings legally. Business for the temp service was booming. The main building doors opened at 8.30, and the businesses followed shortly thereafter. According to the map in the foyer, the latest opening business was a bookstore at 10 o'clock. Mac Bolan walked in the main entrance and went directly to the elevators. He carried a box that had once contained a dozen long-stemmed roses. The roses had been left at the first convenient street corner, and the box carefully repacked with equipment necessary for the plan he was about to carry out. Inside the elevator, he punched the button for the fifth floor and went up. Executive office suites covered most of that floor, and it wouldn't look out of place for a boss or a lover to send a secretary flowers. At the fifth floor, he found the nearest public restroom and went inside. Bolin stepped inside a stall, opened the flower box, and took out the gray coverall he'd stashed inside. Underneath was his 9mm Makarov pistol. A small dented red toolbox had been stashed at the other end of the flower container. The warrior had taken it from the back of a truck parked in an apartment garage in the wee hours. The MAC-10 he'd recovered at the site of the cocaine lab was nestled in the toolbox with three spare clips, as were the two mason jar bombs he'd whipped up from diesel fuel and gardening chemicals. He took out the roll of electrical wire he'd already outfitted with a plug, stuffed it into the top socket of the coverall, then wrapped the belt of tools around his hips on his left side. The Makarov went into his right-hand pocket, and the extra clips went into his hip pocket. In less than five minutes, he'd completed his gear check, folded the gift box into the big trash bin, and was out in the corridor. He slipped on a ball cap as he headed for the service stairs. Building security might pick up on an unauthorized utility worker coming in, but he didn't think they'd notice someone who was already inside. He descended to the third floor and stepped into the hallway. The maid who met him on the way up didn't even give him a second glance. He made a show of checking the output of the air conditioning duct in front of the factory labor temp office. The front walls were all glass and revealed a casual waiting room, a bored secretary reading a romance novel, and nearly a dozen artificial plants. Stiegler Factory Temp Service was printed on the glass door in silver letters, along with the office hours. Business didn't appear to be booming today. Putting a dissatisfied frown on his face, Bolin gripped his toolbox and walked into the office. The woman put down her novel long enough to look up at him. Does the AC in here seem okay to you? Seem fine to me. But then people tell me I'm cold-natured. Bolin nodded, pulled the cash register receipt for the gardening supplies from his pocket and studied it. Guys down in 306 and 309 are complaining about it. The ductwork to their office runs through here. Mind if I take a quick look? Won't be but a moment. I'll have to buzz you through first. No, it's okay. I won't be a bother. Bolin walked to the door, opened it, and stepped through. The guard looked up, a big security man who was slowly turning to fat. What do you think you're doing back here? Without bothering to answer, Bolin swung the toolbox at the guard. <laughs> Before anyone else in the room could move, the warrior had the Chinese pistol in his fist. Get away from the desks and telephones. If you don't act stupid, you don't have to die. Slowly, the eight men moved away from their work areas. Hands up where I can see them and keep them there. Bolin set the toolbox on the nearest desk. He figured the room had to be soundproofed, otherwise the avalanche of calls would be distracting. It would definitely make his work easier. What do you want? Keep quiet unless you're spoken to and line up against the wall, with your palms reaching for the ceiling and your backs to me. If you turn around, I'll shoot you where you stand. They moved into position like a chorus line on opening night. Who's in charge? As one, the other seven men pointed to the guy who'd spoken up. Get over here. Trembling, the man did as he was told, trying to keep his eyes on the toes of his shoes so that he wouldn't look like a man who'd remember a face. Open the cash vault. Karen, that will kill me. At least you'll get a chance to run from him. With me, you get no chance at all. Open it. The man walked around the fallen guard and removed a lithograph from the wall. He slid a panel free and exposed a heavy safe with an electronic readout instead of a combination lock on a door slightly smaller than a manhole cover. The keypad to unlock it is in my desk. Move slowly. 
Bolin kept the man at little over arm's reach so that he couldn't complicate things and watch the other seven men. When he had the digital keypad, the man aimed it at the vault. One word of warning. If security should come through that door before I'm out of here, I'm going to put the first bullet in your head. The man nodded, his hands shaking as he pressed the buttons. Across the room, the vault door slid open. Open it the rest of the way. Bolin watched the man for effects of any kind of gas that might have been released inside the vault along with the lock. When the man pulled the heavy steel door open, color-coded plastic racks of money in several foreign currencies as well as domestic bills were neatly stacked inside. Other containers held computer floppy and hard disks, and Bolin guessed they were backup copy for what was contained in the filing cabinets. Move away slowly and get back in line with the others. Once the man was back against the wall, Bolin opened the toolbox and took out one of the mason jars. He reached deep into the vault and set the jar against the back wall with a satisfied smile. The cylindrical shape of the vault hadn't been expected, but it certainly promised to liven up the events he had in mind. He moved to the filing cabinets next and tipped them over in a big pile around and over the eight desks. Papers scattered as folders fell out. He put the second bomb on top of the mess. Reaching into the top pocket of the coveralls, the warrior took out the electrical wiring, added a roll of black electrical tape from the toolbox, and set to work on the bombs. He wired the one in the vault first, taping the leads to the detonating device he'd rigged using gun cotton as the primer. Finished with that one, he cut the wire, then rigged a second wire to the other bomb. He spliced them together, shook out the extra footage, and closed the toolbox. All right, gentlemen, we're going out of here together, slowly. When you hit the hallway, you're on your own. Starting on your left, move out. The first two men in line take the security guard. We can't carry him. Drag him. Get it done. The first two men grabbed the unconscious guard by the feet and pulled him through the door when Bolin opened it. He pinned a Texas Ranger badge on each of them before letting them go. The secretary looked up in alarm, the romance novel in her hand forgotten. You've got the rest of the day off. Scram. Blood from the guard's broken nose tracked the carpet. The woman hesitated for only a moment before racing the two men for the main door. The remaining five men moved out as well. By the time the last one cleared the entrance, the first two men had dropped the security guard and were racing down the corridor. The broken glass would add to the confusion, and a fire alarm wouldn't hurt either. Crossing to the window, the executioner picked up a chair and knocked the glass out. Some of the shards landed out on the busy street, but most of them were caught in the red and white striped canvas awning of the deli below. He pulled the collapsible grappling hook from his pocket, hooked it to the nylon rope he had wrapped around his waist, and secured it to the windowsill. Another piece of cord he cut from the rope was used to tie the toolbox to his coverall. He shoved the mucker off into his pocket. With the electrical cord in his teeth, he climbed over the side of the building and lowered himself to the second floor. His feet braced on the side of the building, his weight leaned back on the cord, he glanced through the window of the music store directly below the office he was leaving. No one was in front of it. He shifted, kicked the glass out, and scrambled inside. Racks in the center of the store held CDs. A long-haired Chinese youth stood alone behind the counter with an incredulous expression on his face. Bolin took the electrical cord from his teeth, mentally counting down from the time he'd released the men. He knew he was going to be cutting it close if he didn't want innocents hurt. Where's the nearest electrical outlet? The clerk pointed at the wall. Bolin shoved a rack of CDs aside and plugged in the electrical cord. Even with the gun cotton primer, the fertilizer explosives were slow to detonate. Looking out over the street, Bolin watched burning money and flaming computer disks belch out through the broken window. The money looked like confetti raining down onto the traffic, quickly attracting the attention of pedestrians and motorists alike. Judging from the traffic snarl below, it would be some time before local law enforcement could descend on the area, much less seal it off. He planned on being long gone by then. The clerk was staring through a window of his own as Bolin passed him. Oh, outrageous dude. Did you do that? Yep. Bolin took a sack from the counter, found out it had the store's logo on it, and put it back. Do you have any unmarked bags about this big? He showed the guy with his hands. Sure. The clerk reached under the counter and came up with a brown plastic bag. Bolin took it, shoved it into his pocket, and turned for the door. Once he ditched the toolbox and coveralls, the bag could conceal the Mac-10 and other ordnance. Uh, you don't have a thing against record stores, do you? No. Bolin used a lockpick to let himself into the first empty office he found, changed out of the coveralls, and put everything in the bag. 
With the bag cinched tight, he looked like a lot of other shoppers who were gathering out in the hallways of the mall area. Five minutes later, he was out on the street and walking east to where he'd left his car. Before he covered the first block, he knew he had a tail. A dark blue sedan trailed him sedately through the stalled traffic. None of its occupants tried to get out and make a grab for the falling money. Halfway through the second block, he picked up the two guys on foot behind him and knew he wasn't going to make the car before they overtook him. George Russell, attorney at law and representative of downtrodden Rastafarian drug dealers in L.A., was a hard man to find. He hadn't been at the large house he maintained outside L.A. or at the spacious apartment he kept downtown. No one at his office had heard from him since that morning. He hadn't been at the courthouse since noon to represent three clients who were now threatening civil suits against him. Two of the judges had pronounced Russell guilty of contempt of court. He wasn't answering his car phone, his cellular phone, or his pager. Lyons was beginning to believe someone had already paid a visit to Russell when Price turned up the beach house on Ocean Avenue in Santa Monica through a connection at the IRS. Apparently, the lawyer had been so busily engaged trafficking drug money that he neglected to be as careful with his own hidden assets. The sun was beginning to drop into the sea when they reached the address. Lyons killed the lights and pulled into the parking area overlooking the beach homes and hotels. Herman Schwartz was riding shotgun. He lifted the night glasses from the dash and scanned the beach houses below. Lyons tried to be patient. Having Maripin turn up dead under his nose hadn't sat well with him, especially when he figured the assassination was done because the Rastafarian had had information they could have used. Got it. Bingo, our boy's home. You sure? Plates on the Jeep Renegade parked out front jibe with what I've got shown on the printout bear scent. Schwartz passed the binoculars across. Lyons refocused the lenses and swept the area methodically. Russell's beach house was built on stilts. A narrow stairway led from the deck overlooking the ocean to the sand. White-capped waves curled up on shore less than 50 feet away. A solitary light was on in the living room, but Lyons couldn't see into the house. How do you know he's there? Elementary, my dear Lyons. Take a look at the wet spot under the Jeep beside the right front tire, and you'll see where the air conditioner's been sweating. It isn't dry in this weather, so it means the vehicle hasn't been there long. I thought you were the detective. Anybody could have driven the Jeep. Oh, and our guy stuck his hat outside the door a minute ago. Well, I'm convinced. Let's go get him. You're just mad because you didn't see the air conditioning sweat spot first, Iron Man. I'd have felt the hood when we got down there. Blunkinellas passed over an ear throat headset. I'm impressed. Still remember that one from the official Hardy Boys detective manual? Cereal boxes. Carl gets his best stuff from cereal boxes. Ignoring the habitual ribbing at his expense, Lyon stepped outside the van and pulled his gear into place. The 357 wheel gun rode his hip, and the 45 went into shoulder leather. He dropped two grenades into his pockets to tip the scales of Lady Luck in his behalf and slid an M16-M203 combo from the racks in the back for good measure. Then he headed out, leading the way down the sandy incline where the shadows provided the thickest cover. Blunkinellis and Schwartz spread out around him, securing the perimeters as they closed in on the beach house. Lyons held the M16 steady and searched for shadows that didn't belong, certain that Russell wouldn't have come out here without some kind of backup. He paused at the side of the house, looked up the incline, and saw Blancanales standing guard to monitor the area and provide coverage in case of a hasty retreat. Lyons knew most people wouldn't have been able to spot the politician if their lives depended on it. The only reason he did was because Blancanales tipped him a nod. I got the back door. Lyons paused under the house at the foot of the stairs. Say when. When. Effortlessly, Lyons moved up the stairs, careful with his weight. Even though he was a big man, he'd learned to move silently. Big men who didn't learn in his business didn't live. He made it without squeaking any of the wooden rungs. The front door slowed him only for a moment. He got past the lock with a plastic rectangle he carried just for that purpose and let himself inside. The warm glow of the floor lamp by the wall splashed over the cozy living room furnishings and made the burnished luster of the coffee table come through the fine layer of sandy dust. An orange glowing dot in the kitchen belonged to a coffee maker. A white sack containing leftover Mexican takeout was on the table. The Irish whiskey bottle beside the coffee pot was uncapped, letting him know Russell was having trouble with his nerves. I got him! Lyons moved carefully on point, making sure the bedroom was empty. Where? Family room at the back. Lyons walked into the room, M16 leading the way. I demand to see some ID. 
You people have violated my rights by coming here. You've trespassed in my home. Shut up. Is he clean? Beats me. Lions turned to Russell. We've got some questions, and you're going to answer them. I've got a right to see my attorney. Funny. That's what your clients were saying earlier today when you didn't show up for court. We know how you've been skimming off the tops of the accounts you've been handling for the drug people. We know you're the reason Meripin got dead so quick in the L.A. County Sheriff's Office. I want the name of the guy you're working for, and I want to know the scope of this thing. You can't make me talk. I know my Miranda rights. Lyons stepped into the man's personal space. Let me clue you in, fat man. I'm not a cop. I am, however, the guy who's going to kick your ass if I don't get some answers in the next couple of minutes. Besides, do you really want us to be cops? Russell looked at Gadgets. Your employer didn't seem to have any trouble taking down Meripin once they had him caged. And I figure you're more dangerous walking around talking than Meripin was. You can't let him get to me. If he does, I'm a dead man. You'll talk, or I'll put up the neon arrow over your head and draw the map myself. Immunity. You gotta grant me immunity. Witness protection. You'll get it, provided what you say is good. Gadgets! Iron Man, get out of the house, now! Back way! Schwartz reached out and grabbed Russell, pulling the man after him as he ran through the house. Lyons followed. He came to a stop on the rear deck and looked up the steep incline behind the beach house. A tunnel of lights coming over the edge turned into a narrowing cone that got brighter and brighter. Iron Man! We're out! <laughs> Lyons grabbed Russell by the shoulder and swung him over the deck railing. <laughs> Jump, Gadgets, and get up running! Schwartz didn't hesitate. The ground was a dozen feet below, but the able team warrior hit the railing and flipped over expertly. Lyons followed right behind. <laughs> he hit the ground and rolled, aware that Schwartz already had the lawyer up and was streaking for the waterline. He dug for traction, hurled himself forward, and watched as the truck slammed into the beach house. Lyons came to a halt 30 feet from the tractor. Paul? Oh? I'm okay, but we've got company. Lyons saw the headlights of three vehicles spilling down the side of the incline from Ocean Avenue. The three vehicles were tricked-out dune buggies, colorful fiberglass shells over Volkswagen chassis. Their mufflers stuck out behind them like trumpets. Iron Man lifted the M16 M203 to his shoulder and put his finger on the grenade launcher's trigger. <laughs> The able team leader pushed himself to his feet, fumbled for another grenade, and charged his weapon as the remaining two dune buggies chewed around in circles for another pass. The driver of the buggy on the left shuddered suddenly and fell out of his seat. The other buggy roared forward, straight at Lyons. Keeping cool, the big ex-cop aimed the M203 again and squeezed the trigger. Nobody got up to walk away. Before the sand settled, able team was hustling their prisoner toward the waiting van. The buzzing of the desk intercom interrupted the steady whirl of thoughts inside Barbara Price's tired mind. I've got Yakov on line two. There's been a problem in Bogota. Secure line? Yeah. Price. We've lost Calvin. <gasps> How did it happen? No, he's alive. It came out more blunt than I'd anticipated. He quickly explained about the helicopter that had flown James and Alfaro from the rooftop. <sighs> he never contacted you? No, but neither he nor the woman appeared to be under any duress, and both seemed to know the helicopter was going to be a friendly. Alfaro knew. There's no way Calvin could have known. That's what I was thinking as well. Did the local police overtake the helicopter? No. According to police reports that Raphael and Gary monitored, the helicopter made a rendezvous at the airport, and they took off in a plane that falsely filed a flight plan to Mexico City. What kind of plane? Katz gave the particulars. The registration has also proved to be false. I'll give this to Bear. With as much satellite surveillance as we already have in place on this operation, we might get lucky. What about Coda? The man is down. However, we did pick up a third party of players. And a name. Most of them were ex-CIA agents and mercenaries. That correlates with the information we received on the team that tried to kill Hal. Price brought Katz up to date on Brignola's experience with terse sentences. The man who hired these people is named Webb August. Just a minute. Bear. See if we can find a file on a guy named August. Webb. No known middle initial. Cat says the guy's supposed to have CIA contacts, maybe a contract player subsidized by the agency. If you don't turn up anything direct, try accessing the Air America files. The guy has a line on Mercs, so it might play that way too. I'm on it. Back to you as soon as I have something. 
We also have an address on August in Cayenne, French Guiana. Do you need transport to get there? No, David's handling that now. But there is another unexplained threat. Cota was very upset tonight, to the point that he was trying to kill Alfaro. Her cover broke? I don't think so, but it's possible. The man David talked to said that Alfaro was an agent working for them, that she was part of a trap designed to snare Cota. They knew about us, but if we didn't take Cota down, they were supposed to. Alfaro may be working a triple cross. It gets complicated. And Calvin has worked his way into the eye of the storm. Or been lulled into it, yes. Since we're operating with so little information pointing in any certain direction, Calvin might have seen this as the chance to make a breakthrough. If Alfaro doesn't betray him... Yes. There was a man Alfaro was meeting, an American who came in on a flight today. His name was Carlisle Johnson. He hasn't turned up in any of the police reports. In the last few minutes that I saw Calvin, he and Alfaro were shoving the body of a black man off the rooftop. The police haven't been able to identify the man. He didn't have any ID on him? No. And do you think Calvin and Alfaro lifted it? It's a possible scenario that would explain part of the puzzle. Hold on. Price stabbed a finger at the intercom button again. Yeah. I need somebody who can take time to run a quick trace. I'm switching you over to Akira. What's up? I've got a name. Johnson. Carlisle. Spell it any way you have to. He arrived in Bogota, Colombia today. Find out where he's from and who he is, then get back to me. You got it. Price returned her attention to the phone and punched up the information she had on the contacts she had in French Guiana. Katz estimated the time it would take Phoenix to reach the country, and she plotted the arrival of whatever ordinance they might need. In the end, she was able to beat Katz's time by almost half an hour. She put the call through on another line. Let me have your screen. Price switched the monitor over to Bear's control, slaved it to his board, then dumped the telephone conversation into three-way mode on the speakerphone. I'll walk you through it. I'm sending a copy through to Katz on the fax line. A picture of a high-browed, white-haired man with seamed features chugged onto the monitor. A ragged scar bisected an eyebrow that looked like a fuzzy ivory caterpillar. He wore an open-throated denim shirt and a low-crowned black Stetson. First frame, Jonathan Webb August. His friends call him Webb. He is not and has never been CIA, but he has been involved in contract work for nearly 40 years. He started out doing it himself, worked mostly for the United States against communist countries. And then in the early 70s, he retired from an active role except on special occasions. A series of color and black and white stills followed. Webb August aged quickly in them, and several years seemed to be skipped entirely. By the time he stepped out of the hands-on side of the business, he knew a lot of independent players on both sides of the Iron Curtain. If you needed someone to make a hit, steal computer information, or infiltrate a terrorist unit, August could give you the name of the man or woman who could do the job, for a price. During the last years of the Cold War, our boy was scabbing money from both sides of the wall. <laughs> Evidently, he was no longer as enthusiastic about his patriotism. It wasn't paying as well. August has learned to love money. Price scanned through the information quickly. I don't see anything in there to indicate that August could design an elaborate scheme like the one that's taking place now. No, he's not. The guy's a mechanic. You give him a blueprint that's feasible and he can get it done, but he's not inventive. <sighs> so he's working for someone, too? Yeah, that's my guess. There were ex-CIA agents at the strike against Hal and in Bogota. I'm not willing to write that off as just a mere coincidence. Who handled August at the agency? A lot of people. August wasn't anyone's pet. We'll ask the man when we see him. Be careful down there. From what I've been able to put together from news footage and agency reports, August maintains a well-staffed little army. You guys may be in for a rough ride. Price leaned back in her chair and studied the man again, trying to see the drop of truth in the well of suspicions. I came up with something else that bothered me, Barb. In reviewing August's files, I discovered that the DEA has been using him for information about the Medellin cartels a lot lately. That fits. In order to play the games August has been playing with Cota and the other cartel members, he'd have to be well-versed on all of them. Yeah, but it turns out that a lot of August's snitches were where we got the information we used to take down Luis Costanza and our little Panamanian dictator friend last year. If that's true, we were used and never even knew it. Costanza posed a large threat. That's why we went after him. But McCarter's intel also suggested that the man August is representing is after control of the cartel. If that's true, that means they've had over a year to prepare for this. 
Yeah, I'd believe it. This thing's been falling like an international avalanche ever since it started. The way it's been put together, with a piece nudged here and another turn there, you wouldn't even notice it until the domino effect had started. Price wondered how the hell she could plan to stop it if she still wasn't sure exactly where it was headed. Yo, I found Carlisle Johnson. Who is he? Chicago mob affiliate. I'm putting together a file now. Have it to you soonest. Basically, though, Johnson's been heavily involved in the drug action in the mid and northeastern sectors of the United States. Org crime, the DEA, and the FBI have been after him for years, trying to flip him. Johnson is a guy who knows where the bodies are buried. And he's also a guy local drug gangs go through to settle territorial grievances. He's got some pull with people behind the scenes who could make little troublemakers vanish. Word is, you don't go into business in a big way in those areas without approval from Johnson and his backers, unless you want some heavy trouble. Still doesn't stop people from trying, though. And the files I glanced through suggest that Johnson has been indirectly responsible for deaths well into three figures. Another networker. Price's mind tugged at the possibilities, appalled at where they might eventually lead. Thanks, Akira. Anytime. Yakov, taking your scenario for Calvin one step further, in light of this new information, he could intend to pass himself off as Johnson and find out who's pulling the strings on this operation. It's possible. When it comes to the drug problem, you know he sometimes gets emotionally involved. Price knew. James had lost family to drugs, recognized the potential for disaster from a personal perspective. Keep me posted on the French Guiana end of things. Take care. Will do. You do the same. Price hung up. At the moment, there was nothing else she could do. And she hated it. The men following Mac Bolan had good moves. Even when he let them know he was on to them, they didn't panic. The pair on the sidewalk broke into a trot and closed the distance. So far, there was no sign of weapons. The warrior didn't figure on it staying that way. They'd been too close to Karen Tot's operation. If they weren't working for Tot, they were working for someone else monitoring Tot's operations. Bolan ducked into the underground parking garage and broke into a sprint. By the time he reached the two elevators set into the plain concrete block wall to his left, the two guys on foot had made the corner and paused. The dark sedan wheeled into the garage, halting at the ticket booth. An elderly Chinese couple stepped out of the elevator cage on the right. Catching the door and seeing that the cage was empty, Bolin stepped inside and hit the button for the first floor, then rapidly hit the buttons for the other five. The stairs were at the opposite end of the building. Provided some of the men split off to cover the stairwell, the executioner assumed that at least one of them would come up the elevator after him. The car stopped at the first floor, and he got out while a small group of people boarded. Three young men in business suits were waiting for the second cage as it descended. When the doors opened, they started to get on. Bolin held the door with his foot, smiled ruefully, and flashed one of the Texas Ranger badges on his open wallet quickly enough that none of them got to see it plainly. Sorry, guys. Security. I'm afraid I'm going to have to have that elevator. The three men nodded and moved back. None of them appeared happy about it. Once inside, Bolin tapped the emergency stop button, opened the escape hatch, and crawled on top. The air inside the shaft was muggy and hot, and only dim light filtered in. He reached down, managed to get the restart button on the panel with effort, then replaced the hatch. The elevator started to descend. The two men got on at the garage level. Bolin peered at them through the crack he'd left in the hatch. Both were very polite, but insistent, while they kept two other men from boarding as well. As the doors closed, the executioner slid the hatch to one side and covered them with the mucker off. What do you want? Stop the elevator before anyone can get on. Do it now. Both men lifted their hands above their shoulders. On the floor. Hands behind your heads. They did as they were told. The warrior slithered back through the opening and dropped the bag containing the Mac-10 and extra ordnance into the corner out of their reach. When he searched them, Bolin found two Makarov 9mm PMs in concealed leather. He tossed both pistols through the open hatch on top of the elevator, then closed the hatch. Removing a multi-purpose tool from a pocket, he opened the elevator's control panel, erased the previous programming the unit had received, then restarted the cage and hit the garage level button. Both men watched him closely. Up. Bolin motioned with his pistol before he tucked it under his jacket and picked up the bag. The numbers were going crazy inside his head. There was no way to figure a wildcard play like this, but he was hoping the other side would be just as confused. The men managed to get to their feet just as the elevator came to a stop and the doors opened. 
The executioner went through first, found no one waiting, and waved them outside. They followed wordlessly. He pointed to the car he'd rented during the night and had them lead the way. He didn't see the dark sedan that had been tailing him and figured maybe the driver had raced around to the other side of the building. A bit of plastic glinted behind one of the men's ears. Boland plucked it off, ready in case the guy tried to turn on him. The plastic housed a tiny speaker attached to a small walkie-talkie in his shirt pocket. He dropped the walkie-talkie and smashed it under his boot. There was no time for a question and answer session. The men knew that. They'd remain silent or lie to him in the minutes that were left. Bolin opened the trunk of the rental and removed the spare, jack, and jack handle. Get in. The men weren't happy about it, but they did. It was a tight fit. Bolin dropped the Mac-10 onto the passenger seat and pulled out onto the street. The memorized streets and businesses flipped through his mind as he drove. He checked the rearview mirrors constantly. When he remembered a place he knew would serve his needs, he made a left-hand turn and cut into traffic. Three more turns and eight blocks later, he stopped the car in front of a small photocopy store. Only a tired old man reading the morning paper was inside. Get out. The two men climbed out, brushing at their clothing and glancing suspiciously at their surroundings. They were obviously puzzled about their destination. Herding them inside the photocopy shop, Bolin halted them beside a copier and lifted the cover. Take your jacket off and stick your face on the glass. The man hesitated and looked at his partner. Bolin showed him the pistol without letting the old man see it. Evidently, the clerk thought it was a joke because he shook his head, grinning big enough to show pink gums, and went back to his paper. Your choice. I don't care if I get the before or after shot. Bullet holes will make it harder, but not impossible. Grimacing, the man stuck his face to the photocopier glass. Now the left profile. Bolin took two more pictures, then did the second man. When they finished, he gathered the prints, paid the clerk, passed on a receipt, and moved his captives back outside. He left them standing on the street corner as he drove away. Liborio Perella looked like hell. Both his hands, looking like skeletal models wrapped in blue-veined, fleshy spiderwebs, were piled on top of the wooden walking stick that had long ago lost whatever gloss it might have once had. Leo Turin felt as if he were interviewing a corpse that hadn't been given the bad news yet. But in spite of his appearance, a definite spark of life glowed in Perella's eyes. So, Leo the Pussy, what brings you out to see me? I know you didn't come all this way to see the mouse in Epcot Center. You ain't in the right town. <laughs> Dan the man stood in the corner with his arms folded across his chest. His expression was deadpan. I came out to see how you were enjoying your retirement, Mr. Perella. Then I see you got your house looking like Fort Knox or prepared for the next world war. The next world war is a long, long way off, Lil. Perella walked to the bar and looked at the man standing behind it. You and I won't live to see it. Your children won't live to see it. Maybe the next world war, one side will have spike tails and the other will have halos. <laughs> Make us a couple of drinks, Mike. What are you drinking, Leo? You got beer? Beer I got. You sure you don't want anything stronger? I'm sure. Oh, it's been a long day. and Maybe I'm getting older. The bartender uncapped a bottle of Rolling Rock and poured it into a chilled glass. Perella handed the glass over and raised his own. Salut. Salut. <sighs> so, Leo, who sent you? Turin started to shrug the question away. Don't bullshit me, Lil. I still keep an ear out to the rest of the world. Don't let this old ask of a body fool you. Officially, you're semi-retired, living the life of Riley. Unofficially, the commission calls you in to smooth over troubles between family members because you're nonpartisan. Is there anyone in the North who thinks they have trouble with me? Oh, no, no, sir. Back there, you've still got a lot of respect, Mr. Perella. People remember you and what you've done. Bullshit. Perella stumped over to the window, staying out of the line of fire and at an angle so he wouldn't be easily seen by anyone outside. Those old men up there, the ones who are left, they've lost their balls or their knowledge of how to act. You ask them, Leo, if they know what inflation is, what the stock market does. Hell, 
Most of them probably get the shits every time the economy in this country has gas. There was a time, and you remember it, when we took what we wanted, held on to only what we were strong enough to hold. There's no Cosa Nostra like I remember it. Just a bunch of old men and young pups trying to be goddamn yuppies. Turin let the old man talk. Perella was on a tirade, so evidently the guy had something to compare what had been lost to what could be gained. Dan the man seemed antsy and shifted uneasily against the wall. Perella's bony stare was penetrating. They sent you to find out what I was into, didn't they? Somebody up there smelled the scent of new money. Turin had been asked by some of the Commission's top people to talk to Perella after the old man's name came up associated with the drug hits. Some of the family members are worried about you. They don't want to see you spend the last few years of your life in federal prison. <laughs> They're just worried that I might bring him inside with me. Big ears, Palumbo, Salmonary, others. They know I remember where some of the bodies are buried. Even after all these years, I could bring them down with me. Turin realized the old man was feeling his oats. If word got back to some of the family heads about how loosely Perella was talking, a quiet contract would be issued, executed, and never mentioned again. And if there was time, the stocky little fed would have let the families take care of Perella. But now there was the question presented by Dan the Man and the electronic Pandora's box in the study window. They shut me out. All those years ago, they shut me out. Left me to fight those damn Colombians and Rastafarians all by myself. The police, FBI, and DEA would have been picking over my bleached bones if I'd waited for my friends to help me. But that's the thing about life. You know, Leo, you make new friends. Friends you never even thought about having before. Mr. Perella, it's getting late and you're under a doctor's care. Dan the man. Looks just like a Boy Scout, doesn't he, Leo? Leo grinned and noticed the tick was back on the guy's face. I like to listen to him worry. Cross my heart and swear to God, he sounds like a Jewish mother at times. You know the kind I'm talking about. I know. For the first time in a lot of years, I've cut myself a sweetheart of a deal. And all I had to do was introduce a few of my new friends to a few of my old friends. Soon, it's going to be like the old days around here. Parties, women, and respect, Leo. Respect like I had when I was a younger man. Mr. Perella. Uh, he's right, Leo. I really should get my rest. We'll talk more tomorrow. You'll be staying here the night? If it's no bother. It's no bother. Dan, the man, see to it. Leo has a place to sleep tonight. I find it enjoyable talking to someone from the old school. The headcock nodded, but Turin could tell the man wasn't happy. Hello. You just lost a hell of a lot of cash and accounts receivable. So I've heard. I have a name for you. I'm waiting. Dean Chantre. Spell it. D-E-A-N-C-H-A-N-T-R-E. And what's his story? He's a Briton, and he's supposed to have underworld connections that spread across the globe. He works for himself, and he works for others if the price is right. Until now, he's been strictly small time. Nothing too big or too risky. And now? Of late discovered he's been enticing my smaller competitors to join against me and force me out of Hong Kong and the mainland. I'd known of this before, but I'd been unable to retrieve a name until now. Last night was very costly to me. Not only for the damage you did, but in terms of what I had to do to get that information. Where do I find Chantre? That I can't tell you. My sources indicate that he might be in London. But I can't be sure. Chantre moved on before things got hot. Yes. I've also been informed that Chantre is largely responsible for the recent DEA killings I've been unjustly accused of masterminding. I've been told he's even done some information gathering for that agency. Where do the Russians fit in? They're working with the same group Chantre represents. Which is? I haven't been able to determine that. Is this information enough to send you on your way? Yeah, but I'll get back this way soon. Bet on it. I hope so. Because we have unfinished business, and I can assure you, 
the next time you come through, things will be very different. I don't think so. In case you haven't got the badges I've been sending you all night, there's a new sheriff in town. Calvin James looked out the window of the Learjet at the dark water below. It appeared black and cold, as smooth as ice and unending. The interior of the jet seemed to reflect that. The men running the transportation end of things had relieved him of his weapons, except for the Beretta and the Randall survival knife sheathed under his pant legs. Beside him, Maria Alfaro opened a small bottle and took out the tiny spoon inside. She slipped it back into her purse without looking at him and leaned her head back against the seat rest. James could almost see the drug working inside her body. Don't stare at me. Sorry. James turned away and studied the blank bulkhead, separating them from the pilot and co-pilot. They were alone in the body of the jet. Alfaro smoothed back her hair self-consciously. I know your opinion of me isn't very high right now, but I'm a good cop. I always have been. It's just that this is a very dirty job. I couldn't do it. Most people can't, and the work I do saves lives. Who's gonna save you? <laughs> I'll save myself. I always do. I've kicked the drugs before, and I will this time. It's just that I need them right now for part of my cover. They help me hold it together. If I tried to go cold turkey right now, in deference to you and your feelings, I'd fall apart. It bothers you, doesn't it? Having to place your life in the hands of somebody who's wired. Yeah. That's a good sign. If you can be honest with me, it means you can be honest with yourself. Do you trust me? No. Not completely. Then what are you doing up here with me? I took a chance on you. Do you do that often? Not if I can help it, and only then if I get a good feeling about the person I'm relying on. That's supposed to make me feel better? No, it's just an answer. What you do with it is your business. You're very sure of yourself. Sometimes. Right now I don't feel like I've gotten in totally over my head. You think you could take the two men up there? If I had to. And land the plane? Mm-hmm. My, my, you are a self-reliant kind of guy. Anger burned inside James at her sarcasm, but he pushed the emotion away, knew it was only the drugs and her own fears that made her speak like that. I don't have all that talent. I've got this body and my wits, and those are the only things that have kept this wolf pack from devouring me. You still haven't told me what this is all about. This is about control. This guy we're going to meet wants to talk to Carlisle Johnson about the drug trafficking in the northeastern United States. I've handled the dialogue so far from both ends. Why you? Because Johnson was dealing heavily with Kota, which meant lately he was dealing heavily with me. I stole Johnson from under Kota's nose. Johnson had a thing for Latino women, so it was easy. Who is this guy? I don't know. I've been stonewalled the whole time. The guy likes his privacy. Where are we supposed to meet him? In London. Our first stop is in Jamaica for refueling. Then we're going to leapfrog up the eastern coast and make the hop over to London. Who's been your contact? Different people. I've never seen any of them three times running. I think I'm working directly for the head guy, but I won't know until I talk to him. I'll recognize his voice. So what does he want? The drug trade. Every last bit of it. At least that's my opinion based on what I've seen, heard, and been a part of. This guy has sources and people all the way around the world. There's no way he can hope to control that much territory. There are too many groups willing to hit the streets and cut themselves any part of the action they can. He has men like the ones you saw back there. And he has other, more devious ways. You think this is impossible, don't you? Sounds like science fiction. I've been up against the drug people plenty of times. It's an ego trip for most of them. Fast cars, easy money. Easy women. I wasn't going to say that. But it went through your mind. I saw it on your face. <laughs> it's okay. I'm not that thin-skinned. I've learned not to be. But she lowered her eyes. James wished he could think of something to say that didn't sound patronizing. This guy is setting things up like a business. Everybody who works for him gets a piece of the pie. And those things you listed, they're still there. Executive perks. What about the people who want to remain independent? Remember the independent gas stations? My father owned one of them until the corporations forced him out and into early retirement. There are ways of squeezing out the people who don't want to go along, either physically or economically. There'll always be the cowboys, of course. No business is entirely free of those. But the percentage of the trade they handle is going to be infinitesimal compared to what he'll ultimately control. You talk like this could happen. I think it's so close to happening right now that it scares the hell out of me. The reason I went AWOL was to get close to this guy. 
He picked me to rat Coda out and get to Johnson. I did it, and in the process I made myself valuable to him. How valuable? I don't know. But enough that he wanted me here when he met with Johnson. If I can get a name, something solid, maybe the agency can track him down and stop him before he gets the organization into the driver's seat. But getting that done would take time. Denial isn't going to help. I've tried. Coda tried. He's had time. Uh, remember Louis Costanza last year? I read about it. This guy set up Costanza's bloody exit, worked it through some intelligence people he had on the payroll. Cota told me all about it. Costanza was really close to consolidating the Medellin cartels. Can you imagine what that would have been like? Yeah. This is going to be even worse. We live in strange times these days. The Berlin Wall has fallen, the Cold War no longer exists, the Soviet Union no longer exists, and the Communists have embraced democracy and capitalism. There are still a few holdouts. For how long? Cuba's Communist government rests on the sloped shoulders of a tottering Fidel Castro. The Chinese are still struggling through the fallout from Tiananmen Square. Even if it takes years, drugs are filtering into Europe faster than ever, and the Commonwealth of Independent States is now a wide-open market. Try to put a price tag on the potential growth out there. <laughs> it's staggering. I know. He's got to be stopped. Why didn't you go to the DEA with this? <laughs> I look at you, see me through your eyes. You see a burned-out wreck of a human being wired so tight she might explode. You're having trouble believing me now. And you've got more of an inside track than most of my supervisors. <laughs> no one would believe me. No one. But if I get the bastard's name and fade before it goes down, then find a safe place with a neutral agency and start yelling my head off about it, somebody has to listen. I have to worry about the people I work with. I know for a fact that some of them are on this guy's payroll too. James thought about that, wondered how far into domestic intelligence circles the corruption had spread. There was never a shortage of money in drug trafficking, only in how much a guy wanted to pay out to stay in business. He also thought about the woman beside him, wondered what it must be like to be so far out of the system, so very alone. It was depressing, and as scary as hell, wondering which way she was going to bounce if everything turned into a busted play. Break's over. Let's go through the background on Johnson again. Tell me what you remember. This has got to be the longest shot I've ever played. There's no way in hell I can hope to remember enough about this guy to play him even for five minutes. There might even be someone there who's met him. Not in England. Johnson's talked to me about that. Except for Mexico, Canada, and Colombia, he'd never been out of the United States. What if I forget something? Look, you're not going to be there playing 20 questions. Come on hard. Don't let anyone play games with you. You're a businessman waiting to do business. Money talks, bullshit walks. You only have to maintain the cover long enough to let us know who's calling the shots. Then we're out of there. We could go in with what we know now. To your agency? Oh, come on. I knew you weren't DEA the first minute I laid eyes on you. You're a spook, probably DIA or NSA. You don't have to worry about the law. <laughs> you are the law. James didn't bother to correct her. Stony Man Farm was a totally covert operation, and he didn't want to help narrow her field of speculation. As to sinking into Johnson's character, don't worry about it. People can read whatever they want to in reports concerning Johnson. But if you can project an image that's close to what they're expecting and hold to it, they're going to buy you. It's easy to become someone else. But if you do it long enough, it gets hard to figure out who you really are. Tears glinted in her eyes as she turned away. James reached out, took her hand, and squeezed it reassuringly. We can do this. No problem. Our new buddy, George Russell, has become real cooperative. We heard about the hit at the beach house. How's everybody at that end? We made it through with nothing to complain about. Though if the locals catch up with us, there could be hell to pay. We left a lot of worried civilians behind. We could have a problem getting Russell out of here if anybody figures out who the beach house belongs to. That's been taken care of. For the moment, the IRS records concerning that house have been conveniently misplaced. Old George is showing his appreciation. As soon as you guys are ready there, we'll transmit the computer files he has on the drug trafficking skims. Someone hit his office with firebombs at about the same time they tried to take us out at the beach house, but Russell kept a couple of spare copies of everything he did. I figure he was covering his own ass in case things got too sticky. Did he say who he was working for? Local mob action. Small timers looking to go big. He did a lot of the legwork for us. The trail he followed took him to some of the guys in Las Vegas, then moved on to Florida. 
A guy named Liborio. Parella. You already had him? Leo did, but he was just playing out a maybe. Yeah, well, no more maybes. Russell says Perella has been playing banker for the operation. Where are the accounts the money is going into? The Cayman Islands. Price nodded. At the other end of the room, the wall screen was turned to local news channels, flipping through them on scan mode as computers sucked up the various stories for later retrieval and consolidation. Not quite 14 hours after the initial strikes against the various drug enforcement agencies had begun, a new wave of murder was spreading across the globe. Besides the activities undertaken by the Stony Man teams and the executioner and the legal vengeance being extracted by the world's police agencies, drug gangs had started killing off rival gang leaders and narcotics heads with frightening regularity. Price could almost see the balance of power shifting across the globe as the unidentified organization wiped out the competition through efforts started by the law enforcement teams. The assassinations of the key individuals heading up the international crime buster scene hadn't stopped either, merely slowing as targets were ferreted out with greater skill. Why did they choose Perella? Russell says it was because Perella already had the machinery in place to collect and move the money. Besides the California and Las Vegas connections, as well as some of the other major U.S. cities, Perella knows a lot of the bankers in the Caymans on a first-name basis. He greased the wheels. Price reflected on that sorting through the pieces of the mafioso's past that she remembered from Kurtzman's debriefs. Bear. Yeah, Barm. A sidebar for investigation. Perella was one of the mob people covertly involved in the Bay of Pigs attempt in 1961, sponsored by the CIA. We'll cross-reference him with Webb August concerning company handlers when we get the chance. Kurtzman opened a window on the screen and made the necessary addition to the Webb August file. We're ready to receive here. Carl. On its way. Gadgets, do your stuff. Price watched numbers and stats blur by, occasionally picking out a name or seeing an amount that she could verify. Nice. What you got here, Barbara, the actual amounts involved with the different operations Russell handled and where some of the money's ended up. If I can't sort through this and get two and two to equal four, you can give my job to Carl. Can't see it happening. I mean, think about Iron Man trying to crack a computer file for a moment, hold a 357 Magnum on a VGA screen and shouting, Give up or die, scum. Despite the seriousness of the moment and the situation, Price couldn't suppress the smile that lifted her lips. Something else Russell volunteered, Barb. I'm listening. While he was trying to scratch the itch his curiosity had developed, Russell backtracked a few of the records the cash flow had generated. Seems some of the money went for the purchase of a freighter from San Francisco. A freighter? Affirmative. She's called the Bama Town Lady, and she was sailed down to Houston four months ago to get re-outfitted. Re-outfitted for what? I figured when we got down to the shipyards, we'd ask. We've done about all the damage at this end that we could do, and that's the only lead I can see to follow. Unless you have something else for us. No, follow the ship. It hasn't turned up on any of our other investigations. The money that was involved in purchasing and re-outfitting her warrants our attention. Kurtzman had already passed the information to Hunt Weathers, setting the man into motion, tracking the freighter. Let me know what you find. Damn it! This gives us part of a lever, but not everything we need. I can trail the money only so far, but then it disappears. We're missing other files that we need to tie it all together. It's been moved around a lot, if this account is any example, but once it moves off the continental U.S., I'd lose it. Will Perella have the information? Uh, maybe. Somebody does. That's for damn sure. I can see where disbursements have been made, which I assume are payoffs for domestic personnel, but the bulk of it's gone. If anybody can find it, I'd put my money on you. Kurtzman only nodded, lost in the programming he was initiating. Price wandered back to her office for another dose of pain relievers. She knew the headache she had now was from stress and fatigue rather than frustration. They were getting close. She could feel it. She took a container of orange juice from the ice bin, tore the cover off, and sipped. She glanced at her watch and realized Brignola and the president would be wanting an update soon. Brignola had been with the man for a few hours now, weaving together a tapestry of truth and defensive supposition. The White House was already getting heat from the other countries for possible heavy American intelligence involvement in the current world crisis. If it turned out that American agents were largely responsible for the conspiracy in the drug trafficking groups, there was no guessing what kinds of adverse effects it would have on the world situation. The closer things got to peace, the more unstable everything seemed. Price. I got Stryker on the horn. He's got some pictures he wants us to look at. I'll be right there. Price picked up her orange juice and crossed the room. 
Kurtzman was scanning a lean, ascetic face done in a black-and-white photocopy and plastered across the computer monitor. She clipped a phone headset on and watched as Kurtzman's hands zipped across the keyboard. Color was added to the black-and-white frame. The hair turned brown, the eyes blue. In seconds, it was starting to look more warm and strangely cruel. Price? Hello, Barb. You've been busy. Places to go, people to see. Is this one of your appointments? A recent drop-in. I didn't have time to quiz him, but he speaks Russian and was running loose security on one of Karen Tot's operations. The picture on the screen came into clear focus, then moved to one side while a second window started flipping through a series of headshots. Price was aware of Tot, knew the crime lord's history, and had known the executioner was chipping away at his organization in Hong Kong in a bid for information. Tot doesn't have a history of working with the Russians. The communist government tried to close him up a number of times. That's what I remember, too. Tot says they aren't his, and he gave me a name. Kurtzman picked up a pencil and held it poised over a note-covered legal pad. Go ahead. The pictures on the monitor kept screaming through in flashes of color that got faster and faster. Dean Chantre. He's a networker. Price had worked tangently around the man in her pre-Stony Man farm days. Intelligence circles were very incestuous when it came to people ready, willing, and able to do any necessary dirty work. His name fits in with the others we've turned up so far. Quickly, she gave Bolin a thumbnail sketch of the information turned up by Able Team, Phoenix Force, and Leo Turin. So, what we've got here is a collection of guys who are used to working behind the scenes to make things happen. We've got the arms and the legs, but we're still looking for the head. I got a name on your first guy. A military ID picture of the man in an army uniform filled the window to the right of the retouched fax photo Kurtzman had had to start with. Pyotr Litvinov. He was a field operative for the KGB before the USSR went belly up. The KGB? Yeah. Did a lot of overseas work and has been tagged with a number of executions, though it's never been proved. We're searching for a Russian link, too. I'd say so. But that makes sense, because that part of the world is going to be up for grabs in the next few years. Whoever our guy is, he definitely takes his empire building seriously. Sergei Belenkov, also of the KGB, also a field operative. Who was their commanding officer? A man named Yuri Zubarov. Where is he now? According to the CIA files and military intelligence, the colonel disappeared two, maybe three years ago. This was already in motion then. Zubarov could be one of the new guys on the block. It's possible his involvement could be more easily traced than that of Chantre, August, Perello, or Johnson. Good point. We'll give that angle some play first. I've got an address on Chantre. Bolin quickly gave it. It's good, Stryker. According to the M15 files, Chantre has lived there for the past six years when he's been in country. I'm finished here for now. The streets are getting tight for any kind of continued engagement with Karen Tot's forces. I don't think I'd find anything more regarding Chantre or the people he's allied with. I'm convinced Todd is on the outside looking in this operation. Agreed. Todd doesn't fit the profile of the players we're turning up. The man is too greedy to work with others. How soon can I get a plane to London? Make your way to Singapore, and there'll be one waiting for you. Price glanced at the computer monitor and saw Kurtzman accessing the available information on Dean J. Chantre from National Security Agency files. And I'm having Kissinger and Grimaldi meet you at Heathrow. I'm getting a definite feeling that the other shoe is about to drop. Yeah, I've got the same itch. Tell them I'll see them there. Stay hard, Barb. You do the same. Price lifted the receiver again and put the wheels in motion in Singapore. When she was finished, a handful of minutes later, she noticed the excitement in Kurtzman's eyes when the big man regarded the screen. I got it. I got a name that links the people we've turned up. Price looked at the screen. Churchill, Swain, M. Who is he? I got a query running through the CIA files right now. Kurtzman sat with his elbows resting on the wheelchair arms, his fingers steepled under his chin. Suddenly the monitor flickered and access denied printed across the screen. Damn! Time to reload. Stony Man has continued on the next CD. The sight of the two hard men in three-piece suits making their way through the crowded airport terminal toward Maria Alfaro and himself banished all thoughts of jet lag from Calvin James's mind. He felt naked without weapons. Even the Randall combat knife had been left inside the Lear because there was no way to get it through customs. Alfaro was at his side, her eyes hidden by mirrored sunglasses. It's all right. They'd stopped over in Atlanta long enough to make clothing purchases while they waited at the jet. 
The DEA agent wore a navy blue dress with white trim and had taken hours of fatigue and worry from her features with makeup. James was dressed in slacks, a dark turtleneck, and a sport jacket. He'd salvaged the strings from his boots before throwing them away and now had a pair of knotted garrots in his pocket that didn't leave him entirely defenseless. Miss Alvarez. James picked up the telltale bulge under the man's left arm, despite the special tailoring. Yes? You will come with us, please. Of course. James stayed close to the woman. Once they left the shelter of the airport terminal and walked into the parking lot out front, the noonday sun beat down on them. The passports had been another surprise and had appeared without photos with the clothing. The co-pilot had taken their pictures and developed them on board while they flew to LaGuardia, then slipped them expertly into the passports that were already prepared for them. New York and British customs people hadn't blinked an eye at them. The first man led the way to a black limousine double parked in front of a row of cars. The second man brought up the rear. James walked beside Alfaro, trying to read their current situation from her face. She was a confused lady, he knew that, but whether she was clever enough to pull off her present scam was another matter. The lead man opened the rear door. A man leaned out from the back seat. A fringe of white hair encircled his bald head. Get in, get in. Traffic is going to be terrible at this time of the day. Alfaro got in first, taking a seat beside the old man, who patted her hand affectionately. It's really good to see you again, my dear. She brushed her lips across his cheek. One of the hard men got in first, taking a seat on the bench opposite the old man and Alfaro. James took the unspoken hint and crawled in after. The other man sat like a bookend beside him. Their shoulders touched. The old man lifted a phone. Let's go. They coasted toward the front entrance to the airport. Alfaro's contact turned his attention to James. The Phoenix Force member tried a tentative smile and sorted through everything he'd been briefed about Carlisle Johnson. I'd heard there was an unfortunate accident. I was told Mr. Johnson wouldn't be joining us? He isn't. So this is one of the people who have been covertly working against us? Yes. Marvelous. Before James could do more than slightly shift his weight, readying for the coil of reflex that would aid him in his attempted escape, the men leaned in on either side of him. The man on James's right thrust the barrel of a small automatic against James's neck. At ease, mate. You don't want to get your bloody head shot off. Now do you? James froze. Something to help you sleep. Don't want you getting all flustered on us later. A sharp jabbing sensation bit into James's left arm. <laughs> He never saw the needle. Whatever was in the hypo worked quickly. His vision began to blur in seconds. The last thing he saw before slipping into unconsciousness was Alfaro's face swimming before him. There was no trace of remorse. Leo Turin wasn't a morning person, and he'd skipped a lot of breakfasts over the years by choice. Liborio Parella, on the other hand, was very much a morning person, and had already read the newspaper and drunk a pot of coffee before Turin heaved himself out of bed at what he considered to be the ungodly hour of six o'clock a.m. Personal conversation relating directly to Turin's reason for being there was sparse. Evidently, the old man had lost none of his caginess about his current operation, and was satisfied enough with his part in it that he didn't feel it necessary to brag. Turin had contented himself with an assortment of fruits and skipped the breads and meats. Perella spread a good table and didn't mind sharing. It was served outside on a large deck overlooking the Gulf of Mexico and the boathouse. His men came in and ate with him on shifts, exchanging pleasantries, sports speculations, and gossip the way any family would. As long as they showed the proper amount of respect, of course. Besides Perella and Turin, Dan Canary was the only person to sit through the entire meal. The man came and went, though, with a cup of hot chocolate in his hand. After each return, he neglected to ask Perella's forgiveness, which offended the old mafioso. Turin noticed Perella's cold stares toward the younger man, as did several of the long-time associates of the old man's organization. That Perella didn't chastise Canary was silent testimony to the fact that Canary was a highly prized asset. Turin was also intrigued by the concern that visibly darkened Canary's features. The man had developed a habit of repeatedly cleaning his glasses while staring into the distance. Turin learned that two other men, computer technicians and operators, had access to the electronically coded cards that allowed entrance to Canary's cybernetic fortress. 
Neither of them truly fitted in with Perella's people either, and Turin figured them for strictly a support group for Canary's computer hardware. When Canary excused himself and left the house on some unspecified business, Turin waited patiently and kept an eye on Harvey Minter, a soft-looking man in a white lab coat who obviously would rather have taken breakfast by himself. The technician was finished eating in fifteen minutes. As the guy left the table, Turin excused himself to Perella and followed. Hey. Minter stopped and turned at the door, his shoulders hunching even more as he tensed. Minter, right? The man nodded. Turin put on a smile, turned up the kilowatts behind it, and dropped an arm across the other man's shoulders. He could feel Minter squirm at his touch, but the man didn't try to get away. I saw that system Dan the man has in his office. I figured you helped him set it up. Yes. Turin led the guy out onto the landscaped lawn toward the outbuilding where he was evidently housed. I've been talking to some of the families back home, telling them they should get with the times, you know. Computers are really where it's at. You push a button, those things do the work of 900 men. It's really not that easy. Oh, jeez, sure, sure it's not that easy for guys like me. I'm all thumbs, but the families, they'd be interested in a guy like you who knows his way around this computer-whacking stuff. Uh, you mean hacking? Uh, yeah, right, that, that's what I said, hacking. Anyway, I was thinking, when I get back home, I'd like to mention your name to a few of the old men. Maybe you could do some referrals for us. You know, guys who'd be good enough to do the work that needs to be done. You'd be well paid for your time. A gleam of avarice entered Minter's eyes. Consultation work is very expensive, Mr... Money's no object when we're getting quality stuff, right? Very few people understand that. When I get back, I'm going to be in touch with you. Turin shook hands with the man and turned back to the main house. He had Minter's door card in his left palm. Besides playing cops and robbers while he'd been in deep, there had been all kinds of opportunities to learn other skills. Perella was still out on the deck when he went back in. The breakfast crowd had thinned, and house security was more concerned with the outside perimeters than with the inside ones. Turin got to Canary's door without being seen. Kurtzman had given him courses over the years, and his own experience in the Justice Department had schooled him in various aspects of computer systems. <sighs> You're getting too old for this shit, Leo. He dialed one of the numbers he had for Stony Man Farm. Even later, when Perella got the phone bill, he wouldn't be able to trace the call to its destination. Kurtzman. Me. I broke into the computer systems here. Don't know what's available to you, but get in there and find out. Don't stop the window shop. I'm working on borrowed time here. I'm on it. Screen after screen of warped images flashed across the computer monitor. Turin couldn't keep up with it. Didn't try. What? Dan Canary burst into the room with a forty-five clenched in a white-knuckled fist. You're one dead son of a bitch! Turin believed him. <sighs> David McCarter came out of the sea on the solitaire island's eastern side with the sun at his back. Three members of the SEAL Team Strike Force Price had arranged followed him. Despite using the swimmer delivery vehicle to push in from the submarine six miles out, they'd still had to swim the last mile while towing gear. McCarter was winded from the unfamiliar activity, but tried not to show it. Two more SEALs ran in from the shoreline, making their way easily through the short rocky beach that managed a brief existence before the jungle reclaimed the land. They dragged a plastic sled behind them, piled with tied-down gear. Two of the SEALs with McCarter split off and helped their teammates drag the ordnance into the brush and conceal it. As McCarter scanned the tree-filled horizon, he reflected that Calvin James would have felt right at home about now. The thought brought morbid speculation to his mind. James was still out there among the missing. Sir! McCarter looked up and saw Forbes, his second in this unit, holding a bundle in one hand. Aboard the USS Spearfish during the briefing on the tactical op designed by Price and Katz, Sir was the only title assigned to McCarter and Cizo and Manning. Used to covert operations around the globe, the SEAL team commanders and their warriors hadn't had any questions. The mission bore the presidential seal of approval. Throw it here, mate. Forbes tossed the bundle. McCarter caught it easily, dropped it long enough to strip out of his wetsuit and tanks, then crept with it to the top of the hill. Forbes gathered McCarter's discarded attire and hauled it to the community burial pit two of the men were digging with combat knives. At the top of the hill, McCarter sat naked for a few minutes, letting the wind dry him. In the distance, he could just make out the blue-tiled tops of Webb August's private compound.
He looked north and saw part of the crescent-shaped harbor fronting the house. Two pleasure crafts were in motion, streaming white-capped waves in their wake. McCarter took the Bausch and Lomb binoculars from his bundle and scanned the turquoise waters. Manning was out there somewhere, he knew, backed by another SEAL team. They'd be using rebreathers, so they wouldn't be noticed as they mined the area. Kurtzman had sent a collection of geographical and topographical maps, as well as dozens of satellite pictures taken of Webb August's little island kingdom. While reviewing those, Manning had chanced upon a discovery that would be a definite surprise to August and his people. Sweeping the field glasses southward, McCarter locked in on the large sheet metal hangar that housed at least two helicopters, a Learjet, and possibly the F-A-18 Hornet that had shot down the DEA agents off the coast of Florida. <sighs> The small warehouse well back of the main house was a puzzle. Constant surveillance seemed to be kept over the structure, but there were no clues as to what it held. Enciso and his team would be removing the mystery there, though. McCarter's part of the operation would be to knock down the aerial alarm of August's defenses before it could be brought into play. Satisfied with the preliminary recon, he dressed quickly. The team was outfitted with jungle camos, streaked their faces and hands with green and black combat cosmetics, and wore jungle hats. He pulled on the tough hiking boots and wiggled his toes in appreciation of being warm and dry again. By the time he draped the military webbing over his body, slid the spare Browning High Power into his shoulder holster, and took up the H&K MP5 SD3 he'd chosen as his lead weapon, the five SEALs were waiting behind him. He slipped on his aviator sunglasses, looked at the collection of hard young faces around him, and grinned. I've got no locker room speech for you, lads. We're here to kick some ass, so let's go get it done. Yes, sir. McCarter took the lead, and they came down off the hill as smooth as oil sitting on water and as deadly as an avalanche. Sitting in the passenger seat of the SH-3 Sea King, Katz compared the notes he'd made on the topographical map of the island with what he saw. It was his first personal look at the area. The island was roughly nine square miles. It sprouted up from the seabed with no real beach areas. The lagoon area, where the harbor had been built, was roughly 40 feet deep. Katz checked, but there was no sign of Manning or his small demolitions force. He moved on. The main house was a two-story affair that literally sprawled across almost 1,500 square yards. A half dozen outbuildings encircled the house. Beneath the white paint were cinder block walls that would withstand a fair amount of shelling. Nine-foot high electrified fences set the compound apart from the jungle that seemed poised to devour the landscaped area at the slightest show of weakness. The warehouse was next, almost hidden in the blur of trees and foliage surrounded by wire fencing. Nothing about it had been mentioned in any of the data they'd received. Damn it. An eerie feeling crept along Katz's spine. August had gone to pains to ensure that his little empire was defensible and together. The only reason the Israeli could think of why August would move the warehouse away from the main buildings was that the man was afraid of what was inside it. Katz lowered the field glasses as the island's civilized area drifted out of view. From the facts and figures they had access to, the compound housed about 150 men. The sealed ground teams in the area had been limited to 30 men, five teams of six. They were there to soften up the compound's defensive structure and pave the way for an amphibious assault group culled from the ranks of an American Marine amphibious force from the landing craft utility stationed in hiding at another island 20 clicks away. Cats would lead those troops into the open throat of the harbor when the time was right. Once free of the island perimeters, the chopper pilot started a lazy circle that would take them back to the Spearfish and the LCU. Barbara Price pulled her yellow Fiat to a halt in front of the tall gate at the end of the curving road leading to CIA headquarters. Sunlight gleamed on the razored wire loops, crowning the ten-foot chain-link fence. The sentry inside the guardhouse on the other side of the gate was garbed in a military uniform, but Price knew enough about company operations to know the man wasn't military. He peered at her through the gate and waved to a companion to cover him as he approached the sports car. Your name, ma'am? Price. I'm here to see Ronald Jeffries. Price. Price. Ah, here you are. I'm going to have to ride with you. Sorry about the inconvenience, ma'am, but... It's policy to let no one from another agency onto the grounds without an escort. I've been here before. Yes, ma'am. Price drove with both hands on the wheel. 
The past few hours had limped by as the players had moved into position. The whole time the Stony Man teams had been in transit, she'd expected Swain Churchill to implement another wave of whatever operation he'd concocted that would threaten their effectiveness. Timing was critical now, and things could very easily slide either way. As she drove through the wooded hills leading to the CIA's main buildings, she thought about Calvin James, wondering if he was skirting the outer perimeters of danger or had slid down into the depths. Kurtzman's call regarding Leo Turin's capture and perhaps his death had reached her en route to Langley. Even with Charlie Mott and his team in the area, she'd resisted the impulse to send in the Stony Man stormtroopers. If a rescue attempt was launched, Churchill and his forces would know how quickly and quietly Stony Man was slipping the noose into place. She hoped Turin and James were all right, hoped that she wouldn't be wrong in thinking that if Churchill or his people wanted them dead, it would already be too late to save them. It was hard putting the operation above the lives of those men, especially since they were her friends. But she felt she had no choice. Churchill and his operation had to be deep-sixed all at once, not fragmented, but completely destroyed, so that it couldn't rise up from its own ashes at a later date. It hadn't helped that Brignola had agreed with her call. Every one of those warriors knew a time might come when he had to give up his life in the name of freedom. The parking lot covered more than 20 acres. The main building was seven stories tall, grim and forbidding, with wire mesh covered windows recessed into the concrete walls. On the building's right was an auditorium under a domed roof. There's Jeffries. He's in that gunmetal gray sedan. You can get out here. Yes, ma'am. Price pulled to a halt with Jeffries on the passenger side of the car. Jeffries was a long, lean man, sporting outdated sideburns the color of burnished copper under a dark salt-and-pepper mop of hair that covered the tops of his ears. He wore glasses that slightly magnified his lizard-green eyes. The brown suit was off the rack, but it hung on him well. Long time no see, Barb. I could have lasted a few more years without this little reunion. Ouch. The lady never forgives. Never. So what do you want? The private file on Swain Churchill. I don't know what you're talking about. Bullshit. You might have those files sewn up, but I've got some contacts who have let me know you were the guy responsible for Churchill's operations while he was with the company. You mean about a dozen other people? No. You. Those other people were pawns in your games. Cannon fodder you used to keep suspicion from yourself while you played with Panama and the Contras and toyed with the arms for hostage trade-off in the Middle East. We'll handle Churchill. You've got my word on that. Your word's not good enough. It never was. I learned the hard way. You still hold that against me, Barb? Christ, that was years ago. And Hoskins and Delamer are just as dead. I was responsible for them. I had to tell Hoskins' wife he wasn't coming home. Had to know his three children had lost their father because I trusted you. You betrayed me on that mission. Opened up graves for those two men and poured them right in. Betrayed is a strong word. Not nearly strong enough. If it was me, I'd have it engraved on your headstone. You were always one stone-cold bitch. Gotten colder and harder these past few years. You fuck with me now, you're gonna look as if you ended up on the wrong end of an argument with an 18-wheeler. You think you're big enough to take me, Barb? <sighs> with one arm tied behind my back and my dress on fire. Price reached into her purse. Jeffries didn't flinch. He knew she didn't carry a gun, and he knew why. She passed him a letter. Read it and weep, you son of a bitch. Taking the envelope, Jeffries opened it and read it quickly. The presidential seal showed dark through the paper. He glared at her over the top of the sheet. You've got this kind of pull? You sealed Churchill's files when he left the company, and you've deflected every attempt I've made to access those files since last night. Now you either play ball with me, or I'm going to break your bat, send you home, and take what I want anyway. Go inside. My office. He flipped a plastic ID badge onto the passenger seat. Ask for Paige Bass. She can access the files for you. Who the hell are you working for? I didn't believe it when I was told you dropped out of intelligence circles, but I never expected you to come up with this kind of clout. I can't tell you, Ronald. If I did, I'd have to kill you. Special Agent Paige Bass was a petite brunette who was dwarfed by Ronald Jeffries' massive desk. 
She adjusted her glasses, then returned her attention to the monitor in front of her while her hands moved confidently across the keyboard. She was dressed conservatively in a gray business suit and maroon blouse. There was something about her behavior and stance that made Price think she'd once been military. Swain Churchill was released from agency employment in 1977 during the Carter administration cutbacks under Admiral Stansfield Turner. Barbara Price nodded. The so-called Halloween Massacre had reduced the agency's covert operations directorate by two-thirds. Churchill hadn't been the only agent to be turned out onto the street, nor had he been the only one to go bad afterward. Of course, unemployment didn't sit well with Churchill, and he knew a lot of people and even more secrets. I assume there was no corporate security job in his future. According to Agent Jeffrey's field reports, Churchill moved directly into freelancing his skills. A face materialized on the monitor, and Price studied it. This is Churchill? Yes. The man was in his early fifties. Iron-gray hair framed a once-square face that was beginning to sag. Personal stats put Churchill at 6'4", 270 pounds. Of course, the agency didn't completely cut Churchill loose at once. For a time, most of his freelance operations were geared around CIA missions. He was a good person to contact for help in or out of a dozen countries. He was networking. Yes, I'm backing up a disc for your later use. Agent Jeffries wasn't too happy about that. He didn't hide it well, either. Yes, well, that's understandable. Agent Jeffries became a large target for departmental blame when it appeared that Churchill had gone rogue. Jeffries closed the files off? Yes, and he was given the assignment of terminating Churchill back in 1985 because he was believed to have known the man better than anyone else here. In 1987, Jeffries caught up with Churchill in Buenos Aires. There was a brief gun battle that left Jeffries' partner dead and Jeffries himself wounded. How did Jeffries find Churchill? Churchill was involved with the cartels at that time. At first, it was just security operations. But by 1987, it was Jeffrey's opinion that Churchill was organizing some of the drug distribution routes and hamstringing DEA and U.S. Customs operations through contacts he had on the payroll in the CIA. You know for sure that Churchill was buying off agents from the company? Yes. We aren't the only organization that's been corrupted by Churchill's machinizations, Ms. Price. There have been documented cases involving the FBI, Dade County, and Metro law enforcement personnel, the U.S. military during Operation Just Cause, and a number of others. The files are all available in the materials I'm giving you today. Understood. I didn't mean to ruffle any feathers here. Churchill is a sensitive topic inside these walls. The agency birthed a monster, and it's hard to accept. I've put together a file on Churchill's operations. From the look of things, it's widespread. Global. We've discovered that as well. During the past few years, Churchill has been involved with a number of things. The cartels, of course. He's also designed and contracted executions, as well as brokering for the killers who fulfilled them. He's well known in smuggling circles. For a while, he was working with Gaddafi, supplying arms and trainers for the Libyan military. There was even some talk that he was arranging the sale of a nuclear weapon to Gaddafi. We've got other trace intelligence that Churchill and his organization have been involved in African affairs. Wherever there's been money to be made by turning a dirty deal, Churchill seems to have been there. He's a devious man. Very clever. The fact that he's been able to put together everything he has, depending on whether he really is the man you're looking for regarding the global drug trafficking action, tells you volumes about the man's abilities and desires. Moral judgment isn't something you look for in an agent involved constantly in ballistic involvement. In Churchill's case, his sense of morality may be so low as to be practically non-existent. Do you know where Churchill is now? No, Jeffries hasn't been close to Churchill since 1987. But there are rumors that he may have recently moved his home operations to England. He seems to have preferred a European theater during his agency days. And England is one country where he could blend in. Between his college days and his early hitch with the agency, he spent a dozen years there. Price thought about Dean Chantre and the England connection the Stony Man teams had already turned up. They had Webb August and Perella and the banking systems, thanks to Leo, but the missing freighter, the Bama Town Lady, remained a mystery, as well as the whereabouts of Swain Churchill. She wanted to make a clean sweep of things, but the operation might have to run ragged after all, she didn't try to delude herself into thinking Churchill wasn't aware of the covert force breathing down his neck. No matter what the man's own plans were, he'd have to start kicking numbers into play himself to buy himself some running room. And Price knew that yardage was going to be measured in lives.
Seated in the reserved section of the racetrack, Swain Churchill glanced at the electronic tote board, then at his companion. Yuri Zubarov, ex-general of the defunct Soviet war machine, was familiar with democracy and free enterprise. Lately, he was firmly entrenched in learning about the excesses permitted under both systems. Today's lesson was being attended at Epsom Downs. I have received a tip. Zubarov pointed at the line of horses and jockeys clad in colorful silks. See the four horse? Churchill looked. He had more on his mind than a damn horse race, but he couldn't let that show to the Russian. He preferred that things go quietly to hell while he still had a chance to recoup some of the potential losses. After all, he'd seen nothing to suggest that the situation wasn't salvageable, provided he found out where all the pressure was coming from and neutralized it damn quick. He'd worked too long and too hard to lose it all at this point. Zubarov was easily 70 pounds overweight. He hadn't been in such shape while in Soviet employ, but he discovered another excess early on, which hadn't agreed with his physique. The man's double chins quivered in excitement as he spoke. There is some speculation that the four-horse, cannon shot, has been held back in her last three races, nudging into second or third, but not going for the win. Her owners want her to take her first checkered flag here, today. The horse looked brown and hairy to Churchill, like all the other animals walking into the starting gate. The only things that set her apart were the pink and green riding silks on her saddle and jockey. The odds on the tote board showed cannon shot at four to one. Churchill didn't think that many of the other track enthusiasts had heard the same rumor, and if they had, they were apparently discounting it. At those odds, it will take quite an investment to make any real money. That's why you wanted the cash brought? Yes. You have your connections here. If I were to move around the amount of money I plan to invest here today, I would be noticed. My money's come from outside the United Kingdom. Yours don't. I thought it would be no trouble arranging a loan while I am here. No trouble at all. Churchill wiggled a finger at one of the four bodyguards who'd followed them into the stands. The man passed over a briefcase. Opening the briefcase in his lap, Churchill displayed the neatly ranked bundles of money inside. Will you want to count it? No, my friend, I trust you. If I did not, we wouldn't have been associates all these years. Zubarov got to his feet, taking the handle of the briefcase. Yeah, I must go. They will be closing the betting windows for this race soon. Yes. I wish you luck, General. Are you sure you will not stay? I've got things to do. Another time, perhaps. Of course. I will see you later, then. This evening at your home for the strategies meeting. I'll be looking forward to it. Churchill watched Zubarov waddle away, then made his own way toward the exit. His bodyguards accompanied him while the Russians stayed behind. He missed the days when he had put his life on the line for his country, surviving only by his wits and skill. But his country had deserted him, left him with a burning need for vengeance. Now he wanted his independence of the United States in a way that let them know he no longer needed them either. He'd been good at his job and they'd never recognized that worth. As an agent, he knew how to get things done, knew the people to talk to and the kind of deals he could cut before he even went to the table. The money he'd taken through illicit dealings shouldn't have mattered. His superiors had never had any proof, and most of that cash he'd used as a war chest to further his country's interests. The deals with the narco barons had fallen into his lap, and the money involved had been too much to walk away from. When there wasn't a patriotic need throbbing inside him, successes could always be measured in cash. He'd learned to take solace in that, and learned to take pleasure in the amount of power he could wield. Churchill climbed into the cockpit of the Executive Bell helicopter and belted himself in. The interior of the craft was luxurious. It should have been. He'd paid millions for it. Mr. Churchill. Yes. Thought you might want to know the General's horse came in. Churchill nodded, reflecting on how egotistical the Russian would be tonight. Some days it was a pain handling all of the prima donna personalities and the trafficking empires that he juggled and managed. It had taken years to get the mix right, to bring the drug trade so close to consolidation. Of course, not everyone had fallen sway to his sales ability. Luis Costanza had been living proof of that. But he had other ways of dealing with those people. Despite the satisfactory strides he'd made in closing the partnerships, there was a list of people he knew he'd begin quietly replacing as the opportunities presented themselves. 
Once he had key people in all the places that he needed them, the drug conglomerate he'd forged would be unstoppable. But that lay in the future. For now, he had to look out for the present. The covert teams he'd traced in California, Colombia, and China hadn't yet been identified, and they seemed in danger of becoming a full-blown threat. Even Sentac, as quiet as that unit's operations were, had been charted. These groups were deadly and unknown. While most of the international law enforcement agencies were puzzled over what was going on, those groups seemed hell-bent on triangulating him. If he'd had another 24 hours, it wouldn't have mattered. The helicopter swept south, away from the city. Churchill took out a mobile phone and flipped it open. Yes? Is this a secure line? No. Right. We've got a problem. What is it? Your jacket at the company got pulled. By whom? A woman named Barbara Price. I don't know her. You wouldn't. She works so deep in the intelligence infrastructure that maybe a dozen people knew what she did a few years ago. And whom does she work for now? I don't know. I've been digging all morning only to get slapped back out of nowhere. Whoever she's working with, she's got the presidency here in a big, big way. Keep looking. If she's connected with the people burning up my back trail, I want her taken down. He seethed inside, on edge because of the lost sleep over the past few days and the tension of not knowing what was coming next. The operation had been planned to the last detail, and it had been executed perfectly. Less than 24 hours had passed since the first aggressive shot had been fired. A number of the necessary people had already been removed from the playing field, and a deadly undercurrent had been starting among the drug traffickers independent of his consortium. He was allowing the next 12 hours for them, aided by police retribution, to weaken one another to the point that his people could walk in easily and take over. The shipment to Houston was hours too late to be an effective deterrent to the retaliation he was feeling. But he hadn't wanted to risk the freighter's discovery before it was necessary. That would have definitely tipped his hand. He flipped the cellular phone open again and dialed his own number. Greco. What have you found out about our guest? Nothing. Every time I send a computer inquiry about his real identity, I get zilch back. The NCIC files confirm him to be Carlisle Johnson. The FBI files say he's Carlisle Johnson. The Illinois penal authorities even say he's Carlisle Johnson. I'm beginning to think we were wrong and he really is Carlisle Johnson. He's not. I've met Johnson. The man's a player, and I want him identified. Oh, I've got a fingerprint to go on. I've nearly exhausted all of my stateside contacts. Exhaust them. Then take your search farther afield. If this guy's a player, then he might have a record in Russia or Germany that hasn't been covered over with false information. Stay with it. Something will break. We could always kill him and toss his body into the open, then wait and see who comes along to claim him. No, not as long as he could be valuable alive. Have you been in touch with Canary at Perella's estate? Yeah, he's still got a big question mark on his guy, too. As far as he knows, the guy really is Leo Turin. Sure, the old guy knows him personally. No trouble with the ID. Canary just can't figure out how the hell Turin figures into everything. Has he had any luck tracing the call Turin made from the house? No, Canary followed it up. But the trail petered out somewhere in Quincy, Massachusetts. He's sitting on Turin at the house, keeping him under lock and key. Perella wants to take Turin out, give him a pair of concrete overshoes, and use him for an underwater decoration in his harbor. Get a message to Perella from me. Tell him I said to leave Turin the hell alone until I figure out what I want to do with him. How is Alfaro acting? She spent most of her time up in her room with a private cocaine stash. As a precaution, I had her weapons taken away from her. Personally, I think we should go ahead and deep sex it like we were planning. She's outlived her usefulness, even off the Johnson assignment. No. Perhaps she really is as bent as she professes to be. If so, she could still prove valuable, at least for a while. He'd seen her shortly after her arrival and had been intrigued by the woman on a number of levels, not the least of which was sexual in nature. She looked like a woman in whose eyes he could see himself, see how powerful he was becoming. As an undercover agent, Alfaro had learned how to see through bluster and ego from petty cartel dictators like Cota. He wanted to know how she saw him. She knows who you are now. So she never leaves our sight. I don't see a problem, do you? No, sir. London moved off against the horizon as the woodlands took over the ground beneath the helicopter again. With the freighter still hours from its destination, there was only one thing Churchill could do. And when it came to bluffing, he considered himself one of the best in the business. 
especially when it was only half a bluff. I knew that bastard! I was there when Swain Churchill was given his walking papers. I knew then we shouldn't have just let him go so easily. There were so many things he knew, too many people he was involved with, too much he had access to. Brignola waited for the man's anger to subside. He thought the president looked grayer and more wan than he'd ever seen him. It hadn't been an easy year. I've talked with a number of other world leaders. They all view this as an American problem that's threatening them. We're supposed to do something about it. We are! Brignola gazed at the silent TV in the recessed wall area. On screen was a scene from the United Nations floor. It didn't take much effort to deduce what the subject matter was. When the news clips of various strikes against international law enforcement agencies during the past 24 hours started flashing across the screen, all mystery was gone. I know we are, but I can't tell them what we're doing. Your people work best because no one knows about... I can't very well say, look, you don't have to worry about this anymore because I've unleashed this covert force to find whoever's responsible for all the killings. And have him help us if they find out strikers involved. He would have dealt himself in anyway. You know that, and I know that. They know that, too. I'm not trying to make excuses or formulate some sort of denial. I won't give any of those men short shrift, and you know that. Yes, sir. I just wish there was more we could do. We know who we're looking for now. That's more than we had 24 hours ago. I know. But I have to ask myself if that's enough. Sir, with all due respect... You'd have to look damn hard to find anyone who could do the work these people can do. They've been pushing themselves at top speed ever since this can of worms was spilled out onto us. I know. But at this point, we have to consider that even they may fail. Churchill was always a crude and canny son of a bitch. Price is working on some leads. Turin and Able Team turned up Churchill's banking operations. And wherever the money is, you can always bet you'll find bastards like these close by. The president reached to his desktop and retrieved the remote control. He aimed it at the set and punched a button. The scene depicting the United Nations cleared, shifting to a young man wearing an ear-throat headset. Mr. President. Yes? There's a satellite communication link up incoming. Who is it? He says his name is Swain Churchill. He said you'd know him. Put him on, Mr. Daniels. Yes, sir. Do you want to return the video portion of the transmission or the audio only? Both. Brignola scooped up the phone from the desk and dialed his special Stonyman number. Guardsman. There's an audio and video uplink coming here now from Churchill. Get a trace on it. I'm on it. The television screen cleared. Swain Churchill, dressed in an expensive suit and looking totally relaxed, sitting in a high-backed office chair, looked back at them. Ah, Harold Brognola. I've been wondering whatever became of you. For the moment, Brignola said nothing, hoping Kurtzman's computers were equal to the task of tracing the satellite transmission. What do you want? The president stepped toward the video camera mounted on top of the television. To bring you up to speed on a few things. I know you've got a headhunting team burning up my back trail. I want you to call them off. No. Oh, just hear me out. I know by now that you've figured out what I have going on. Consolidation of the drug empires is nothing compared to what's been transpiring around the world in the past few years. Who would have believed that the Berlin Wall would have fallen? Who would have thought that the Soviet communist government actually would go down? Like the singer says, the times they are a-changing, and the drug trade is changing along with them. You won't get away with this. Churchill stood and paced, arms behind his back, and his smile locked securely in place. On the contrary, I've already gotten away with it. Brignola hung back, mentally counting the number of seconds Kurtzman was getting to work on the trace. Let me clue you in on something. The drug trade isn't something you can get rid of. It's here to stay. I was trying to point that out to the boys at Langley years ago. It's a tool, I told them, and you should learn to use it like one. Now there's all this bullshit about the war on drugs. Well, if there is, you sanctimonious pricks are setting yourselves up to lose it. No matter what you do, no matter how bad you make the consequences for the people who use them, the drug trade is going to do business. You know what puts businesses into the graveyard? A lack of interest in the product being offered. When was the last time you saw a super-secret decoder ring? What are you getting out of this? Rich... What else is there? I tried that life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness line once before. It, it didn't work out. Do you know the kind of political upheaval you've caused internationally? 
Sure, that was all planned ahead of time. The noise Japan and the other countries are making about pulling out of their economic ties with the U.S. is rubbish. They'd be nothing without this country. The U.S. has allowed them to define themselves for decades. That's not going to change. You sound like a man who's convinced he can start an avalanche, then get in front of it and beat it safely to the ground. Look, there are untold billions of dollars cycling through the U.S. economy from the drug trade. It provides jobs, housing, and upkeep for a number of families, not to mention a respite from how pathetic and unfulfilling life can be in general. Those people employed in trafficking in turn support other people. Grocers, carpenters, shoe salesmen. The list is infinite. If you could eradicate the drug trade completely, think about the possible economic backlash that could come of it. How would the American economy hold up if all that money was taken out overnight? That's an invalid argument. Is it? I don't think so. What about the personal losses families incur every day because of drug use? There are losses in every aspect of living. Insurance agents can tell you that. They have little printouts that can tell you exactly how risky your profession, your home life, and your hobbies are. People die. It's a fact of life. I'm not here to argue semantics with you, nor am I here to argue over my ability to do what I say I've done. I've done it. I'm talking to you to let you know your options at this point. The people you have assigned to me are good, but not undefeatable. You should think about saving them while you still can. I already have two of them in my custody. Say the word, and they can die right now. Brignola felt a chill race across the back of his neck. Turin shared a history with him that went back years. Calvin James was a friend, a young man with his whole life ahead of him. He didn't want to lose either one of them. I don't know what you're talking about. Churchill resumed his seat in the high-backed chair. Of course you don't. Are you familiar with a drug called psilocybin? It's a hallucinogen of some sort. I'm surprised you remembered. Churchill looked at Brignola. I can see you've drawn a blank. Brignola nodded, anything to keep the man talking and buy Kurtzman more time. Psilocybin was a byproduct of research the agency paid for in the late 1950s. It was derived from the seeds of the Piule plant. Aztec priests called it Teonanoctal. Loosely translated, it means God's flesh. A CIA agent named Sidney Gottlieb did the preliminary studies on psilocybin and found out that it was a hallucinogen that caused extreme paranoia in the people who were subjected to it. I found out about it because an agency research scientist, Wayne Matthews, had an interest in it. Matthews and I shared similar views on the drug problems of the 70s. To make a long story short, Matthews found a way to make a super psilocybin in the late 80s. At that time, he was working for me. Brignola jotted the man's name down for quick reference when he contacted Price later. Feel free to check it out. In fact, I'll fax you a file on it, minus incriminating evidence, of course, and you can look it over in your leisure. By the time I had Matthews in my employ, I was already well underway consolidating the various drug trafficking agencies. And from a business standpoint, I wanted to be in the position to offer my clientele something unique. Something only we could give them. We thought we had it. Unfortunately, that didn't turn out to be the case at all. What are you getting at? Patience. I can't make it that short. Despite Matthew's repeated efforts, the drug was doomed to failure. It's highly potent, sinks right into the nervous system, but it activates an intense fight-or-flight reaction. The subjects became homicidal within minutes after ingesting the drug. Their adrenal systems went into overdrive, and they had no concept of reality. I once saw a man take a full clip, 30 rounds of 308s, and remain standing. He was reduced to bloody rags, his heart punched completely out of his body, but he lived long enough to seriously injure the man who'd killed him. Another drawback of the drug was that once it was in the system, the effects were lasting. The person subjected to it never quite made it back to reality. Unfortunately, we didn't know exactly how lasting. One subject lived for 17 months before she escaped, and we had to kill her. Now, with having to be on the move constantly, we no longer have the luxury of observing what we've wrought. I suppose there's some purpose to this little fable. Of course there is. We also discovered Matthew's version of psilocybin could be wedded to cocaine without visible trace. Brignola's blood ran cold as the ramifications dropped into his mind. Yes, 
I see Brignola has grasped the possibilities. The president glanced at Brignola. Gentlemen, call your dogs off. All they'll do is eventually die fighting the machine I've put together and create a certain amount of unpleasantness for me. But they'll do no lasting harm. And if you don't see your way fit to save them, let me add a final trump card. Churchill leaned forward and winked conspiratorially. At this moment, scattered across the United States, there are caches of cocaine laced with psilocybin ready to be put out on the streets when I send out the word. Get those people pulled back now, or I'll make that phone call. And by nightfall, you're going to be covered over by the first in the worst series of mass slayings you could ever imagine. And it will last for weeks. I'll give you three hours. Then if I see or hear from those people again, we'll let the shit hit the fan and see what shakes loose. The transmission ended abruptly and Churchill's face faded from the screen. Mr. President, our fax machines are receiving a transmission now regarding a Dr. Wayne Matthews. When it's finished, send it up. Yes, sir. Brignola was already on the phone. Price. Me. You're on speaker with the President. Sorry, Mr. President. Hal, we missed him. Aaron couldn't make his way through all the cutouts Churchill's programmers had set up. Ah. His thoughts flickered to James and Turin, as well as the other people who would be hurt by whatever moves they made next. I intercepted the fax transmission and I ran Matthews myself. Churchill was giving it to you straight. Matthews was agency once, and he did lab work on the mind-controlled drugs experimented with in the 50s. And he was listed as an employee of a company that I turned up in the bank records I ransacked from Perella's files. Don't give up on us yet. Bear's got a few moves left. Churchill's people have been trying to ID Calvin. We've got some options open to us. I've got my fingers crossed. He's given us an hour to clear the field. Let me know if you turn up anything worthwhile. The president glanced up at the clock on the wall. Three hours. Games have been won in seconds. Three hours can be 180 hellacious minutes for our side. We're due a break. Do one and getting one are two different things. Brignola nodded. He unknotted his tie and settled in for a long wait. Moving quietly, knowing a man could pick up movement with his peripheral vision even when his direct stare could see nothing, Rafael Enciso crept through the jungle surrounding the warehouse. Two Navy SEALs flanked him. He couldn't see them, couldn't detect them with any of his physical senses, but he knew they were there. The hot sun burned down on the back of his neck. The jungle smells reminded him of his early years in Cuba. He crept on, the K-Bar fighting knife held tightly in his fist. A grim watch from hidden ground had let them know only two guards circled the building. After talking with Katz, they decided to remove the mystery of the building and maintain a low profile. There seemed to be no exchange of personnel between the warehouse and the main house. And Cizo had thought it was safe to assume the operation there was self-contained. Katz had agreed. He crept to the fence, glanced at his watch as he took wire cutters out of his webbing and waited almost 40 seconds before cutting the first strand. In less than a minute, he was through. He jogged to the corner of the building, counting down in his head, and heard the first steps the guard took on his latest round. The man had gotten bored with his assignment, and Cizo took the guy before he knew an enemy had penetrated the perimeter. And Cizo dragged the body into the building with him. Leaving the corpse slumped in the front entranceway, and Cizo stepped inside the building. The K-Bar was resheathed in his harness, and the silenced Beretta was in his fist. He took cover behind a partition wall and studied the building's interior under the fluorescent track lighting. There were five rooms spread out in a half moon around him. From his position, Enzizo could at least partially see into all of them. Six men were staggered throughout the rooms. Two of them wore white lab coats and lounged around a coffee pot in a computer terminal. The other four were guards, evidently on downtime. They were seated in a room to the left, watching a videotape of last year's Super Bowl on big screen TV. One of the SEALs, outfitted in camos, slithered through a window and dropped soundlessly to the floor. The second man dropped through a roof hatch at the opposite end of the building. Both men moved into position and scanned the building until they spotted Enciso. Using hand signals they'd agreed on for the operation, Enciso exchanged information with them, confirming the number of the building's occupants as six. 
He waited for a moment, then gave them the signal to move in. The SEALs took the room with the guards. And Cizo lost them as he raced into the room with the white-coated men. He caught the first one by the collar as the guy tried to rise out of his chair. Yanking, he toppled the man to the floor on his face. The other man tried to run, but Enciso tripped him and sent him sprawling hard up against the wall of computer machinery. He showed them the Beretta, and both men raised their hands immediately. Sir? Everything's secure at this end. How about you? Got a room full of dead men here. Makes them easier to watch. Enciso glanced at the two men at his feet. Who's in charge here? Me. Who are you? Enciso followed his question with the muzzle of the 9mm. Wayne Matthews. Tell me something that's gonna make me want to keep you alive. In a halting, fear-stricken voice, Matthews did. I found the Bama Town lady. Barbara Price looked up from the computer monitor she was watching, where four windows were opened on the screen to map out the action going on in the United Kingdom, French Guiana, Florida, and Texas. Boland had been united with Grimaldi and Kissinger in London, as well as a crack SAS unit Price had arranged to be lent to the Stony Man warriors. Phoenix was standing by on Solitaire Island with the SEAL force. Charlie Mott and his people were ready to roll at a moment's notice in Tarpon Springs, and Able Team had linked up with the MACTF, Move Against Crack Task Force, covering the Houston Port Authority in their search for the missing freighter. The thing is, it's no longer called the Bama Town Lady. It's now registered as the Jolly Jack, Using the information Phoenix Force turned up with Dr. Matthews, there's no doubt about the ship's identity. Bama Town Lady disappeared after re-outfitting in Houston, then docked as the Jolly Jack in Cayenne, French Guiana. Where's the freighter now? About an hour out of Houston, Port Authority. Good work, Akira. Keep me posted on her movements. If she deviates in the slightest way, I want to know immediately. You got it. A knot uncurled in Price's stomach. When she turned back to Kurtzman, she noticed the slight smile on the big man's face at once. Aaron? Oh, I'm reeling it in now. The last series of false files I slipped into international and domestic intelligence circles under Calvin's name had a virus programmed into it. Took me a while to come up with something most systems wouldn't recognize as threatening. Once a file was pulled and downloaded, the virus programming followed a trail of cybernetic breadcrumbs back here. The real risk was whoever was at the other end might discover it and try to trace it back to us. He paused to scan the results listed on his monitor. From the looks of things here, the virus came home to roost with nary a scratch. You know where the queries have been originating? Yeah, near Dover, along the coastline. How about narrowing it down, big guy? Oh, hell, Barb, I can do better than that. I have the address now. Without wasted motion, Price plugged in the headset telephone jack and punched up the White House number that connected her with Brignola. Brignola! I think we have Churchill. I'm going to wait for a physical recon from Stryker before we move on it definitely, but I want to know what my options are going in, in case there's no time to ask later. We also have another bit of good news. Enciso turned up Dr. Wayne Matthews on Solitaire Island. According to Matthews, the psilocybin-laced cocaine hasn't been distributed in the United States yet. It's due to arrive in Houston within the hour. We beat their timetable. Price studied the four windows on her monitor. Hal, we've got the whole operation lined out. Churchill, the recruitment arm of the organization, the drugs that were supposed to be used to blackmail the U.S., the schematic of the operation through Pirellis Computers and the banking hub down in the Cayman Islands. We know who they are, and we know where to find them. If we move fast enough and hard enough, we can take them all out in one fell swoop. Miss Price, at this juncture, we can afford no mistakes. Duly noted, sir, but I can promise you we're only inches away from having this sucker bagged. At this point, it's your call whether we wait or we go in. Miss Price, if you have Churchill in your sights, then bring his damn house down. Yes, sir. Price broke the connection and turned to Kurtzman. Notify the teams. We've got a green light. A light rain had blown in from the west two hours earlier and hung on now as spitting mist. Mac Bolan, clad in a skin-tight black suit under a camo poncho, trained his field glasses on Swain Churchill's manor home near Dover, England. Drops of water landed on the leaves of the tall oak trees around him, occasionally splattering on the upturned collar of the poncho and sliding down his neck. He adjusted the magnification and brought the house into better focus. The estate was surrounded by a stone wall, carefully hewn and fitted together. Wrought iron decorations hung on the double gates and stood erect over each support post. The foliage was neatly trimmed back from the perimeters of the estate. 
It helped some, but the sheer thickness of the forest surrounding the dwelling prevented any possibility of being able to see someone determined to approach unobserved. Security cameras moved restlessly, floating along their own arcs and overlapping fields of coverage. Inside the stone walls, the main house occupied center stage, flanked by four outbuildings. Ivy climbed two of the walls, reaching leafy fingers all the way to the third floor. One of the outbuildings appeared to have been built at the same time as the main house. The other three had been added later, with efforts made to conform to the estate's overall appearance. Armed guards patrolled the grounds, but a number of them had taken up station around the large parking garage in back of the house. Tan canvas sheets hung in great canopies in front of the house. Uniformed caterers served the fifty-odd guests from steaming banquet tables set up under the awnings. The weather hadn't been cooperative, but Churchill had evidently decided the party had to go on. House wasn't built to hold so many people. Ruddy blokes will have to rough it if they want to continue with their festivities. Major Sid Adair, the SAS commander, was squat and powerful looking, his shoulders broad and thick, despite his near sixty years of age. He had white hair and a neatly cropped mustache that shadowed a stiff upper lip. Like Bolin, he too was dressed in a camo poncho over a black suit. Eating caviar outside and washing it down with a glass of champagne isn't exactly my idea of roughing it. John Cowboy Kissinger stood in the shadow of one of the trees, the barrel of his assault rifle pointed at the ground. Bolin continued his surveillance, marking off the names of people he confirmed from the mental list of suspected players working with Churchill. The numbers inside the estate were about what he figured they'd be from the figures Kurtzman and Price had been able to generate. So far, there had been no sign of Churchill. Forty SAS warriors were hidden in the bush surrounding the estate. They'd been there for the past half hour, lying in readiness. Two roads led to the manor house. Teams had already been stationed there to close them down when the time came. It's going to be a tough nut to crack, mate. What with the regular security crew your man Churchill has in place, his compatriots have added at least 50% in their own personal bodyguards. Bolin lowered his field glasses. That can either be an advantage or a disadvantage, Major. Fortunately, we have the choice of which it will be. I'll tell you, you've piqued my interest. Putting the binoculars away, Bolin slowly pulled back from his position, out of the line of sight of the guards watching the forest. Kissinger followed. The executioner paused under the protective shelter of a tree with broad branches. He pulled his map case from a slit pocket of the skin suit and flipped it open to the terrain maps of the estate area. Once they had the address of Churchill's stronghold, Kurtzman and Price had been able to provide a mass of documentation. Change in plans, Stryker? Not in our plans, but we're definitely going to adjust Churchill's agenda. If we attack head-on, the way we've discussed, we're going to have a number of casualties. That's nothing we haven't talked about before. My men know the risks involved. This was strictly a volunteer mission. Understood, Major. But while I was watching those people, I realized there was something we could do to cut down on our losses and their numbers before we even attempt to storm those walls. Oh, yeah. We've been looking at this whole exercise from a military standpoint. We classified two camps here, them and us. We lumped them together as a common enemy with a common goal. Fortunately for us, they're not. Each one of those men down there is concerned primarily with one thing only, his own skin. I still don't see what you're getting at. You will. Pass the signal along to your troops. We're going to open the ball in about five minutes. Bolin slipped on his headset as Adair and Kissinger did the same. He clicked the headset to the private channel he'd prearranged with Jack Grimaldi. The Stony Man pilot was providing aerial support and leading the third wave that would break over Churchill's estate. Jack? Go, Sarge. Open a channel for me to Stony Man Farm. You got it. Adair turned back to Bolin. They're ready. Let's get it done. Adair gave him a crisp salute and faded into the bush. Bolin moved out, trailed by Kissinger. His hands passed over the ordnance underneath the poncho. The Desert Eagle 44 rode his right hip, counterbalanced by the Beretta 93R in shoulder leather under his left arm. He unslung the Mossberg 590 military nine-shot pump shotgun from his shoulder and gripped it as he took the lead. Military webbing covered the Kevlar body armor he wore holding grenades of lethal and non-lethal varieties, as well as other gear he thought might come in handy during the invasion. A gas mask had been clipped to the web belt at his back. The ground was soft from the rain, which had helped to soften broken branches that might have cracked and created a sound that would carry. From the recons, they knew that none of the estate security people ventured into the forest. 
The motion detectors and other security devices that didn't rely on constant transmission had already been deactivated. Bullen moved through the bush with Kissinger flanking him. The handful of men assigned to him picked the warrior up and fell in behind him. Stony One, you have Stony Base, over. Roger, Stony Base. This is Stony One requesting additional assistance, over. How can we help you, Stony One, over? Bear, are you online, over? Roger, Stony One, over. Bolin hunkered down 30 feet from the sagging stone wall that blocked entrance to the estate. He waved the SAS team and Kissinger to ground beside him. Regarding those financial statements you turned up, how much can you tinker with them, over? The access I've got into the system is pretty lenient. I've got all the necessary passwords to get inside. What'd you have in mind? Over. Can you do electronic transfers to all those accounts? Over. That's affirmative, Stony One. Thinking of making a withdrawal? Over. Bolin gave Kissinger a wintry smile when he saw the man's eyes gleaming. The weaponsmith was obviously thinking along the same lines. Something like that, Stony Base. I don't think our big fish is getting paid well enough. Instead of draining those accounts as we've already discussed, why don't we find a new home for them? At least for a few minutes, over. You're talking about a mass deposit here, Stony One? Over. Bolin shifted, shook out the grappling hook and line from the webbing, then dropped the poncho to the ground. Right. Right into the primary account. The way I've got it figured, those transfers should be noticed by the other account holders within minutes. I noticed several of their accountants carrying laptop computers over. You've got it figured right, Stony One. He's working the programming up now. With what we've already arranged, it should be ready to run in minutes. Over. I'm holding you to that, Stony Base. Stony One out. <laughs> I like the twist. Churchill won't. Bolin switched channels to the SAS frequency. Major. Yeah. On my mark. As you will. I've got a surprise working for our targets. Churchill's account is about to get a lot fatter thanks to the accounts of everybody else in that room. And well, being the vicious, greedy bastards they are, they'll think Churchill managed to rob them blind. That's what I'm hoping. That's no enemy force over there, Major. That's a collection of the most ruthless human garbage ever assembled. Every man among them recognizes no allegiance to the other. The only thing holding them together now is the possibility that they could pull this off and turn a profit. Whatever thin strand of trust has existed between them until this point is about to vanish, and they'll be reduced to the cannibals they've always been. We're standing by, and I'd like to tell you, Striker, you're a most interesting fellow. I'm the disorder I'd like to take to a civilized party, but you have a certain innate bloodthirsty charm. Very colonial. Bolin grinned and switched back to the Stony Man channel. From his current position, he could watch the movement on the other side of the wall. The banquet was in full swing. Stony Base, this is Stony One, over. Stony One, you have Stony Base. The program is ready to run. Please advise, over. Execute the program, Stony Base. Stony One out. Swain Churchill finally emerged from the manor house and joined his associates. Six bodyguards formed a perimeter around him, letting people who wished to speak to him through their defenses in ones and twos. As conversations with those were finished, new people were allowed in. Kissinger touched Boland's sleeve and pointed. Alfaro. Bolin followed Kissinger's direction and saw the DEA agent hovering on the outskirts of the party. The woman stood erect, her head held high as she surveyed the crowd. She wore jeans and a yellow blouse. Two men trailed her at a discreet distance, obviously assigned to watch her. Churchill doesn't appear overly trusting. Maybe the man has reason. The executioner nodded, then hit the transmit button on the headset. Major. Here, mate. Be advised that the two friendlies we discussed are possibly on site. Understood, Striker. We'll do everything in our power to get him home to you. Bolin switched the headset channel. Jack. Go. Get a message to Stony Base. Let them know it looks like Phoenix's missing package has turned up here. Damn, that's a relief. Only a partial relief. We still have to get it out of the fire, and we're going to be turning up the heat. I'm on it. Bolin settled back, lost the woman in the crowd, and ticked off the numbers in his mind. Almost five minutes passed before the first reaction set in. It started with a small group of men drawing together around another man operating a laptop computer next to a phone out on the patio. Then other groups formed. The warrior could see the wave starting, moving outward from the patio area as other groups hurried in, unmindful of the spitting mist, to check out things with their own computers. An angry mob, growing larger by the second, surged toward Churchill. The ex-CIA man's security people rose to meet the challenge, and guns appeared like magic. For a moment, the tension held and violence seemed uncertain. 
In seconds, bodies were strewn across the wet lawn and blood flowed onto the manicured landscape. You certainly seem to be a nasty bunch, don't they? Count on it. Lines of demarcation were drawn. Tables were knocked over as gunners went to ground and started returning fire. Windows in the upper stories of the manor house were knocked out and more of Churchill's guards joined the fray. First wave, open fire. Bolin saw the impacts of the 37mm projectiles belch out white clouds of CS gas when they struck the ground. The people staggered across the spacious lawns, reacted immediately, recoiling from the gas clouds or being put down by it before they could escape. Hell is smoke. More of the 37mm grenades arced over the walls from all four sides. Dense smoke poured out, streaming clouds of black, red and yellow to add to the general confusion. Bolin tightened his grip on the Mossberg pump gun. Okay, hit the walls. Second wave, give us a 30-second count, then follow us in. Move out! He leaned into the charge, with Kissinger a half-pace behind him. Time to reload. Stony Man has concluded on the next CD. Barbara Price stood behind Kurtzman's desk, watching the three wall screens monitoring national and international news briefs. Each computer station had its particular section of the overall Stony Man operation to oversee. The tension inside her was a coiling, twisting cobra of uncertainty. Too many things could still go wrong, and she was too damn aware of them. Kurtzman leaned back in the wheelchair with a big hand supporting his chin as he studied the monitor where his banking program was running. Numbers flickered and changed in the half-dozen accounts he was observing in the space of a single heartbeat. Do they know? Oh, yeah. I made sure and tripped every bell and whistle I could when I ripped the money out of those accounts. They know. This is Stony Base, over. Stony Base, this is G-Force. We have a go at this end. Stryker has the area lit up like the 4th of July. G-Force out. Price switched the communications frequency to the one monitored by Able Team in Houston, Phoenix Force on Solitaire Island, and Charlie Mott's team in Tarpon Springs. Stony Teams, this is Stony Base, over. We read you, Stony Base. We read you, Stony Base. We read you, Stony Base. Okay, gentlemen, you have your green light. Stony Base will be standing by, out. In her mind, Price was on all four battle sites, fighting beside the men she'd guided there. Her voice was a whisper as she faced the wall screens. All right, Swain Churchill. Let's see if you're really ready for the big time. Swain Churchill ran for his life. He dodged blindly, pulled by Terrell Hedges, his personal bodyguard, toward the open door of the manor house, where a trio of his people defended his retreat. Two bodies littered the stone steps, and he had to jump over them to make the entrance. One of the dead men was his. He didn't know who the other one belonged to. Oh! Hedges threw him up against the wall inside the house and shielded him with his own body as a hail of bullets tore through the foyer. Mr. Churchill, you better move your ass or someone's going to shoot it off! What the hell's going on out there? Plumes of colored smoke stained the sky as Churchill looked through the window to one side of the door. Hedges grabbed Churchill by the upper arm and started forcing him into another room. We're under attack! By whom? By everyone out there, for starters! And the outer perimeter guards have reported an outside force moving in from the forest! Churchill freed his arm from Hedges' grip and darted into the library. Reaching into his pocket, Churchill produced a key, fitted it into the locked drawer, and took out the government Model 45 inside. He dropped three extra clips into a jacket pocket. He switched the desk computer on, flipped on the modem, and accessed the Cayman Island banking records. The screen displayed the information in seconds. Even when he saw the evidence for himself, he couldn't believe it. As he worked, all of the bank accounts set up in the names of his associates were being drained, feeding directly into his own account. He watched the numbers flip and saw the millions and millions of dollars piling up. God damn it! Sir, these doors aren't going to hold for long. We'll move when I'm good and ready, and not one moment before. Yes, sir. It's your ass they won't, not mine. Churchill seated himself at the computer and pulled out the programming book locked in beside the 45. He flipped it open, studied the encoded information, and started to hit the keys. Everything could still be salvaged. He'd been set up. Surely those people out there would believe him after he returned the money. They couldn't let a business as large as the one they'd formed go down the drain because of this. His fingers moved so much more slowly than he wanted them to. He made mistakes and had to go back and try again. Abruptly, the accounts were drained and the screen focused on Churchill's main account. He stared at the numbers, working frantically, then saw them disappear, leaving the account as bare as Old Mother Hubbard's infamous cupboard. Damn it! Sir, 
Churchill ignored the man, lifted the telephone receiver, and punched out the Tarpon Springs number he had for Dan Canary. If there was anyone inside the organization who could have scuttled him so quickly, it was Canary. Ah, they've cut the line! Yeah. He threw the dead handset away and stood. His hand slipped under the desktop and tripped a hidden switch. A section of the library shelving slid away, revealing a dark and narrow corridor. He took the flashlight from another drawer and passed it to Hedges. The younger man took the lead at once, trotting into the secret exit. Churchill followed Hedges, trailed by two of his men. There were things he could salvage here once he got away, people who would believe him after they saw how he'd been set up. He could use them, build again. All he needed was time and space to regroup and replan. Holding a linen napkin over her nose and mouth to avoid the tear gas and smoke, Maria Alfaro scrambled through the battleground that had formed around her. The men inside the stone walls had fallen into the every-man-for-himself survival mindset. Groups took pot shots at one another from behind whatever available defensive positions they'd been able to find. More men, these clad in black suits with their faces masked by combat cosmetics, came hurtling over the stone walls in groups of twos and threes. They worked in sync, set up positions of covering fire for the next team working forward and cutting through the scattered drug lords and their henchmen like a terrible and swift sword. Still down on her hands and knees, Alfaro clambered under a banquet table laden with food and reached a hand out long enough to seize a Taurus 9mm pistol. Hidden by the folds of the tablecloth, she dropped the magazine and checked how many cartridges she had. Eleven shots remained unfired. She wrapped her hand around the large butt of the pistol and screwed up her courage. The black man she'd conned into following her to Churchill's hidden fortress was in the basement of the manor house. With the intense rain of destruction coming down on the home and the grounds, she was afraid he'd be lost in the confusion, another nameless casualty. With everything she'd had to do to make this case, she didn't think she could bear to have his death on her conscience. Enough innocence had been lost or sacrificed. The cocaine she'd taken earlier still buzzed through her system, and she wished it didn't. She pushed herself into a sprinter's position and ran for the house. She'd already seen Churchill and his retinue go through the main entrance, evidently sealing it behind themselves. A small knot of men remained there, trying to force their way through the heavy door. She avoided them, raced near the hedges surrounding the manor house, and kept low until she reached one of the side doors. It was locked, but the window next to it wasn't. Sliding her finger under the casement, she pushed the window up and heaved herself inside. The room was one of the smaller dining rooms scattered throughout the house. Her heart beat frantically as she carefully made her way toward the basement entrance below the main foyer stairs. Perspiration covered the back of her neck. She tried to make her hands stop trembling, but couldn't. She passed four bodies in the hallways, but didn't look closely enough at them to see which side they'd been on. It no longer mattered. The Taurus was in both hands before her, leading every cautious step. A man stood guard at the doorway under the winding stairway leading to the basement. She recognized him as one of Churchill's crew. He carried a CAR-15 canted across his chest and looked ready to use it. Two more of Churchill's private security force manned stations on either side of the wall of windows fronting the house. Most of the glass had been shot out and only jagged shards remained. Seeing her chance, Alfaro ran, moving straight at the man standing beside the basement door. The guide tried to shift when he saw her, whipping the assault rifle toward her. She never broke stride. It was only after she'd slammed into the wall on the other side of the basement entrance that she realized she'd been hit. There was no pain. Between the cocaine and the shock, there was no feeling at all. She pressed her fingers to her side, checked them, and found them covered with blood. Taking a fresh grip on the Taurus, she forced herself to go on. She hurried, afraid she might already be too late, or that the wound might be worse than she thought and suck her into unconsciousness before she made it to the bottom of the steps. Lying on his back on the bed, Leo Turin thought the sharp steel glimmer he saw thrust through his ceiling was the work of an overactive imagination. During the last eight hours, he'd had plenty of time to wonder exactly what Laborio Perella was going to do with him. His mind had been all too fertile in conjuring up images of a slow, painful death. The steely wink moved slowly. When Turin saw the fine white powder of acoustic tile and sheetrock drift down to layer the carpet, he sat up, pushed himself off the bed, and held a hand under the stream of white dust. It coated his palm immediately. Less than a minute later, the sharp edge had inscribed a circle in the ceiling. It disappeared and then an allen wrench poked through the center of the circle and twisted so that the L slid up under the sheetrock. The circle popped free of the ceiling, dropped down for an instant, 
then was reeled back up into the attic. Turin stepped closer and gazed hard into the black depths of the hole. Charlie Mott, the stony man backup pilot for Grimaldi, poked his head down. Hey, Leo, you about had all the fun here you can stand? Turin grinned and took the Uzi machine pistol the rugged Canadian passed down. He checked it, found it ready to perform, and dropped the extra magazine into his pockets. I think so. They tell me I've worn out my welcome. Well, buddy, you won't exactly be back in good graces when we leave. The pilot lowered himself into the room. He was tan and fit, with a head of dark curly hair. He wore Stony Man black with combat webbing. Two more Stony Man warriors dropped into the room after him, automatically setting up defensive measures on either side of the room. So how goes the war? Mott took up a position beside the window. Before shutting Turin in the room, two of Perella's security squad had dropped a preformed crosshatch of steel bars over the window and locked them into place so that he couldn't escape by that route. The pilot looked over the gently rolling hills that led down to the boathouse and hangar. We're shutting these people down. That's what took us so long to tend to your rescue. Barb didn't want us to tip our hand before we were ready to move on all fronts. Mason and Ellis have been up in that attic with me for the past two hours. Mason took a hand drill from his leather bag and started working on the door at eye level. Wooden splinters corkscrewed back into the room and littered the carpet. Ellis removed a block of plastic explosive from his gear and began working it into the door casement. How's that door? Mason popped the drill from the door and took a small, shiny cylinder from his shirt pocket, which Turin recognized as a peephole. The Stony Man fighter inserted it into the augured hole. The explosive's ready. Say the word and we're out of here. I got two guys in the hallway, one on the left and one on the right. The stairway is at 12 o'clock. Let's get it done. Mott unfolded an ear-throat headset and settled it into place, then handed one to Turin. The Stony Man black suits put on their sets and took up positions on either side of the door, their H&K MP5 SD3s up and ready. Falcon, this is Hatchling. Over. Roger, Hatchling. You have Falcon. Over. We're about to have our coming out party. Over. Acknowledged, Hatchling. Falcon standing by. Out. Mott faced Turin. The plan is simple. Once we blow those doors, we start moving. And we don't stop moving until we hit that boathouse. I've already spent some time with the pontoon plane down there. It's wired, so we don't have to worry about the key. We're going to be really rushed because we've got to evade these people and try not to get caught by the federal task force Barb has arranged to finish up here. Turin nodded. Reaching into his pocket again, Mott pulled out a remote control. His thumb hovered over the button, then pressed down. He dropped the control and grinned. Showtime, people. They just lost the garage and parts of their security perimeters. Turin braced himself when one of the black suits took out a detonator and slapped it onto the line of C4 on the door. He turned his face away. <coughs> <coughs> Peering through the dust, smoke, and splinters, Turin caught a brief glimpse of the black suits rushing through the ragged doorway. Then Mott pushed him into motion. He took a double-fisted grip on the Uzi and ran out into the hall. Mason and Ellis were already securing the stairs. A door opened to Perella's sitting room, and a hard man Turin recognized started to step through with a gun in his fist. Lifting the Uzi, the little fed squeezed off a stream of 9mm parabellum rounds. <laughs> Mott followed up with a grenade. A group of men appeared in the double-wide doorway from the dining room. The Stony Man black suits dropped into defensive postures on the open floor and settled in for the fight. Turin leaned over the stairway railing, a heartbeat ahead of Mott. He emptied the clip. Men fell like ten pins. Turin slapped a palm against the reinforced entrance to Canary's computer room. Take down this door. Their computer hardware's inside. Mason and Ellis looked at Mott. Do it. Ellis reached into his pocket for more C4. Turin followed the twisting spiral of smoke inside, but no one was there. He reached out to the harness of the Stony Man warrior and unclipped two grenades. Falcon, this is Hatchling. Over. Go, Hatchling. We're ready for that transport. Over. Acknowledged, Hatchling. Transport is en route. Knock it out. Turin glanced through the window. Perella's forces were in disarray. Stony Man snipers were cutting them down from hidden positions. The main entrance to Perella's estate blew apart and a Chevy Blazer four-wheel drive roared through the opening. Get ready. If you don't get the brass ring the first time, you don't get a ticket to ride. Turin nodded, wiped his hands on his pants and took a fresh grip on the Uzi. The Blazer braked to a halt in front of the house. A gunner in the back cut loose with a saw, spitting a stream of 5.56mm rounds across the pockets of resistance formed by Perella's teams. Mott gave Turin a push. Now! The little fed ran for the rear door of the blazer and dived inside. 
hand seized his clothing and shoved him forcibly onto the far side of the seat as Mott went barreling in after him. Mason and Ellis jumped into the rear beside the gunner. Mott slapped the driver on the shoulder. Go! The big four-wheel drive dug in, fishtailed for a moment, then straightened, making for the dirt road that led to the boathouse. Mott fired around from his pistol that tore away the padlock, holding the metal gate that closed off the walkway to the pier. The pilot shoved the gate aside and led the rush into the hangar. Turin was at his heels. A glance over his shoulder assured him that the rest of the Stony Man black suits traveling by jeeps were joining them. He followed Mott through the hangar's side entrance and caught the man as he suddenly fell back. Mott was bleeding on his left side from at least two wounds. Crouching to support the man, Turin scanned the interior of the hangar and saw Dan Canary attempting to board the seaplane. Laborio Perella's dark eyes glared at him from the other side of the plane's windscreen. As Dan the man shifted his 45 to cover Turin, the little fed cut loose with a one-handed figure eight from the Uzi. Oh! The 9mm rounds chopped into the man and shoved him back over the nose of the seaplane. Blood smeared across the engine cowling as the body dropped into the dark water. Turin spotted Perella raising an assault rifle through the seaplane's windscreen. Without losing a beat, the Fed shifted his aim. The old mafioso's head snapped back and he didn't move again. Don't hurt the goddamn plane! Are you okay? Hell no, but help me up anyway so I can get us out of here! Turin helped support Mott as they made their way to the plane. Mott fired up the engine while someone threw Perella's body onto the wooden walkway. The door is going now. Sitting in the co-pilot's seat, Turin saw the series of small explosions rip around the hangar door hinges. In a sheet, hardly disturbed at all, the two heavy doors plunged straight down into the water and disappeared. Mott throttled up and sent the seaplane scooting forward into the lighted rectangle of sky and sea. Once they were clear of the hangar, he increased the craft's power until they were skimming over the water headed for the open sea. Turin watched the ocean drop away as the plane leaped into the air. The ride settled out at once. Within minutes, Perella's estate was fading behind them, swallowed by the distance and the altitude. He reached for the medical kit one of the black suits handed him and started working on Mott's wounds. Neither were life-threatening at the moment. Looks like we made it. <sighs> Never had a doubt in my mind. Turin carefully placed a gauze bandage over the first of Mott's wounds. Oh, no. Me neither. Blood flowed down Calvin James's left arm from the bite of the steel cuffs. He stood in the center of the basement, arms chained over his head. He was naked from the waist up, his skin dappled by beads of perspiration. His bare feet were cold against the stone floor. He used the fingers of his right hand to catch the running blood and smear it over his left wrist. The salt from his perspiration stung the rips in his skin, but provided a film of lubricant. Satisfied with the coating, he folded his thumb into his palm and began pulling against the cuff again. He grabbed the cuff with his right hand and added his strength to the combined forces of gravity and his own weight. <sighs> Pain ran an electric current from his wrist and surrounded his brain. His body trembled with a sustained effort. For the past eight hours, he'd been questioned repeatedly. In return, he'd either remained silent or given nonsense answers dealing with Mother Goose stories. For his trouble, he'd been beaten. His right eye was swollen shut, and the inside of his mouth was cut. Every time he swallowed, he tasted blood. He strained against the cuff, pushing the pain away. This was the first time his captors had left him alone. He didn't know when he might get the chance again and wanted to make the most of his present opportunity. His wrist slid another fraction of an inch. Then his left thumb broke. James pulled again, harder, and his hand popped free. He almost blacked out from the pain. Taking deep breaths and forcing them all the way out slowly, the Phoenix Force warrior brought his mind back on track. His broken thumb throbbed as he gazed at it. The flesh around his wrist was torn, bruised, and bleeding. The empty cuff dangled over his head, and drops of blood spattered onto his face as he slid a lockpick free of a secret pocket sewn into his pants. Using his fingers, he worked on the lock of the cuff holding his right hand. The cuff sprang open in a little over a minute. James crossed the room, found a roll of strapping tape near a packing box, and quickly bound his broken thumb to the rest of his hand for support. It limited his freedom of movement, but it also protected the thumb. He located a box knife in a slide drawer just as someone came down the steps. Moving silently, the Phoenix Force Commando leaned into the sheltering shadows beside the door. When the man entered the room, James recognized him as one of his interrogators. 
The man stopped in his tracks, apparently thunderstruck that James could have escaped. Before the man could raise an alarm, James reached out for him with his wounded arm, flicked out the blade of the box knife, and sliced the man's throat open from ear to ear. The ex-seal didn't drop his quarry until all struggles had died away. He took the dead man's 45, two extra clips, the buck pocket knife, and his disposable lighter. Someone else was coming. He lifted the 45 and found himself looking down the sights at Maria Alfaro. She had a pistol pointed at him. For an instant, they remained frozen in place, and James could see the cocaine in her system burning holes in her soul. He wasn't sure what kind of grip she had on reality. Finally, she lowered the pistol. Thank God you're all right. I was afraid I might get here too late. James got to his feet, not quite putting his pistol away. What's going on upstairs? I think your friends have arrived. And Churchill and his people are fighting amongst themselves. I want you to know I didn't have a choice about giving you up to them. They already suspected me. If I couldn't deliver Johnson and I was sure they'd know, I knew I had to give them something to buy myself some time. So you gave them me? Yes. You couldn't have gotten here on your own. Maybe your agency wouldn't have found this place if you hadn't been here. I was counting on Churchill to try to figure out who you were. And I was counting on your agency to find a way to track you down. If they didn't, I would have tried to break out on my own. You took some pretty big chances with my life, lady. I took some big chances with both our lives. But it had to be done. These people had to be stopped. Too many people are lost every day to drugs as it is now, without Churchill and his group making things even worse. In spite of everything, James couldn't find it in his heart to blame the woman. There were scars on her soul just as surely as there were scars on his. He was sure she'd lost loved ones to drugs just as he had, and the memory was bitter, something that would always drive them harder than other people. He stepped forward and embraced her. It's okay. We're gonna beat this thing. Let's get out of here and see if we can help. Without warning, she buckled in his grasp. He caught her before she fell, seeing her wounds for the first time. Carl Lyons tried to remain casual as he walked onto the docking pier at the Houston Port Authority. Inside, every nerve was thrumming. He thumbed the transmit button on his headset. Paul, gadgets? Here, Iron Man. Ready. Haggerty? We move when you give us a go ahead. From the go, Haggerty, the leader of the squad from Mac Tuff, had proved to be a good cop, a team player rather than a maverick. He kept his men in line, and he kept them professional. Instead of trying to go ahead with the assault on the Jolly Jack on his own, as many local law enforcement heads might have wanted to do, Haggerty had been willing to work off Price's calls. It was another facet of the Stony Man mission controller that Lyons respected. She was able to turn up people her teams could work with when it was necessary. The freighter was docked, waiting to be unloaded. Kurtzman had spiked into the Port Authority computer files and rescheduled the Jolly Jack's unloading appointment to better coincide with the strike times of Mott, Phoenix, and Bolan. Lyons carried a clipboard filled with bills of lading and tried to look bored as he closed in on the big ship. He wore a long windbreaker over his combat gear that hung low enough to cover the 357 wheel gun on his hip. A sailor flagged him down from the deck. You're gonna get us unloaded in this lifetime? We're working on it! Keep your shorts on! The mate waved at him in disgust and disappeared over the edge of the deck above Lyons. Okay, people. Let's get dangerous. Iron Man watched the hydraulic boom arm come around. He started up the rope ladder the mate had thrown over the side for him, glancing over his shoulder at the ball of cargo netting suspended from the boom arm as it swiveled toward the Jolly Jack. Men clung to the netting with their feet and hands. He didn't see a single weapon among them. As Lyons climbed onto the deck, the mate pointed at the cargo netting over their heads, where a dozen men maintained their holds on the ropes. Hey, we got our own crew to offload. We don't need those guys. The port's providing it. Our way of saying we're sorry for the computer error regarding your offloading appointment. Nearly twenty men sprang from the ship's holds. Not all of them looked like the adventurous seagoing type. The mate stepped forward, going nose to nose with Lyons. Bullshit! I've been working this harbor a lot of years, and I ain't never heard no shit like this. Who the hell are you? You know me. <gasps> Cops! It's a raid! The mate's hand darted to the small of his back and removed a chrome pistol. Lyons slapped leather instinctively, the 357 Magnum filling his hand in the wink of an eye. Ah! Sweep the decks! He lifted the 357 Python and drew target acquisition on his next opponent. His round punched into the man's chest, knocking him into the man behind him. Sniper fire from nearby rooftops chopped into the crew. 
Men hit the deck, held their positions for a moment, then broke and ran. The men clinging to the cargo netting, Lyons could see Schwartz and Blancanales among them, released their holds and dropped to the deck. Assault rifles and machine pistols up and tracking, they spread out in preformed groups. Hey, Iron Man! Lyons glanced over at Blancanales and caught the CAR-15 the man tossed to him. He stripped away the windbreaker to reveal the McTuff uniform underneath. Good hunting! Paul took off toward the wheelhouse to prevent any attempts at moving the freighter out of the harbor. Schwartz and a member of the task force cut the cargo netting free. More of Haggerty's people provided covering fire while Schwartz and his assistant lugged the heavy bundle of rope over to the side of the ship. They secured it to the railing with giant S-hooks, then threw the end over. When it trailed down the side of the ship, it formed a broad rope ladder that would allow the rest of the force to clamber aboard. Lyons ran to the nearest hold, leaping over one of the falling bodies, and stopped at the entrance. The bowels of the freighter were unlighted. His four-man team alighted around him, waiting for their orders. He took a pair of night vision goggles from an equipment pack strapped to one man's back and donned them, then slung the CAR-15. Heaving himself over the side, he hung by his hands, then dropped the 15 feet to the floor below. He rolled, raked the assault rifle around, and flipped off the safety. The goggles turned the world green and black. Behind a line of wooden crates, muzzle flashes blossomed bright and deadly. Throwing himself to one side, Lyons rolled and came up with the CAR-15 tucked securely into the crook of his arm. The McTuff team dropped into the hold with him. Lyons waved two of them to the back to secure the bulkhead and sent the other pair to the port side of the freighter. He kept the starboard side for himself. Move out! We don't want to miss any of these bastards! Lyons moved at a slow jog, the rifle ready in his hands. Haggerty! We're in. We're driving him to you now. Two crewmen raced toward Lyons, glancing over their shoulders. They didn't see the able team warrior until they were almost on top of him. Lyons rose out of his crouch. <laughs> Guiding the second man into position with his empty hand, Lyons took a set of plastic cuffs from his equipment belt and secured the guy's hands behind his back, then did the same for the first man. Haggerty! Be careful! They know we're here now! Roger. Lyons watched the crew trying to regroup. Paul? Yeah, Iron Man. How's the wheelhouse? We own it. This crate isn't going anywhere. Lyons peered over the top of the boxes he used for cover at what was left of the crew. From his hurried count, he figured there might be 20 survivors. He raked a smoke grenade from his webbing, pulled the pin, and heaved the orb into the middle of the man. That was just a smoker, gents. Think of what could have just happened. I'm giving you people exactly 30 seconds to pack it in, or I'm going to introduce you to the real thing. You're down to 20 seconds. How do we know you guys won't cut us down anyway? You've got my word on it. You want that in writing? You're gonna have to drop the weapons anyway, and you're down to 10 seconds. All right, all right. We're coming out. Any tricks? If any one of you is holding out thinking you're gonna break free, you all die. That's a promise, too. After a moment, another handful of weapons dropped into the pile taking shape outside the crates. Okay. Everybody out and onto their faces. The sooner we get this part over with, the better the chances are that nobody else needs to get hurt. The crewmen walked warily out into the open, then sank to their knees and onto their stomachs, placing their hands behind their heads. Five men from the McTuff group closed in and quickly cuffed the sailors. Within minutes, they had the men up and moving toward the upper deck. Lyons interviewed one of them long enough to find out where the psilocybin cocaine was hidden, then followed them up. Holding on to the LCU's railing, cats scanned the shore of Solitaire Island. They were still a quarter mile out to sea, but the security around the harbor had already started to tighten in response. At first, they'd been hailed by ship-to-shore radio from August's communications people. Cats had ignored the repeated commands to identify themselves. Once the LCU had powered up close enough to be seen, the communications had died away. There was no mistaking the military lines of the landing craft. Two speedboats were cutting swaths through the sea, tracking onto the LCU. Katz's field glasses had revealed mounted 50 caliber machine guns on board both vessels. Katz hit his transmitter. Phoenix 2 and Phoenix 4, this is Phoenix 1, over. Roger, Phoenix 1, you got Phoenix 2, over. And you have Phoenix 4, over. Take your targets down. Phoenix 1, out. The mined airfield and warehouse went up. Debris blew straight up. The munitions had been planted with that effect in mind because it would let everyone on the island know that the sea didn't pose the only threat. 
Cats put the binoculars away and hunkered down slightly. Helmsman, full throttle! The landing craft shuddered as the powerful engines were kicked into full thrust. The LCU's nose dropped down into the water for an instant, then popped back up and plunged forward. Forty SEALs and six Jeeps were on the LCU with Cats, bringing the invasion force up to 70 men. The USS Spearfish was standing by with a secondary wave if necessary. Gunner, you have your target. The SEAL rose to his position at the deck-mounted 40mm machine cannon as the first of the speedboats raced toward them. The second boat turned tail and tried to run. Katz glanced at the harbor. Someone was out there trying to consolidate the security forces so that they could make a stand. Black smoke curled up from the wreckage of the airfield and the warehouse. The shore guns kicked sluggishly into action, drawing great gouts of water from the sea in a searching pattern that was closing in on the LCU. He thumbed the transmit button. They were less than 200 yards from the shore. Come in, Phoenix 3, over. You have Phoenix 3, over. It's time to bring down the curtain, over. Acknowledged, Phoenix 3, out. Katz rose from his crouch slightly. The success of Manning's theories was the linchpin that would tell how costly the invasion was going to be in lives for the Navy and Phoenix Force. He waited. A round from one of the big shore guns rocked the landing craft when it hit only yards away. A wave of water erupted over the side and drenched the attack unit. White foam billowed up and around the island. The people on land acted as if they were experiencing an earthquake as the ground beneath them buckled and shivered. Without warning, a chasm opened up, splitting through the main house and shaking down the outbuildings. Men, sand, trees, and buildings dropped into the chasm as if filling a vacuum. Helmsman, take us ashore. The LCU adjusted its approach and hurtled onto the beach. The debarkation teams kicked down the boarding ramp and poured out onto the sand. Katz took the shotgun seat in the lead jeep, clapping the driver on the shoulder to let him know the machine gunner had joined them. The jeep hurtled out of the LCU, jumped over the ramp, and bucked onto the loose sand of the harbor area. The gunner, with the deck-mounted 40mm cannon, kept firing into the buildings, and explosions ripped through the structures. The SEAL driver heeled around the corner of a demolished building, pursuing a ground team that had used law rockets to take out two of the invading jeeps. Katz got a brief impression of a yellow wall that was swelling up over him, then realized he was looking at a bulldozer. The driver tried to stop, but there wasn't time. Belted into the jeep, Katz rode out the crash, then cut himself free. He secured his grip on the Mac-10 and joined the firefight. The magazine empty on the machine pistol, Katz let it hang by its strap as he reached for his sidearm. The six-hour P-226 settled onto the head of the driver of the approaching bulldozer. Katz stood his ground. When he was finished, the hole in the cab's windshield could have been covered by an eight-inch pie plate. The driver crumpled to the cab's floor. Yakov, bloody hell, mate, are you all right? Katz turned and saw McCarter running toward him. I, uh, seem to be. McCarter paused by the prone body of the SEAL gunner and pressed his fingers to the man's throat. He glanced up and shook his head. But the driver was only stunned. Katz helped the man limp to the meager shelter of the flattened outbuilding and gave him the M16 he'd been issued. And Cizo joined Katz, blood leaking from a corner of his mouth. Where August is getting away? Where? That way. Following the direction the Cuban indicated, Katz saw a four-wheel drive pickup charging into the jungle. No one was there to intercept it. The Israeli put his shoulder to the hood of the jeep. David. Raphael, your assistance, please. The three Phoenix commandos bent to the task, pushing and shoving the jeep until it rolled over onto all four tires. McCarter slid behind the wheel and keyed the ignition. Action in the harbor was dying down as the SEALs secured their beachhead. Cats turned control of the invading forces over to the Navy SEAL team commander. Wrenches whipped into their faces as they plunged into the jungle. McCarter had to struggle with the wheel as he steered around trees and boulders. Unexpectedly, they plunged through a wall of bush and thumped onto a dirt trail. Oh, obviously we missed something. I thought August looked like someone who had a definite destination in mind. Save the recriminations for the after-the-game analysis. These blokes haven't put anything past us yet. 200 yards farther, the trail ended abruptly. Katz led the way out of the jeep into the clearing on top of a small, steep rise. Six men were about to climb aboard a Bell helicopter, which had been shielded by a canopy of camo netting. 
The helicopter's rotors were spinning, rotor wash flailing away at leaves and branches. A man raised an assault rifle to his shoulder and squeezed off a burst. And Cizo cut the gunner down with a tri-burst. Sunlight lanced into the clearing as the camo netting fell to one side. Webb August tried to crawl inside the helicopter while blindly firing his assault rifle one-handed. Taking up a position behind a tree, Katz jerked a grenade from his webbing, pulled the pin with his hook, counted down silently, then lobbed the bomb under the helicopter. Fire in the hole! There were no survivors. Having hit the stone wall at a dead run, Mac Bolin used the grappling hook and nylon rope to climb to the top. He paused for a moment on the wall, then was face to face with Cowboy Kissinger on the other side. Both men slipped on their gas masks. The warrior hit the transmit button on his headset. Snipers, report. One able, sir. Two able, sir. Three able, sir. Be advised that you have friendlies in the field as of now. Bolin rolled, dropped to the ground, and raised the Mossberg pump as an Uzi-wielding hardman wheeled on him. <laughs> The 37mm smoke canisters discharged by the Smith & Wesson riot control guns continue to blow red, black, and yellow streamers into the air, mixed with the white CS gas. Poland turned. A military jeep carrying more SAS troops came barreling into the yard. Four more would follow in seconds. They were the second wave of the attack, which would establish a spearhead that would claim the battleground. He thumbed the transmit button on his headset. Third team, you have your go. He glanced at the treetops a thousand yards away and saw Grimaldi's chopper rise from the dark sky like a giant black-eyed insect. Two more followed it, forming a flying wedge that was more for intimidation than anything else. Helicopter fire inside the primary kill zone could end up injuring the friendly forces on the scene. Bolin went to ground behind a concrete fish pond as a fresh wave of auto fire searched for him. The warrior crawled on his hands and knees, maintaining his grip on the Mossberg. He came up without warning, bracketing the window where the gunners were taking cover. He pushed himself to his feet and raced toward the manor house with Kissinger at his heels. He slammed into place alongside the door and brought the shotgun up. Bolin looked at the weaponsmith. Now! Whirling inside, the warrior took the left side while Kissinger covered the right. Two of Churchill's men tried to break from the window. Stryker, you okay? Yeah, Kevlar, but... Ow! Bolin and Kissinger made their way down a hallway. They dropped their gas masks onto the floor because they were no longer necessary. The snipers had confirmed Churchill's re-entry into the house. No one had seen the man come out. At the end of the hallway, Bolin found two men facing a closed door. One of them was working on the door with a fire axe. Drop your weapons. The men turned, doing as they were told. Where's Churchill? In there. There's a way out of here. A passageway leading to an escape tunnel in a Land Rover. The son of a bitch ran out on us. Bolin waved the muzzle of the Mossberg meaningfully. Down on the floor. The men got down and lay there while Bolin cuffed them. Take out the door, cowboy. The big man nodded, slung his assault rifle, and delved into a pouch tied at his waist. He pinched off a section of a block of C4 and stuck it to the door by the locking mechanism. Then he added a detonator switch and ducked back. When Kissinger waved the smoke away, the lock had been replaced by a big hole. Bolin dumped his prisoners in the hallway, then lifted a foot and kicked the door in. The room was empty. Damn! I hate these locked room mysteries. Slinging the Mossberg pump gun over his shoulder, Bolin advanced to the library shelves. He built the house in his mind, tore it down, and figured the most likely wall to house a concealed entrance. Here. He started scooping books from the shelves directly behind the desk. Unsheathing his cold steel Tonto knife, he tapped the butt against the wooden panels behind the shelves. I'm covering the door. Bolin nodded, already busy with a block of C4. He ran lines at the top and bottom of the hidden entrance, then wired in a single detonator to both pieces of the plastic explosive. Activating the remote control, he jogged back out of the room and took up his position in the hallway. Striker! Looking up, the warrior saw Calvin James stumble into the hallway from the other end. He looked worse for the wear, but he was walking on his own two feet and carrying a woman in his arms. A glance showed Bolin that the woman was Alfaro. She needs medical attention. It's pretty bad. And I've done all I can for her without medical supplies. He came to a halt in front of them. Let me take her off your hands. You look plum tuckered out. Major Adair, this is Stryker. Go, Stryker. The executioner watched James sag against the wall when Kissinger relieved him of the woman. I need a medevac unit, double quick. Two to transport, inside the house. Good people? Yeah. They're on the way. 
James nodded toward the library. The 45 hung at the end of his arm. Even banged up, he still looked game enough to take on whatever came his way. Churchill in there? Was. Boland thumbed the remote control. I'm gonna find out where he went. I'll go with you. You'll stay here and wait for that medevac team. I can't afford to look out for you and me both down there. James squared his shoulders and started to protest, but realized the truth in the statement. Taking up the shotgun, Bolin glanced at Kissinger. I got him. You watch your ass down there. <coughs> Bolin turned and charged into the room, ran sure-footed over the debris, and paused at the side of the gaping hole in the wall. Darkness swirled inside, riding the clouds of dust that had been stirred up by the explosion. Taking a halogen flashlight and a roll of electrical tape from his pouch, he fixed the flash to the Mossberg's barrel and switched it on. He went in low, keeping his back to one of the hand-hewn stone walls. Striker! Go. We're taking your people out right now. Mind if I drop in on your little party? Come ahead, Major. Seconds later, the bulky body of the SAS commander shadowed the library entrance. Bolin went on. The tunnel sloped down, widening as the hewn walls gave way to a small cave. The smell of limestone and mildew was thick and cloying. He continued to sweep the beam of the flash across the walls, but saw nothing. Less than a minute later, he hit bottom. No one was there. Playing the flashlight's beam around the small cavern, Bolin discovered he was in a room almost 50 feet square. A stream flowed from the northwest, emerging from under a rocky wall and continuing down a tunnel running southeast. The water was dark, murky when the light touched it, but it looked deep enough to float a good-sized longboat. Dull metal gleamed on the walls, and further inspection revealed them to be ring bolts set into the stone. A rusted anchor leaned in one corner among the scattered remains of a half dozen wooden kegs and a rolled bunch of sailcloth. Adair's flashlight beam joined the executioners. Smugglers, Den. Once an honored profession in this country. You find them in a lot of places. The man Churchill really plays for all the angles, doesn't he? Yeah. Bolan moved out to scout the terrain. A dark patch glistened on the stone floor. When he touched it, oil came away on his fingers. He jogged a short way along the narrow ledge following the stream and tried to look farther down the tunnel, but the flashlight beam was lost in the intense dark lying in wait there. I'm telling how far that bleeding tunnel goes. It's got to come out somewhere. Send a foot patrol along after him. Bolan and Adair raced back to the library. They must have some kind of vehicle. That was motor oil I saw on your hand back there, wasn't it? Bolin nodded as they came out into the lighted library. He took his map case from a slit pocket of the skin suit. Flipping through the information concerning this part of Dover, he took out a geological survey map and laid out the document. I want the team sent along to flush out Churchill if the guy tries to hole up instead of making a run for it. I'm hedging my bets. But you think he'll run? Yeah. From the coastline, it's a 21-mile jump across the Strait of Dover into France. If he gets that far, we could be looking at a whole new ball game. Parts of that cave and tunnel appear to have been hewn out by hand. That's not unusual. As I said, privateering was a lucrative business in the 16th and 17th centuries. Bolin sorted out another geological survey map, which zeroed in on the area surrounding Churchill's manor house. True, but I believe that particular tunnel has access to the sea. You still have to find the other end of that rabbit warren in time, mate. Bolin put the maps away. Churchill's not going to escape. His chances of being able to rebuild this organization after the way we've shattered it are slim, but I want to leave him no chance at all. Bolin changed the headset to the frequency monitored by the Stony Man troops and tapped the transmitter button. Jack. Go, Sarge. Meet me out front. On my way. Bolin ran through the house until he reached the front entrance. The battle in the yard had died away to sporadic gunfights. The SAS teams were obviously very much in control of the situation. Calvin James and Kissinger were beside a gurney, working feverishly on Maria Alfaro. An SAS corpsman held up a plastic bottle of glucose while the fluid fed into the woman's arm. How is she? She'll make it. She's a hell of a tough lady. Bolin could tell the woman had made an impression on the ex-seal and wondered what the full story was. Price hadn't seemed well informed concerning James's actions during the final stages of the mission. Kissinger looked up and squinted at Grimaldi's approaching helicopter. Going somewhere? I'm going to tie up a loose end. You on company? I've got Jack. You're needed here. He moved out at a jog, away from the medical team, so the rotor wash wouldn't create problems. Grimaldi had dropped the helicopter to within a few feet of the ground. Bolin leaped, caught the landing skid, and hauled himself up, dropping into the co-pilot seat and putting on a headset. Grimaldi pulled up on the stick, and the main rotor grabbed airspace. 
Where to? Southeast. The executioner quickly outlined the discovery of the smuggler's den below the manor house. At full speed, the helicopter winged toward the coastline. That's a lot of area to cover. Streams and rivers usually find the easiest route to the major bodies of water. On the map, some of them appear to twist and turn, but if you follow them for a couple of miles on foot, they tend to head more or less straight. It's two miles from the house to the coastline. I'm betting whoever first established the smuggler's hideout chose this location because it was the easiest to travel and had direct access to the sea. And the shortest distance between two points is a straight line. That's what I'm thinking. I'll buy it. Moments later, the coastline came into view. Grimaldi lost altitude, then skimmed low over the water while they searched the chalk cliffs for their quarry. There! I thought I saw something flash at 10 o'clock. Bolin turned his binoculars to the direction indicated, adjusted the magnification, and saw an open-topped, military-styled Land Rover scaling the cliff face along a road that was almost non-existent. He strengthened the magnification again, swept the two faces inside, and found Churchill sitting in the passenger seat. It's Churchill. Whoa! They've got to come up. Bolin put the binoculars to his eyes again. He scouted the twisting road the Land Rover was following and found where it peaked off the cliff face. He pointed. Put me down there. Sarge! There's no other way. This helicopter makes a big target. If Churchill gets by us, it'll take too long to organize a ground interception. By then, he could be long gone. The pilot heeled the helicopter over. It moved like a live thing in his hands, dropping with express elevator speed toward the top of the cliff, where the wind and the sea had scoured the land clear of vegetation. Boland dumped the Mossberg, knowing that the pellets would prove ineffectual against the Land Rover's windshield. He doffed the headset and swung himself out the door as Grimaldi brought the craft to a shuddering halt a dozen feet above the ground. The executioner jumped, rolling and pushing himself to his feet on impact. Grimaldi cleared off, stirring up a cloud of dust and stinging sand that pelted Boland's exposed flesh. The warrior sprinted to meet the vehicle, driving his legs hard against the ground. He came to a halt where the road suddenly switched back and left a dangerous curve, where nothing but sheer cliff face and broken rocks waited a hundred feet below. Bolin drew the Desert Eagle as the Land Rover topped the last ridge less than 50 feet away. Dirt crumbled under his boots, and for an instant he thought he'd placed himself too close to the edge of the cliff. Then the ground held. On the other side of the hold glass, Swain Churchill gestured wildly. The driver pressed down on the accelerator, closing the distance to 40 feet, then 30. Bolin guessed the driver intended to take him out with some kind of sideways skid. The executioner stood his ground and brought the driver's head and shoulders into target acquisition as the Land Rover plunged toward him. Coolly, the executioner struck the trigger of the big 44 and pumped a trio of shots into the driver. The windshield came apart and the driver slammed back into his seat, his head in fragments. The jeep careened out of control. Bolin suddenly realized he was trapped by the wall of steel hurtling at him. There was nowhere else to go but the sea and a drop straight down to the rocks. Search! The helicopter came up out of a diving swoop and hovered even with the cliff's edge. Bolin dropped his pistol and jumped as the tumbling Land Rover closed in on him. It was a stomach-turning moment of freefall, and his hands closed around the helicopter's skid. He glanced down to see the rear of the Land Rover plunging toward the sea and waiting rocks. I'd say the blue chip stock in the drug market just hit bottom unexpectedly. Bolin pulled himself aboard the helicopter. He settled back in the seat and watched the fire disappear behind the cliff as Grimaldi guided the helicopter back toward the manor house. Churchill's gone, but not the game. There's too much power and money to be made walking on the dark side. All we've done is buy the world a little time until the next predator comes along. Somehow it doesn't seem like enough. It has to be enough, because it's all you get. People had been fighting that dark side within and outside of themselves since the dawn of mankind. It was that fight that made the war everlasting. And as long as he felt he could make a difference fighting that dark side, the executioner knew he'd keep himself on the front line. It was the only true home the warrior had ever known. Stony Man 5 is a graphic audio production. Stony Man is a trademark owned by Harlequin Enterprises Limited, used by others under license. Copyright 1992, Worldwide Library. Production copyright 2008, The Cutting Corporation, all rights reserved. Narrated by Terence Aselford. With performances by Michael Glenn, Thomas Penny, Christopher Walker, Christopher Graybill, Nanette Savard, 
David Coyne, Jeff Baker, Richard Rowan, Ken Jackson, James Lewis, James Konacek, Eric Messner, Dylan Lynch, Kate Torrey, and Mort Shelby. Additional red shirts by The Dead Giveaways. With additional original music by Chris Rowan, Dan Smith, and Matt Webb. Book adapted for graphic audio by Wilson T. Farrier. Directed by Dan Smith. Dialogue editing by Brian Patton. Graphic audio sound design by Brian Patton, Greg Reinfeld, and Brian Rogers. Produced by Rick Rowan and Dwayne Beeman. Executive producers, James Cutting, Mary Cutting, and Angie Cornett. The Stony Man theme was composed by Mark Ashby. If you enjoyed Stony Man, be sure to look for Don Pendleton's Mac Bolan and Ryder Stacy's Doomsday Warrior, available at road stops everywhere at 1-800-670-5220 or at www.graphicaudio.net, where you'll find samples of all our Action Pump titles, as well as free screensavers, desktops, ringtones, and games. If you can't find that hot graphic audio title you're looking for, just head to www.graphicaudio.net where you can order it in CD or MP3 disc format. Or, the fastest and cheapest way, download that puppy and play it on any of the many devices that'll play Windows Media. And if you're on the road or just a total computer feed, snatch up the phone and call 1-800-670-5220. That's 1-800-670-5220 or www.graphicaudio.net.